From Boca Raton, Florida, Rabbis Ephraim Goldberg, Philip Moskowitz, and Josh Brody are taking you Behind the Bema. The BRS rabbis schmooze about contemporary issues and talk to special guests who give a behind-the-scenes look at how they got to where they are and what keeps them going. Welcome to Behind the Bema. Behind the Bema, I don't hear you. We are live. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hear Do you me? hear me now? I hear you now. I hear you now. It is Thursday night. How did you know to say behind the bima? I was just watching your lips. <laughs> and you it. Wow. Okay. It's good. We got the glitch out of the way early for our there marathon we go. Exactly. edition. Exactly. Special, special global marathon edition of Behind the Bima. Really, really excited for tonight, Rabbi Brody. We've got amazing guests whom we've announced are joining us. We've got other guests who are going to surprise us. We got hosts who are going to surprise us and come back on tonight. We're really, really excited to be able to spend this time together. This is an endurance marathon, Rabbi Brody. So I hope you dive in Marav already. I hope you didn't drink too much liquid. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, I got my caffeine. This is going to take us through the night over here. Dav and Marv. I was right, I was right there. I left a few seconds early because I had a rush home. You are. So are we ready to go? I want to thank our sponsor of this special marathon episode, our good friends, the Ganowers. We dive into the Boca Jewish Center, but it's all one big Boca Raton community, and they sponsored behind the Bima for the beautiful relationships between all the rabbis and all the shuls and all I the Boca, that. greater Boca community, the Yiddishkeit that's here. They're grateful for BRS and what it produces. The global, you could be a member of the global community and live a few blocks away. You could be a member of the global community and live thousands of miles around the world. We have global members on continents, every country, all over the world who identify with what BRS stands for, who we are, what are our values, what are we trying to promote and support, what do we represent and what do we push, what do we produce, the incredible content, the shirim, the articles, the video, the audio. We try to really not only service, of course, our most primary priority, which is our local community, but we're very much part of the global world and listening and learning and trying to also contribute and make a difference. So we're grateful to the Ganawas for their sponsorship tonight. Thank and uh, we're grateful to all those who've been part of the global campaign. I'm excited to tell you as of this moment, and we are live tonight. This is going to be a marathon, many hours long marathon live. So live, you never know what could happen. You never know who could come on. You never know what's going to be. We are at 117759 Dollars from 886 supporters, which is crazy. We've got a thousand that's not, families. That's not a like a, a match right now, right? That's those are real dollars, dollar for dollar. No match. I, I'm not knocking right. anybody else. There's all kinds of campaigns and cause match and match, and they're all wonderful. They're all great. Every yeshiva, every mikvah, every era of every university, every hatsa. They're all wonderful. They're all great. For us, every dollar is new money. We don't use old money, and we don't match, and we don't, you know. In that sense, it's all new money. And in fact, we do have new money for today that came to us and said, every dollar that comes in today, they'll match it. So oh. if you're a BRS member, you're doing your part for BRS content. If you're not a BRS member and you're one of the, what's the number? You're one of the 886 people who have given already. Great. Thank you. You've done your part. Thank you so much for letting us bring you the shiurim, the inspiration, what we try to do. But if you've not yet given, if you give to right now, if you give tonight, if you give before the end of this episode, it will be matched dollar for dollar. So in case you're not good at math, if you give $1,000, you gave 2000 And that's not, again, some gimmick or sham. There's an actual person who said to us, whatever comes in today to finish up this global campaign, they will match dollar for dollar. So we're really grateful for that. And we're really honored by the global community. It's so meaningful. You know, Roberta, you and I went on this uh, trip I don't remember if we spoke about it yet on Behind the Beam of the Mavakshim Fly-In. I don't think we did. I don't we went on we this did. trip to New York, and we went all over. We started in Lakewood. We met with Rashi Yeshiva and Rabbanim, made our way to YU and met with some of the Rashi Yeshiva, made our way to Muncie, made our way to Brooklyn, made our way to Queens, went all over, and we took a great chevra from Boca, and uh, we, we drew, drew such inspiration. But it's really exciting, and I say this with humility. This is not a humble brag because I still don't believe it. Rabbi Brody, we walked through BMG, Torah right. Vadas, YU, and in all the places we were stopped. Right. People said, I love behind the beam. I love this interview. I love when you spoke to that one. I listened to this or I heard that. It's so gratifying, not because of us, 
the incredible people that we've been privileged to host, to talk to, to learn from. And it's amazing that you can go. I've been in the meter in Yerushalayim and I got stopped. I love behind the Bima, you know, and it's it's great. You could drive around Israel. You could drive around New York and Boca. You see this magnet. It's on the back of people's cars. On the back of people's cars, you see, you All see the magnet. Liquid. So it's, um, yeah, it's really, really amazing wherever you go. And it's really That's gratifying. Even, even this special. And what I love about this community is that, you know, you can go to Lakewood, you can go to BMG, and then you can tell them, guess what? Tomorrow we're going to be in YU. The next day we're going to be at the All of the Rebbe with uh, Rebbe Weinberger. We're going right. to be going to Muncie. And it's amazing. Like, where, what other place does something like that? It was really the diverse people we met with, we learned from, we listened to, and the diverse people who went. And yeah, there's, there's such a richness of Torah. In fact, we may have this conversation tonight with some of our guests about whether we should be narrow and focused or do we have a passport and travel comfortably in the world of Torah? Or will we lose or compromise ourselves? How do we explore without diluting who we are? But you know, on this trip, what we believe is you don't have to you don't have to subscribe to what everyone says, but listen and learn and be exposed right. to. And that's the ultimate Torah global community. The global Torah community is not BRS centric, but the global Torah community says, I want to learn, I want to listen, I want to meet. I want to draw from, I want to take the best of, and uh, and that's something that's really exciting. So I want to thank people who have started to give. Again, it's matched dollar for dollar. Help us finish this out. And, and the more that we have, frankly, the more and the better that we can bring you. We can bring you Shiurim and Torah. We can bring you behind the Bima conversations, and we can, sky's the limit, on more panel discussions that we can bring and, and many more. So if you're, if we're, we're live tonight. And like I said, endurance. So if you're watching with us live, you made a bowl of popcorn or you're cooking right now for Shabbos, Weigh in on YouTube, write a comment. Who are you? Where are you from? Where are you watching? If you have a question for one of our incredible guests we're going to be speaking to, if you have a thought, what's your favorite uh, that you benefit from, sheer article or opportunity that comes out of BRS, the global community, let us know. We want to interact with you tonight. And also, you know, one of the things you just mentioned, almost 900 people have already contributed to this campaign. When you think about, you know, the average shul, right? And the shul that, you, that you've that you been involved in for so many years, how many times... Right. You would dream about maybe there'll be some other people outside that might start to participate, come in and listen to some of the shirim and some of the programs. And now you have hundreds of people from all over the all over the globe. I mean, right. it's another shul, it's another congregation, it's another what a what a what a great great things thing that's happening here. We're, yeah, we're grateful. Thank God. Tell us what's going on with you, Rabbi Brody. I know you you announced a big exciting oh. effort that's going to be happening here. First of all, I'm very, very excited to see uh, Rabbi Leibowitz is uh, one of our guests tonight because I actually just started learning with Rabbi Leibowitz. He doesn't even know it, but I yeah. just started the Mishnayis uh, Yomi, you know, all all Mishnah and it's Pesachim, and Rabbi Leibowitz is now my Rebbe for Mishnah. I'm up to Mishnah Hay with him. So I'm very, very Adding excited. You're a long list of people that you listen to. It's great. I love it. I love it so much. And uh, it just makes, you know, one of the things we were talking about before before uh, the show began, we're talking about uh, Lashon Hara and what, what the Kitzer says that a person who who can't, you know, uh, struggles with Lashon Hara, what should they be doing? So he said, you know what? Why don't you go? Just st study Torah, study, and you'll get so excited. You get so, you'll, you'll be so turned on to something else you have to talk about instead of uh, talking about others. So... The more we learn, the more we love learning, and there's just so much more we can be involved in. So, your energy, Rabbi Brody, your excitement, renewed excitement for for learning, is something that inspires me, and I know it inspires others because I've met people who said, you know, never connected to Gemara, felt far away, felt far apart. And I'll say something a little bit. Let's go right in. Eight oh eight. We're only eight minutes in. Yeah, I'll already get in trouble, right? There are those people who say, you know, I've had people give me the feedback. Rabbi Brody's amazing. But he's always putting himself down and he's joking that he doesn't know how to learn and he's always sort of self-deprecating. And they don't know you. They don't know you, Rabbi Brody. Well, you're, they don't you're, know me that I really don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not saying that. But you're being honest and you're being real. But I also yeah. think some of your appeal and the ability to impact people is that you're the everyman, right? So what you're saying is that I'm that person who doesn't necessarily connect or didn't thrive in that way, but I'm giving my all. So when you announced... On our episode with Eli Stefanski, you signed up in that moment and you haven't missed a daf. You've finished Masechta since then. I was at a wedding recently and I met someone who said, when I saw Rabbi Brody took it on and kept up, I signed up. I now do the daf yam with Eli Stefanski. So wow. and that's one of the themes that's going to come out tonight of our amazing guests we're going to speak to is- Life-changing guests. Life-changing. You impact yeah. people's lives. We all feel so insignificant. Like, yeah. what's the difference? What's the difference? So I started the daf. What, diff what if other people heard that, saw that, and they start too? We don't even know the difference, the spiral effect that we could have. I'll just, I'll just, I just got to give one quick plug here then because, you know, we're coming up on Sota. It's coming up very, very soon. Sota could sound very scary, you know, women uh, blowing up or something. Who knows what's, what's, what we're about to see. But 
apparently it's only about nine blot of the entire Masech they're dealing with the Sota, and the rest of it is just it's it's sugyas of uh, topics of agaditas and stories and and topics that we never would see, but they're very very famous. So if anyone wants to join us for Sota, we're giving out free Gemaras. I'm already saying we like I'm part of this, but I am we. part of it now. Yeah, we're giving out. Just let us know. We'll get you a free Gemara MDY. It's free. Join sixteen thousand people studying together. It. It's brilliant. First of all, it's so nice to know that you already completed all Sota. You know it's nine blah. You're already like what you you did it you did it once <laughs> just to just to get ready. But but I thought what you're gonna say is that you know I don't know is Ellie gonna get in trouble in Sota? Is it gonna make characters? There's, there's gonna be a lot of trouble. Trust me, it's gonna be a, be a lot, lot of, trouble. of trouble. We're all anticipating it, and um, trust me, you don't want to miss it. You don't. You but wait is, and see, exciting. everybody. Your energy and passion for Torah is contagious, and at its core, that's what behind the beam is really all about. We bring guests every week. And we've got guests from the most diverse backgrounds, different segments of orthodoxy, Jew, observant and not observant Jews, and uh, and we have non-Jews. There's something to learn from. In fact, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a, another another world famous baseball player, non-Jewish, African American, and there's something to learn from from everybody. And that's what behind the bima. But but at our core, we're Torah teachers. So you know, I was talking to to a big rabbi recently, a big Rosh Hashiva. And I'd invite him to be on, but you know, he said, I don't really do podcasts. My family doesn't really do podcasts. Podcasts is not yeah. like not my thing. He has some students who run podcasts. So I said, I, I made the mistake of inviting you on our podcast. It's not a podcast. I said, you know, we're not podcasters, we're not influencers. This isn't our full-time job. Not that there's anything wrong with that. For those who do it, they're having a great impact. Like we're a bunim, I'm a rav, we teach Torah, we we thank God of a thriving community. We do interviews. Had right. I said we're doing an interview, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to be interviewed. But it's interesting right. that for some, the word podcast has a negative connotation, like, you know, I, 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 I don't culture. know. Yeah. 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 Listen, so, uh, if it's good enough for a Reb Chaim Schavrusa editor, you know what I mean? Right. Right. We've right. had some. Yeah. Uri Tiger, Reb Uri Tiger, Reb Chaim Schavrusa. So inspiring. Right. And we had Reb Meiselman, and we have right. had such an array. Bernie Marcus, founder of Home Depot, <laughs> who, by the way, I don't know if you saw, but right after he was on buying the Bima, he was like the cover of every website news because he had made some comments about the economy and the banks that are closing. There are a lot. Listen, let's be honest. There are a lot of people who behind the Bima launched their career. Yeah. So come on behind the Bima. You Me? never know. <laughs> you never know. So yeah, including you. <laughs> including, including you. But tell us outreach wise, right? We, we live among an enormous number of unaffiliated Jews. So we have a responsibility to try to inspire and, and elevate. So tell us something we're going to be doing here for that. The biggest thing is, and I think I could even bring up the flyer right now. I wish I had it. I could bring it up in a, in a minute no, just when, talk we're, about when we're schmoozing about something else. But we are starting right now. We just met today with communities in uh, in Cherry Hill, in Pittsburgh, West Hartford. We're starting a uh, real, real strong initiative to, to set people up on all sides of the community with one another to develop relationship through Torah. The, right. the, the flagship program will be here in Boca. And we're looking at getting it started right after Pesach. So we're just putting the final touches on the flyer and the registration page. What so does that program friend, look like? Uh, what does that mean? Steve, Steve Plosker. It means imagine walking into a base medrash, you know, like we just went to NYU, or you went to BMG, or you went to some of the other, these other places. But instead of seeing one type of person creating that energy for the learning, you're seeing different types of people and not different types that this group is learning in that corner or that group is learning in this corner, but it's different types of Jews. You're going to have men studying with men, you have women studying with women, but very clearly different from one another, studying together. And even though we know there's some very, very successful programs, Partners in Torah, great, great program where you study together on the phone, study together on Zoom, you study together, you know, in, in, in many different ways over the computer. Just imagine a room of two, 300 people coming together every single week, which I know is one of your dreams. And I think yeah. that there's probably no greater um, engagement tool today than than the power of Torah. So why not do it? In, so it's in not a, it's not replacing our traditional base medrash, right? With the traditional base medrash, the traditional base no. medrash. This is this is another this is an outreach based medrash, and it's happening Correct. in communities across the country, right? And and I'm just saying that to save myself from emails later about our co-ed mixed every type of Jew based medrash. Describe no, 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 listen, listen, about. So no, I'm not saying that the men. Uh, let's just be program. clear. I'm not, I'm not even saying that men and women will be in the same room. It depends on the community, and every community will decide their own personal standards. But I'm saying there will be women that will have Absolutely. an opportunity to study with everyone. women, and there will be right, and there will be men studying everyone. And it's an interesting exactly. thing because right, for a long time, 
It was like turn Friday night into shot. We've had beautiful right. programs. They've all been wonderful, but give a bowl of chillin, sit at a Shabbos table. And that nobody's ever said, come to shul and hear a Haftorah. <laughs> you know, that's right. never been the, the, the tool or mechanism to try to inspire others. But this is a different, a different stab at it, which it's is a different saying, model. Speak the common language of Torah. Torah Correct. unites, Torah is timeless, Torah is a wisdom, everybody's thirsty for it. And don't get into judicial reform and abortion and gun control. Here's a text, here's Torah, let's unite around it. We're all looking for these values, we're it. looking for this wisdom, and go at it. And, and you did this already and once it, in Boca, in proof it, of concept, it was an amazing night. It actually worked. It actually worked. And, and I was just in Pittsburgh where they actually did the same thing right before Corona. They brought together at their JCC, they brought together almost 200 people and it was the greatest right. hit. And unfortunately, Corona just happened and then they never got it restarted. So God willing, we'll be there as well. And and I think like you said, and, and, and it's such an important point for anyone that's trying to, trying to do something like this in, in, in any community. It's that you're right. We used to look at... Uh, Shabbos, and we used to look at uh, you know the, the the classic example of serve a Jew a chicken, and you'll you'll you know you can bring a whole family in for a price of a chicken or something, great Shabbos right. meal. But here, the difference is Shabbos is once a week, and it's great. But Torah, it's every day. There's ever there's always a moment to 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 engage someone else. It could be in the morning, it could be in the evening, it could be multiple times during the week. But there's always another time you can learn something, and you'll never run out. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's a great way to to develop these relationships with our members Amazing. in our community. Now, what would you say to somebody who's intimidated who says, Torah, like, I can't learn myself. I don't even know which way to hold the book, the Hebrew upside down. Rashi's Good script, question. Like, I, can't, I can't sign up yeah. and learn with someone. Who am I to learn with someone? I can't learn myself. So part of the exciting um, booklets that we've put together is that they're actually designed with the both people in, in mind. So first of all, you're not dumbing down the Torah. It's not about trying to create fluff and that it's just like, oh, you know, one and done and, 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 and I had the experience and now there's nothing more. But on the contrary, let's help you understand how to study Torah. So we'll divide you up. We'll color code it. You be person right. number one. You'll be person number two. You read the red. I'll read the blue. This is a question. And even if you don't have the background, but you have a strong background, you have background in life, you'll bring Thank your you. personality to the conversation. You'll bring everything, you know, your life experience to that conversation and build the relationship. Let's, What's let's, the question? Again, like you, you said, go You want to move the needle or not move the needle? 73% right. intermarriage right outside of orthodoxy. We want to engage. We want to save the Jewish people. We want to have a continuity. So it's all up to us. You can't rely on outreach professionals, and it's not somebody else's job. Are you willing to engage? Are you willing to sit across the table? First of all, we got a great episode. There's people, thank you, Aral from Baltimore. We got Sarah Newcomb Gordon watching from New Jersey. We got Michelle from Passaic Live watching. We got Tahir Rabadi saying shalom. We got people from all shalom, over. Shalom, shalom. Shalom. If you're watching, post in a comment. We'd love to welcome you. We want to engage you. We want to prove to you that we're live. I'm going to hold up a newspaper like a, right. like a hostage. I don't know. What can you hold up? Here, 818, my phone. You see, we're live. We are live to you tonight. And we've got an amazing lineup. We've got great guests who are coming. We're really, really excited, excited about this and excited to uh, to move the needle and do that. Do that program. Let Torah be that equalizer. Let Torah be that conversation piece. Let Torah be that wisdom. Thank you. We got Simcha from Thornhill, Ontario. Oh, Kat, Ontario. The great Rabbi Ari Mirza from Boca Raton, Florida. So thank you all. Thank you for joining. Thank you for Ari. giving. Every dollar given matched. Matched. So Match you're giving right $2, now. even though it's only costing you once, which one, which is really, really exciting. You know what? But for those people that say, oh, you know what? I was going to give $100, but now I only have to give 50 No, you still give 100 and now it will be 200 that's exactly Don't try to right. take the easy way out, you know. A little Josh Brody economics for you. Exactly. Josh Brody. I know you, how Shelly. you're thinking. Thank I you, know Miriam the, from New York. No, the average Mark. guy. <laughs> we got we got we got Miriam from New York and our, our good friend Mark Blechner, who's please God should be healthy and well. Shabbos light. Amen. You have a Shabbos oh, light? Gotta tell you, Mark, every Shabbos, it's not just that we have the Shabbos light in our in our yeah. bedroom, but every Shabbos before I go to sleep. So I'm learning a little because of your light so thank you so much unbelievable you, you see that the, Here's example. The, the light again you could live life in one of two ways you could live life that it's all about you what can i take what can i get what are my rights and entitlements what's in it for me or you could think about every difference you make so mark invented and shared with us a shabbos light he sponsored behind the beam in the past and your point is the shabbos light enabled total learning because yeah. i was able to use and manipulate the light and by the way it's the greatest all the details and all, the, all the things about it are really really great so welcome the wogans from memphis our good friends and we're grateful to them they sponsor tomorrow we have our our uh, sunrise minion at the beach in memory of the great Sol khan 
of blessed memory. Sure, Allah, sure. our good sure. friends, all that minion. Special, special men. Love that minion. See, there's another example. You talk about the global community. You know, every every Friday, Arab Shabbos Mavarchim, we have a minion at the beach, the gazebo overlooking the ocean, the beach. You can watch it on the on the Boca Beach public cam. If you Google that, they have a live like cam. Don't look at it any <laughs> other time, by the way. Not endorsing <laughs> yeah. looking at it any other time. There's the but hotel sunrise, cam and the Boca cam. <laughs> sunrise, Friday morning, Arab Shabbos. Don't look at it ever any right. other time, but that time you can uh, you can see us davening and we give a little Torah afterwards. And that's just, again, it's Boca BRS trying to impact the global community. So I was in New Jersey this week, snow. Why anyone would live there? Really? Exactly that's snow? Sure. Snow. Mars. Snow. Wow. Snow. But uh, we'll be on the beach watching the sunrise. And if you're watching from the snow, vicariously live through us yeah. on the beach and hear our Dvar Torah. Again, we're global. We're trying to produce. We're trying to share. We're trying to involve. We're trying to be one big community. Not better, not different. Part part of Behind the Bima, what I'm really proud of Behind the Bima is that, you know, Behind the Bima has enabled us to be this big global community. What does it mean to be a global community? Not we're BRS-centric global community, but tonight we're going to hear from and meet with Rabbi Ari Leibowitz, Rabbi Daniel Kalish, Rabbi David Beshevkin, Alex Fletcher, uh, Lori Polotnik, and others. We're all one community. So now if you're in Boca, you're hearing people in Israel, you're hearing people in England, you're hearing people around the world. If you're in those other places, you're hearing from here. So we're grateful. Ozzy Rozalumski, thank you for your help behind the BMO. We're excited to work together. Lou Weiss from Woodmere, we'll be back in Modi and soon. Dvar Goldman from Teaneck. We've got a big group of people. It's hard to keep up. So many people listening, watching, who are feeling connected and part of part of what we're doing. And we're incredibly grateful. But I want to take a moment because this is very special. And we are welcoming back. Whoa. Uh, where I can't find the... Uh, Hold like, on, hold on. You don't, hold on. you don't even have a name for me anymore. Let's okay. We 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 we'll, 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 we'll call there the is. special guest. Now, Rabbi Moskos, let's be clear. You're not a special guest. You're you're a special host, a special host. And I know there are people around the world watching right now and uh, will be listening who are beyond excited and grateful to, uh, that you're back and to hear from you and to see you. It is, um, it's just amazing. It's amazing. And it doesn't mean that, you know, everything's normal or we're back to life or things are the way they were. It means that you are resilient and strong and incredible, and you want to continue to share the inspiration and, and the message of, of SDL Shalom. Last night, we had a shloshim here in Boca. I know I speak. I know I speak for the entire world in expressing our love and our support and our comfort and our strength and our everything to you and your tremendously special, amazing, amazing family. These 13 months, every episode of Behind the Bima, every year we've taught, everything we've all done has been with and for Esti, and it still is, as we spoke about last night, it still is. Her neshama is very much alive. And every time we connect it with a mitzvah and a conversation and Torah, we give that that neshama, the, the wardrobe, to be expressed back here again. So it's so meaningful that you're you're with us for a few minutes tonight and your commitment, of course, to our community and our global community and our shul. And thank you. Thank you for coming back and our hearts with you. We all love you. Everybody loves you. And we appreciate it very much. So I want, let me ask you a question. Much. Let me ask you a question. I, I know you've shared with me, and I, we're going to keep it a couple minutes. We know. We know how complicated. We don't know. We don't begin to know, but things are still complicated. Throughout this ordeal and this devastating loss that none of us can even begin to understand or relate to, you've shared with me what it's meant, the messages you've gotten from around the world. People you don't know, you never met, send a picture at the coat. Just maybe you could talk about that for a minute. First of all, not to focus on you, but to challenge and to encourage everyone else to do that for others, like what that means and therefore what it can mean and what it can do for other people. No, absolutely. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate everything. And it's good to, to see you both and to be back on Behind the Bima. You know, I've, I've learned a lot of lessons over this year, a lot of lessons. Um, you know, now is probably not the time to go through each one of them. But at the forefront of those lessons is the notion of just showing up and the power of showing up. And in showing up can mean physically showing up. It can mean a text message. It could be an email. It could be a WhatsApp message. Uh, there are lots of ways to show up in a person's life, but every single one of them is meaningful. And for those of you out there listening, if you ever wondered, you know, I, I have a friend who's going through something. Should I send him a message? Should I not send him a message? Should I, should I reach out? Should I not reach out? My advice is always reach out. You might not always get a response. There were days that people reached out and it was a rough day and I didn't have the emotional energy to respond to them. And that's okay. But every single message that I received over the last 13 months was meaningful and helpful and gave us indescribable chizuk and uplifted us at times. And so just show up, 
and it makes a difference. And if you're ever hesitating or on the fence, the answer is send it. Send that text message that says, thinking of you today. Send that text message that says, just want you to know, I learned a little bit, you know, as Rafua Shlema or Lulia Nishmas, it makes such a big difference in the lives of people who are going through things. Because one of the things that, you know, I know you started speaking about a lot, Rabbi Goldberg, but there's the acute illness that someone goes through or the crisis that a family goes through. And then there are the peripheral um, complications that come along with it, I'll call them. And at the forefront of that really is, a, is just a feeling of loneliness. You know, you could be in a room of hundreds of people, but if you're going through something very difficult and everyone else is not, so you just it's a very lonely experience. And so when someone sends you that text message that just says, I just want you to know, you know, I saw you across the room or I was thinking about you or something I was reading reminded me of you. And I just want you to know I'm thinking of you. It takes away just a little bit of that loneliness. And that just, again, it's, it's an indescribable feeling of how helpful it is. We appreciate you sharing that. And hopefully people will act on that because, you know, on the other end, you're not sure what to write. And you sit and you perseverate and you write and you delete and you wonder and and often you conclude you know what forget it or or even if you just reach for the keyboard you say is it really gonna make a difference like with what they're going through i'm sure they're hearing from everybody else they don't need me or i'm not in the inner circle i'm not so so close um and and so your your description your testimony about how much it means should hopefully really motivate and inspire us hopefully the people around us are not in a bad way, but but to to do to pick up the keyboard and do something. Yeah, and I want you to know there were. I mean, again, it's it it was humbling and comforting, but there were literally hundreds and hundreds of people who were here throughout Shiva, and I say this without exaggeration. Every single person who came, every single person who came, provided comfort, and you know some of the most meaningful visits were people that we didn't even know. Um, you know, people obviously local, some who flew in actually, who we, we really didn't know, but just felt connected to the Jewish people, to our community, to, you know, to comforting someone. And it was, um, it was very, very meaningful. But there were a lot of people that came who, when they came to, I know you're just talking about outreach, but when they came to, you know, conclude the Shiva call, so there's that phrase that we all say, and there were people who were not comfortable with saying the Hebrew. And so a lot of them actually brought on their phone a transliteration of how to say it. And they stumbled and it was, it was really challenging for them. And, you know, they apologized. And I kept on telling every single person who did that, I said, not only do you not do to apologize, I said, you don't even need to say it. I said, you being here speaks much louder than any words that you could say right now. And that's, I guess, the other message is it's not about what you say all the time and it's not about how you say it. It's about being there. It's about your presence. It's about letting the person know that they're not alone. And you know what? And you know this as well as I do. Some people said the wrong things over the last year and some of them were, you know, maybe even borderline hurtful. But I have learned to be a little bit more forgiving and to understand certainly over these last 30 days. And my wife has been enormously helpful in this, but just everyone means well and everyone's trying their best. And, and you know, it's, it's awkward for everybody. And right. so I've, I've learned to be a lot more forgiving and just to appreciate just the notion of reaching out and being there for other people. You know, you talk about you talk about showing up. Um, last night at the Shloshim, there was a very special person, and, and you referenced a special person. So several people asked me, you know, who was that special person? And let's just say, as as Hamish as our community has become, and as many Hasidim have moved in, but you know, it was a, a person who dresses I'll, I'll like. I'll speak a, about it. Yeah. No, I'll, you don't even have to I, use I, his name. But no, no, I won't he, use the name at all. But... He showed up, and and yeah, so who, there who was, was a special guest. There was a, a, a yid, just a really special Jew. Um, not from America, whose daughter was in St. Jude when we were there. And we become very close with them. You know, when you're there, let's just say St. Jude is not a bastion of orthodoxy. <laughs> that might come as a surprise to the listeners. But, um, you know, when you find another orthodox family who, who's staying next to you and going through some of the similar life situations that you are, so you, you connect on, on a very deep and meaningful level. And we became very, very close with them. And he's just a very special Jew. He's a Rav. And we traded Torah sometimes and shared Divrei Chizik with one another and uplifted one another. And, and um, you know, he's going through his own challenges. They're not in Memphis anymore either. And, you know, we're in touch. Probably at Erev Shabbos, he sends me a Dvar Torah. I send him a Dvar Torah. But it's, it's very meaningful. Last night, I showed up at BRS. And I was in your office. I don't think you had come yet. And all of a sudden, this, this Satmer Chassid shows up. And I had to do a double take because I hadn't seen him in a couple of months, but he flew in. And I, there's very little time in my life as a rabbi that I am utterly speechless. <laughs> like 
not, you know, you say speech, literally speechless. I was literally speechless last night that he flew in. And he's, again, he's got plenty of his own to take care of elsewhere. And he just showed up and he figured out a way. He got a ticket. He came right. down. I don't even know where he slept last night. I happen to know it took him a while to get home today, but he just showed up and, you know, he felt bad he wasn't here earlier. I hadn't told him right when SD was nifter because I didn't want to burden him with uh, with my troubles. I knew he had, you know, stuff going on of his own. So he he, he missed the Levi and he missed Shiva and he just he just wanted to be there. And he came and he sat in the corner and it wasn't never about him. It was always about just being there for me and, and being for me and Ariel. And it was just um, it was just an incredible comfort. And it gave us such enormous chizuk to be there. And this is a Jew that doesn't look like me, doesn't dress like me, comes from right. a different background than I do, um, speaks differently than I do. And yet we connect on such a deep level and him being there was just indescribably comforting. Yeah, it's about the showing up. That's really an amazing theme about the uh, the just showing up and the difference that you make. So it, w- it was a very, very powerful evening. We hope and we we pray that it was a comforting evening. And we're grateful that you that you joined us here because uh, we know it's hard, but we also know your your effort and commitment to um, to be there for our community beyond that. Listen, beyond one your, thing that hasn't course. changed over the last 13 months, I believe BRS, everyone knows that, you guys know that. And every you know Wednesday night, I've, uh, I sat there um, lamenting that I wasn't able to be on with you guys. So you know, any opportunity to join and hopefully God willing soon to rejoin, you know, uh, behind the beam on a more regular uh, fashion. I will say one thing towards our global community, because this is a global celebration of BRS. Right. I've gotten so many messages from the global community, not just our members, the global community. And I'm sure there are those of you out there saying, and, and it was funny, a lot of them started by saying, you don't know me, but I know you. Hmm. Right. You don't know me, but I spent every Wednesday night with you during yeah, COVID. Yeah. So I'll just post this right now. Oh, uh, yeah, there you go. Exactly. So I got many, many messages like that. And they were amongst some of the most moving messages wow. that I got because it's exactly what we're talking about. It just connecting and letting someone know you're there for them. And it also just shows not just the reach of the global community, but the power of the global community. That, yeah, you could be in Woodmere or L.A. or London or Israel or Australia. It doesn't matter. If you join us here on Wednesday nights or this week on Thursday night and you enjoy our Torah and our banter and our friendship, then you're part of a community. And you know what? Even though we don't necessarily know your names as well as you know ours or know your faces, you're part of our community. And I felt incredibly connected with every single person who reached out to me from our global community. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for taking a couple minutes and being on. Yeah. And we're looking forward, please, God, as, as time passes and... Um, you, obviously your heart will not fully heal, but as you gain strength and, and you're able to come back, boy, have you been missing. First yeah. of all, I, I've had this with Brody alone, <laughs> First, <laughs> which makes it every episode. I'm just davening <laughs> that Brody doesn't say something I'll have to apologize exactly. for. And you know what? Regret, censor, okay. edit, erase. So boy, have you been boy, missed. Boy, have you. Boy, I just, I'll just say that tonight, this is like, there, there is no marathon episode. It was just a trick to get you on. <laughs> <laughs> this is the end of the show. It would have been worth it just for that. It is all worth it just for that. Yeah. But, you know, Brody's done a, he's done a pretty good job in your absence, but there's no one like you and there's nothing like you. And we, boy, have we missed your voice and your yeah. person and your contribution. And, and when you're ready and when, when your strength returns, we can't wait to have it back more regularly. Thank you, guys. All right. Give early, give often tonight. And I hope you guys don't drink too much because it's going to be a long night. (laughs) It will be. (laughs) Thank you. And we have special guests now. Welcoming. We have very special guests. Uh, Thank you, by the way, those who are given. I'll introduce the guests in a second. But again, we are. This is the global campaign. And we got a special, special anonymous donor tonight who was matching. Not one of these made up, not one of these fake, not one of these. A real donor who said whatever comes in today, tonight, by the end of this episode, they'll match dollar for dollar. You give, you're giving twice as much because you got a donor who's matching at brsonline.org slash global, brsonline.org slash global, and you can give. We have right now, we right now have a power couple who are going to be honored at Booker Raton Synagogue this Sunday night, Binyamin and Shani Michelle. Binyamin is also very involved in Behind the Bima. I won't say what role he has. I think I outed him in one episode by accident. Two roles. Two, two roles. episodes? Twice no, I did it? No, two, two roles. roles. Two roles that he has. What are the two roles? Let's say, give us a little, give us a little. Yeah, you've seen the behind the scenes of the of the other role. Yeah, give us a little bit of opening, Binyamin. Give us a little bit the way we start. From Boca Raton, Florida, this is the BRS oh. edition of Behind the Bima. I like it. You I didn't realize that was him. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say, Rabbi? I said, I didn't realize that that was you. Now I know. 
<laughs> now you know. Also, some suggest maybe the fact checker has been helping us check some facts. In fact, he's such a good fact checker on a different WhatsApp group recently. There was a discussion about something and Benjamin made a suggestion and I said, no, no, that's wrong. And he said, ah, you're right. And I made a joke. Can someone print that and frame it for me? And I came to my office the next day and sitting on my desk. Actually, <laughs> yeah, but I want to know, was he really right? Or you're just being nice? No, no, he was right. He was, um, I mean, well, this would be a step up. because He's last not here right now. He won't hear you. Was he really yeah, right? Sitting on my desk was a framed copy of Benjamin admitting I was right about something. About yeah, I, I saw about Benjamin about in your office earlier walking out with that, by the way. Uh, is that where it went? I don't see it anymore. My friends, every time I was right, it would be a lot of friends. I'm just, I'm just... Wow, Michael. There, Michael would run out of friends. Famous, there's a famous one in our house, which is that uh, we, oh, we both yeah. love Jewish music. And it was the first day, it was Shemini at service, it was the first day of a three day Yom Why do you remember that? Okay. And, and we were debating whether, because uh, on Hoshana Raba, we say, uh, among the other Tfilos, we say Hoshana Raba is Koma Vasar, Mavasar, Vemera, Koma Vasar, Mavasar, You say it three times. And that night, which means at Terrace, we were talking about the song, Avram Fried's song, Call Me Vasser, Me Vasser. So I, because we say it three times in the Tila, I was very insistent that he says it three times in the song. And Shani says, no, it's not. It's just twice. Call Me Vasser, Me Vasser. That's the second time. So we spent three days. You can listen. We couldn't put on the CD for three days. So we spent three days debating it. And then as soon as uh, Motzei Shabbos, after the three days was over, Found out that she was right as she oh. was many yes. times before. Many times since. learns very early on that I'm usually right. Yeah, it's not. It, it's it's a miserable feeling. Thank God it doesn't. Happen. <laughs> Thank God it doesn't happen to me often. Anyway, so let's uh, introduce our special guest. First of all, again, if you're listening, if you're watching, if you're part of this live marathon, let us know. Put it in the comments. I'd love to welcome you. We're grateful for uh, Lou Ben Howie Penner and uh, the blocks from Psaic Project Inspire. And we've got people from all over, so thank you. And and every dollar given tonight is being matched. So, Binyamin and Shana, you're being honored by BRS this Sunday where's, night at our where, annual dinner. Where's, where's our display name? I, we put on a special display name for this, and now we'll always see a special guest. Oh, let's see. Hold on. I can, I can actually change that. Let's see. Okay. Let's see if I can. Director. I know. There we go. Okay, now nope. you said female special. Yeah. Oh, wow. A lot of overlays here. The Schwester and the, yeah. Um, with the honorees at BRS Journal Dinner this Sunday night, Shani is my sister-in-law, Benjamin, my brother-in-law, and more than that, my dearest, dearest friends and enormous helpers helping throughout our community. So what motivates you, the two of you, to be involved, to lead, to give your time? Talk about community, community involvement. You're being honored because you care uh, whether it's uh, through NCSY and the youth of our community, whether it's uh, helping not only edit, but helping elevate everything that's produced through ritual, davening, laning, Megillah reading. There's so much that you both do on a regular basis. Where's that come from? Are there people that inspired that? Did you see that? What mo motivates you to be involved? This is a spoiler alert for the video. All right. We saw a lot of this on the, on the video for, uh, for Sunday, but you, you want to take it? Oh, wow. Okay, I'll take it. Uh, I think, first of all, of yeah, a, a lot of it comes from uh, the top and seeing, anyway. and, and, seeing, uh, and seeing how the people who lead the shul lead by example and are so dedicated and devoted to the shul. But uh, for me personally, I think it comes from things that I get excited about. Shani knows um, it's a strength and a weakness. Things I get excited about, I get really excited about. So when something like Smichas Chaver was being discussed, I'm like, I'm all in. What do we need to do? How do we make this the best program it could be, the best Smichas Chaver program that we could make it in America, internationally, was going to be amazing. Uh, so we spent time on that. When we something like Ovis Ubanim, somebody asked me to help out. I think it was Rabbi Shabtai years ago. Can you help with the raffle? And, and then he suddenly... have a really loud voice. That carries very <laughs> that, well. That's, that's, how, that's how I end up doing most and things. And a lot of energy. Right. That, that's really what it comes down to. Energy and a loud voice. A loud voice gets you like... Uh, we need someone to lead a marv after a chuppah. It's like, oh, why don't you get you have a lot of voice? You do. Yeah. Uh, what's your uh, Binyama, What's your record for Megillah reading? What first of all, how many times on a Purim and what speed? Not ten minutes. Uh, no, I've leaned Megillah probably one Purim is probably nine or ten times, uh, and speed I've done it around thirteen and a half minutes. I think I broke under thirteen once. I'm not sure if that was a. Uh, no, I don't know. I think it was kosher. <laughs> I don't know how much coffee there was. Performance answers, but uh, it's usually a good. <laughs> A good 13, 13 minutes. 13 minute mark. It yeah. was thought that it couldn't be broken, but once the first person broke it, they opened the door. Yeah. For like, that's for your last reading of the, the Suba at someone's wedding. Like Yeah, <laughs> I, re I read the Suba fairly quickly and Brody decided to time it I couldn't do while that. I was up there. But, uh, I'll tell you, nobody's ever said, I you know, I really wish the person reading the Suba would slow down. Nobody's ever like, I, I'd like to savor that. I really wish the Chuppah lasted a little bit longer. Has never been said by anyone everywhere, anywhere. Yeah. So. 
Last Thank question, Miguel. Before you read the Megillah, I did notice that you turned around, and I, it looked to me like you're looking at the clock. Did you? Was that was that was that what you were doing just to see yeah, what? No, 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 no. The Shul Melch on my phone. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it was absolutely like was right absolutely before. It's like, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I say the brachos. Everybody takes. Right. I wait a second so people could sit down, and and so there's no noise when I start the actual Megillah. But I'm absolutely looking at the clock. I want to know what the time is. I think it's. I don't check dirt while I'm waiting, but after yeah. I like know exactly how long it was and. And uh, get the feedback from people uh, during the year do in many you, different ways. Do you do the fist bump? The, fist bump. the pump if you if you break your records? Would you oh, no, not, not that's that's yeah. that's reserved special. Uh, so, Shani, what would your message be to uh, those listening? They could get involved in community. Why should they? Why not just live life for yourself? Why why get involved? Why do? Why care? What, what does it mean for your family? There's so much. There's there's just so much that we can be doing to help the greater community. Um, and if we have certain co-hosts that um, are being bestowed upon us, it's it would be selfish not to share that with the people who really need it. And I, I just, I, I mean, I I have it. He's doing it out of the kindness of his heart. I I get paid, but even so, I I just I feel very blessed to be able to use the co-hosts that I've been given to help um, this very worthy organization and CSY and. Um, it's not only a job, it's the ability to really be doing chesed while doing a job. And there's something very, very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Inspiring. Inspiring, but also like, I get, you know, you get a certain hana from that. A gishmak. A gishmak, exactly. So, yeah, it's not just a job. It's really, there's something very special about that. So, and we're a real family over there. So it's, it's a special place. We do a lot of good, a lot of good things. It's a beautiful thing, and we're grateful for both of your leadership and contributions and all of the – we'll still debate the Oxford comma. That'll be a debate that will last uh, forever. We, we, last, last time I was here, we, we, this is a step up from our last conversation about the Oxford comma, about two spaces after a period, about Rav Schechter eating locusts. That was actually a good conversation. I'm, still, I'm sticking with the two spaces after the, the period. I'm a traditionalist. Oh, I'm a lot <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I, got a framed, I got a framed document to say otherwise, but yeah, why don't wish you both – Should we answer the Shul Cynic first? Nah, not worth no. it. Well, um, we yeah. wish you both a, uh, a big mazel tov on the honor. Well deserved. We're excited and looking yeah. forward to celebrating together with you. Thank you for all that you do. Thank and you. And hopefully you inspire others to do more with you. And uh, thank you for being family. Thank you much more for being such close friends and for, for all that you do for us all the time. We really appreciate it. And thank you for everything that you do for us uh -huh. as a family and for the greater community. We would not be where we are if thank not. Thank you, and you are extremely important to us and very oh, that's so sweet. I mean, do, do you ever get con confused for the Rabbitson? Uh, no, but I have been asked who's older, which really bothers me <laughs> because we, yeah. I'm significantly younger. I won't tell, I won't say how many else. I'll, I'll protect you, Chabed, <laughs> but let's just say that she was holding me when I was a baby and she was uh -huh. old enough to be holding me as a baby. So it's not let, bad. let's just say that the day after my Lachayim to Yochevet, I was writing Shani's Bat Mitzvah speech that's for her. True. Okay. Anyway, that let's might just, just, let's just say our, our listeners are probably going to start guessing right now. Yeah. <laughs> that might be the first speech that I wrote. Certainly it, wrote for it, someone actually, else. It might, have been. it might have been. Wow. Fun times. That was that was a wild week, and those were yeah. fun times. So, yeah. Mazel tov to you guys. Thanks for joining us for a few minutes. We'll catch you later. Thank you. It's a, a big honor now to be able to welcome wow. on our good friend. And welcome wow. back. To wow. Lori Palanik, Lori, thank you for coming back Look behind who's the back. Beam with us. This time you don't have to wake up in the middle of the night. And this time I you don't know, have to correct us. We're on the same time women. zone. Same, same time zone. zone. We've had many, many Crazy. women since we last spoke. So we, we heard well, you I did, I did, I did. I did open with Tohaha. I gave you yeah. a rebuke that, uh, I, that when I reviewed up behind the Beamer to see what you guys were doing, you guys, the rabbis were doing, <laughs> I... Uh, I didn't see a lot of women. So thank, I've, I've been noticing that you have been um, prioritizing some women, and that's great. Awesome. We are. Some of my best friends are women. Some of my best <laughs> wives and daughters are women. So we spend a lot of time with women. Most, are the best. most of your kids. Women are the best. And Laura, you're doing an amazing job with women through Momentum and all of your efforts and transforming the world. But we want to talk about tonight, bringing you back for a few minutes, and thank you for coming back. This is our global campaign, what BRS stands for, trying to really impact not only locally, but the values that we share with people who are all over and, and collaborating with you and with so many others on the things that we care about all together equally and in partnership and trying to make that difference. So Lori, I know this was a tough week. You lost one of your mentors, a really transformational leader, somebody who had an enormous impact on this world. Rebetzin Dina Weinberg, Rav Noach's wife. Um, talk to us a little bit about her. I saw a very meaningful post that you wrote, but for the people who didn't see that, if you could share a little bit about 
her and about your connection with her and her involvement in your journey. And through that, because this is the amazing thing, is one of the themes we've been touching on tonight so far is, right, she impacted you and through you, how many people have gone on, on your trips? We have engaged over 22,000 participants from 35 countries in partnership with over 300 organizations around the world. Right, so so her connecting you and inspiring you really inspired 22,000 more people and you're just getting started. There's so much Plus more to another, come. Another, come. Another, another it's really 22,000 families because it's like we, yeah. bring, we really engage the Jewish mother and she brings she she in turn brings the family to where it's supposed to be. So share with us a little bit if you can. So I met Rebetzin Weinberg. I and I really thank you for the opportunity to share this because it's um, it's really hitting me very hard, harder than I, I, I expected. She's been sick for a while, but she had played a major role in my life. I met her in 1985. 1985, I was on the first Jerusalem Fellowships. This was long before there was Taglit and Birthright, mm. and. I went with 120, they said the best of the brightest of college students and university students and around uh, North America. I was in Canada at the time. And it was a six week study and tour program. And about uh, probably about halfway through the program, Robertson Weinberg came out to Telstone to speak to the women. The, the, the young women were in Telstone, which is just outside of Jerusalem. And the guys were in the old city of Jerusalem. And my, we were just like all in, you know, shorts and tank tops. And she came, she was so regal, like regal. She had such a presence and we were a handful and she spoke to us with elegance and grace, with tremendous strength. Cause we were like a little bit of chutzpah dick and pushing back and rolling our eyes. And you know, she, she exuded such such clarity in what she was speaking to us about. So afterwards, uh, we just wanted to go into town and have fun. So we asked to hitch a ride with her and we were in the car and she was pretty cool about everything. <laughs> After the six week program, I still had a lot of questions, a lot of issues and I needed to work them out. So I extended most 99% of the people got on the plane and went back to their cities. They, they, most of them became Jewish leaders, very strong Jewish leaders in North America in the years to come. And about two or three girls who had planned to stay, stayed. I had not planned. I was ready to go back to my life. I had a big job. I had a whole life going on. But I had questions. And I knew that if I got on that plane, I would just get sucked back into my life. Hmm. And I don't like could have, would have, should have in life. So I stayed. And I stayed for you know one more Shabbos, one more week, one more week. And I checked myself into her school. The school was called Iyat, and it was in Kiryat Sons, which is a very, very religious neighborhood in Jerusalem. Not a, not a and, soft landing. No. And so, and that's another thing. Like she, her priority was her family. And so she lived in Kiryat Sons. So she had Kanina Har many children, but she opened up a school and for women. And it was sort of almost like a small boutique place. If I had gone to another place, another school with like, you know, a campus, and I, I just would have like floated around. But this was intense. And she gave me a personal relationship with God. Mm. It's so it was so real for her. She lived and she breathed it. And she demand she she set a bar for us. And the bar was greatness. And she said, it's not enough to be good. Nobody wants the rabbi at the end, at 120 at your funeral, to say, she was okay. He was pretty darn average. Mm. Everybody wants the rabbi to say, she was great. He mm. was great. And this is why. And she demanded greatness. She set a bar that I've never reached. Mm. But thank God she never lowered the bar. She was strong in her convictions. She was, she had such kavod such such honor for gadolim for the, the the great rabbis she was unwavering and she didn't always agree with her husband <laughs> there was you know at at iat there was uh the ace girls and then there were like the Robertson girls so i was mm. more of an ace girl in that i was extremely idealistic i really did want to very quickly i you know one one job is one job is i'm going to be here for one more shabbos so then i gave up my job and it sounds very light. It was the heaviest decision and the best decision of my life was to stay. And I had to find where I fit. She 
he just what I, I don't know I don't know how to explain to have somebody in your life you know like I think you you have physical parents and then you have spiritual parents hmm. and we're taught that your, your physical parents they they give you life in this world but your spiritual parents whoever was that person who brought you really into that deep relationship with Hashem and learning and Torah and commitment they bring you into the world to come so when Reb Noach passed away 14 years ago we there was a sense of and very heavy especially for my husband and for myself I with Roberts and Weinberg passing I I feel for the first time orphaned hmm. like that there's this vacuum and I feel responsible to step up I I don't know how to process this and I don't know where what that means I'm I'm always giving it my all but I feel that there's the, her her bar and her demand for it and her leaving this world means that we all have to do more with Reb Noach and Reb Tzvi Weinberg gone. It's it, it is it is up to us and we have no choice. And she she was she was incredible. Yeah, you know, I'm just wondering. Reb Noach never really got to see the success that momentum became. Did the Rebbitson get a chance to to participate? And, and and what was that like for her to see someone that came, you know, back in the days of Telstone hitching a ride, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's tens so of thousands of women. She, she was your spiritual parent. You were her daughter. Yes. So I have to tell you, for 13 years, we lived in Toronto, and only once, and we were creatory there, and for only once did Rebbitson Weinberg ever come to Toronto. She rarely left Israel, rare. And to see her outside of Israel was like, almost like, like under like it, it, it was it, it seemed odd to me and sort of uh it threw me off and i remember driving her around toronto and i said to her because my husband and i had opened up a shul it's called the village shul in toronto and most asia tours back then were the educational centers and we were the first ones really to open up like a, a synagogue based you know so like uh and i'm sure you both relate to it how important it is to build community and how people families will lift each other and I said to her, I feel very uncomfortable when somebody refers to me as Robertson. I, I was young. I hardly knew anything. I'm having children. We're like, we had no role model with Anisha Torah to build a community. We're just kind of like learning it as we go. And she turned to me and she said, you are a Robertson. Because hmm. for me, she's the Robertson. I still would never feel comfortable anybody referring to me as that around Robertson Weinberg for sure. But for her to give me that stamp of approval, and she did tell me that she was proud of me. And then she gave me tohaha. Then she gave me rebuke. Whenever I would bring women on trips, be even before momentum, I would be like, I'm going to Israel. Who wants to go? It wasn't so strategic. Now it's extremely strategic. And often we would bring them to Robertson Weinberg or Robertson Weinberg would come to speak, or maybe some, even on momentum, some of our partner organizations will take their women to, they took to, to visit Robertson Weinberg. And you know, I always got a message when I was in Israel, the Rebbitson wants to see you. Hmm. And I remember telling my right-hand person, I said, oh, I have to go and I have to meet with Rebbitson Weinberg. And she, she said, why? I said, because she she's going to give me tochacha. She's going to give me rebuke. And they would say like, why would she do that? You're amazing. You're doing this. I said, no, no, no. You don't understand. This is the, the highlight of my year. And I would go and she would always tell me what I'm doing wrong and what I should be doing more of. And she wanted me to integrate in Toronto, like integrated to the, the, the observant community more. And she was always like, thank God, if, if somebody, if somebody really cares about you, they'll tell you where you're making mistakes. If they don't care, like whatever you do your thing, I do mine. She right. cared very much and she kept that bar high. And if anything, she kept raising it for me. And, and it was a privilege to, to receive her, her rebuke and her guidance and to know that there are people in the world who are unwavering and that's there's there's not a lot of people like that left it's we you have we have to pick up the baton of those people when they when they leave this world there's the absence they create but also the responsibility that they create of having to pick up the baton and baton and go from there but i love the way you describe that that someone who really loves you is willing to not only praise you and take pride in you but also willing to push you and willing to give you that feedback and we learned that from the torah itself right with yaakov with the sons when he calls them in and the torah says he's giving them brachos he starts to call them out you know right. you're impulsive and you're this and you're that and, and the commentators are like where's the bracha 
You know, imagine you go to, to a gadol and they don't say bracha vatzlacha. They don't say you want a bracha for gazunt, for good health, for parnasa, for nachas, for children. They say my bracha is. Let me tell you how you could be doing more, how you could be doing better. But that's that's a real expression of love, and you see that. You know, sometimes I listen to podcasts of popular, famous people, and they talk about the the people who don't excel surround themselves with yes people. They only want to hear yes. They don't want to hear praise. They want to, hear, and there's nobody willing to push back. And and to really achieve greatness, you need to have those people. And it sounds like she was such a person. Lori, could you address or talk to? I, I think something about her that obviously I didn't. I didn't. Maybe not obviously. I didn't know her, and I don't know that much about her other than obviously her reputation, her legacy of greatness. But I know her through you and and our community's connection with you and your greatness and the great great things that you're doing, which are outstanding. And and your story, which is amazing. And I'll refer our listeners back to an earlier episode of Behind the Bima where we got to really unpack your story much more fully. The person in Toronto who pushed you to go on this trip last minute, who changed the trajectory of your life, and through that. 22,000 families' lives and generations to come. And again, it comes back to you never know. Don't be lazy. Push someone, encourage someone, connect somebody. You never know the difference you can make. But can you speak to how did she, how did she walk that fine line uh, as a woman between a loyalty to a traditional sense of modesty and yet being a leader, an impactful transformational leader? How is it not about, you know, today this, it's complicated. It's a complicated world. There are a lot of people with a lot of agendas. There's a lot of isms out there. And those are a big distraction, and they also end up being also often very dividing. How did she avoid that? And was that something that she communicated or articulated specifically to you and the generation of women she impacted? Did that come up, that balance between women's leadership and modesty and tradition with modernity and how to sort of navigate all that? You know, the fact that she was a role model of starting her own school and also not always agreeing with her husband and like creating... Uh, a generation of, of women who really wanted to marry greatness, like in men. She always said, you're, you're not riding to heaven on your husband's coattails. Like this is yours. Mm. She had a sense of, you know, I remember just in terms of being a woman and being a speaker and being out there in the public, which is not, it's, uh, it's, it's not the ideal. It really is not the ideal, but we're not living in ideal times. And she was very encouraging of me. And I remember she spoke in New York once and I heard she spoke to a mixed audience. Okay. I was like, come on, like never did I ever see that. She made the men sit in the back. <laughs> it was the best. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the men were in the back. You want to be in the class? Fine. But you that. sit in the back. You sit in the back. So she was always very, very tsunua, very modest in and very dignified, like just, and, and she wasn't, you know, sometimes, I'm sorry, like you walk through some of the very religious neighborhoods in Israel and in Yerushalayim, and if I'm wearing any color whatsoever that's not black or gray or dark beige, I feel like like I'm standing out and I'm uncomfortable. Robertson Weinberg always wore color. She always wore very colorful clothes, and her 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 wrap. She never wore a shape. Totally, she never wore a wig. She always uh, covered her hair with a beautiful wrap that always coordinated with her her clothes, but always color. Like Hashem created color. Like what's going on? Like are we all in mourning? Like like right. she really was. But again, with dignity, not look at me. There's she taught us. There's a fine line between being attractive and attracting. We're supposed to be attractive but not attracting. And she walked that line. And she, I remember whenever there was an event, like a big Eish Gala in Jerusalem or something, she would she would never come unless there was a mechitza, unless there was a divider. And when Reb Noach always, always, when she was in the room, would always say that all his, everything he's achieved is because of her. Mm. And she would always look down and like, you know, she was embarrassed and she she would always shake her head like, why is he doing this? But always, because she she held the court, like she held the home front together and built this school. And sometimes he was he was away for months on end, hmm. months on end, built it, like raising money for Aisha Torah and what he wanted to do. And there was, uh, I, I do want to share that there was a yeshiva. He started five other yeshivas before he started Aisha Torah. And he tells the story about this one he tried to do for the Israelis and get, get this and, and closing and opening. And there was one just before Aisha Torah. Uh, and he was told, he was given ad advice from, uh, from a gadol that uh, he told him two things. When he told him what he wanted to do, 
he said to because back then people didn't do this like the idea of taking somebody who didn't have knowledge yeah. of judaism and teaching them and empowering them and then they become not only committed observant jews but they they in turn will go out there and and bring other people in so and he got a lot of criticism he said everybody said he was mashuga he was crazy so so he when he started the yeshiva before Aisha Torah, which shall remain nameless right now so he was told two things number one don't expect anybody to be grateful and number two don't take partners so he did take partners and it didn't work out and there was a split and he was very angry about it. I, I believe there was a very like you know because a lot of work and money went into it and he was going to take them to base he was going to do this and the story goes it's a legendary story that Robert and weinberg said you're not doing that just go start another yeshiva so hmm. he went to the old city and he started a Torah, and the rest is history mm. wow it's her credit and she deserves that credit. What a legacy. What a legacy she leaves. And, and we're thinking about the whole Isha Torah community and beyond. They're great people, men and women. The world loses them. There's a light that gets more dim that goes out. And through you and, and through Aish and with Aish, we, we certainly feel that. Lori, in, in our last couple of minutes, and thank you for giving us time. We know you're, you're here changing the world. Give us an update since we last had you. What's next for Momentum, for Lori Palatnik? What's the vision? What's the next step? What's, what, what are we excited? What's happening? So this is what's going on. Thank you for asking. So we believe that during COVID, COVID, uh, every challenge comes with tremendous opportunity. Right now, there's a tremendous pent up desire for travel and for meaningful travel because people couldn't travel. So now people want to travel and apparently meaningful travel is on the rise. Why? We went through a trauma and we need to process that. Right. Also, God did reverse psychology. Israel said, now you can't come, close their borders. <laughs> So now people like want to come hmm. and it's so we believe there is a window that will close just like after 9-11 nationalism and unity and that was over but we believe there's a window now where we can take advantage of this opportunity that god has given us and our plan is to instead of bringing 7,500 women in the next three years our goal is to bring 15,000 jewish mothers in Whoa. the next three years and we just also started um uh, uh, we launched an app. It's called Yom, Y-O-M-M. -M. It's going to be the biggest social network, global social network for Jewish women around the world. And we just took my book, Remember My Soul, just became a free audio book. You go to RememberMySoul.org. We have books and podcasts and webinars. So if anybody wants any information, go to MomentumUnlimited.org. MomentumUnlimited.org. And we I'm a big fan of, of yours. So I just want to say your community rocks. I go all over the world. The BRS community is unbelievable. And they are blessed with incredible leadership. And it's always a privilege to visit and to be part of the incredible work that you're doing. Thank you. We really appreciate it. It's kind of you to say, and, and we feel so connected to your work. We love when you come to town and the teaching that you do here and the difference you're making for the women and men, the things that you've done, uh, and families uh, of South Florida, of the Boca community, and 15,000. That's it's mind boggling. It's amazing. And you deserve all the credit. And the person who suggested you go on that trip deserves all the credit. And the Rabbitson deserves all the credit. And you just see when you impact and you touch someone's life. You, you know, you, the exponential impact is so much bigger than that. And all of us should be inspired by those stories. So, Lori, thank you for joining us again. It's wow. great to have you back. We can't wait to hear. Thank you. Wow. Thanks. That's amazing. And Simone's bringing another group in May. She's going uh, mid-May. Another, another group trip. of women from Boca. Another bus. Yeah. Another bus. And the follow ups amazing. Thank you to everybody tonight. All of the donations to the global campaign are being matched. Whatever you give. Anonymous just gave $180, but they really anonymously gave $360. I had to do the math. Did you see me doing the math there? Yeah. You yeah. impressed by that? 180 times two? Did the math. <laughs> three, carry the three, $360. So we've got a great donor matching every dollar. Uh, oh, BRS, anonymous donor. BRS, what's it? BRSonline.org slash global. And uh, we really appreciate it. We got incredible behind the Bima swag. If people have seen all the swag that we got, we got the behind the Bima. We got the behind the Bima cup. We got the behind the bag it. We've got incredible behind the beam of hats. Do we have socks yet? In the back. Whoa, what does it say? MDY's got oh. socks. I'm just saying. We gotta get stay some. Stay happy, socks. stay healthy, <laughs> stay holy. The back of the hat. Unbelievable. So you know what happens? You you wear this hat to play golf and you you push one of the balls into the woods of the water, and then you just flip the hat around. You say, Stay happy, stay healthy, stay holy. It's just not worth it. It's not worth getting upset because behind the beamer.
It's great. We got more. We got our we got our caffeinate with Kavana from our Amuna Shear. Are we giving out hats tonight? You give, let's say, a thousand dollars. We give you a hat. Are we? Uh... You give a thousand dollars. Well, you give a thousand dollars right now. We'll send you a hat. Anyone who gives a thousand dollars to the global campaign? Autographed hat right now. How about this? You send a thousand dollars to the global campaign. We'll send you one of each of these things, and and that thousand dollars will be matched. Huh. So you're and, giving two thousand dollars and getting a lot of swag in return, and if, which is really unbelievable. Lori's doing and, great stuff. I know you've been always a fan. I'm just saying, if you send a thousand dollars and you send a ticket, I'll come and deliver the hat. <laughs> really. And the ticket, I love ticket that. to somewhere, you know. You gotta well, I'll tell you what we're giving away tonight. We're going to give away tonight. Next week's guest, we're having Ellie Beer back with Rabbi Nachman <sighs> Seltzer. Brand new art scroll book came out called 90 Seconds, the story of Hatzala and Ellie Beer. We'll give away a book. That's it. You know, you give you give $500 or more, where you'll be part of a raffle to get a book, and we'll send you one of the new books. I don't think you can even get it yet, but we'll get it to you. You know what? I just we noticed that Lori said that her book is now on Audible, and I'm wondering if Ellie can maybe put his book on Audible for those Basically of us that so are that you can here. hear it. I can hear it. <laughs> All right, listen, caffeinate with Kavana when you have a global marathon live. Baruch, hold on, make a bracha. I'll teach you a little halacha for one minute in our global live event. If you're listening to this not live, don't answer amen. It's an old hmm. bracha. But if you're watching right now live, you could be in Singapore or Kalamazoo. You could be in South America or South Africa or in, wherever you are in the world. But if you're listening live, you could answer amen to this bracha. You ready? Here we go. go. Amen. How's that coffee? I want you to know, people say that when they drink that coffee from that Amuna mug, it tastes better. Do they? Yeah. I've heard That's people great. say that. Yeah. That's great. Coffee we is are, good, uh, but coffee with Amuna is even better. Coffee with Amuna, there's nothing like it. The flavor of Amuna. It's flavor the of Amuna. Flavor there is. <laughs> we got special guests right now, our good friend, Dr. Larry and Deborah Halperin, who are also honorees at the BRS Journal Dinner this Sunday night. Hey, guys, thanks for joining our Marathon Live Look Global. At this. I want Made to continue it. to encourage, by the way, wherever you're watching, wherever you're listening, just dry it up a little bit. Write in the comments. We want to hear from you. Thank you, Lisa from Pomona. We're so happy, people from all over. Let us know where you're listening from. Pomona. As we bring in our guests... Whether you know them or you're just meeting them, you have any questions, post it in the comments. We'll read your question. You're donating. You're donating to our global campaign. We're, we're going to put it along the bottom, and it's all going to be matched. Larry and Deborah, you guys are amazing. Thank you for all that you do. We can't wait to honor you this Sunday night. Your Thank journey you. and story to our community is extraordinary. It's really, really special. So thank you for being with us. Talk to us about what motivates you to be the leaders that you are, to give up so much time. Jewish Federation, Boca Raton, there's not an organization that you guys are not involved in that you're not being leaders of. Where does that come from? What inspires you? So what inspires us is our parents. Our parents were involved. Our parents missed family dinners to go to Israel bonds, to go to Federation, to go to synagogue meetings. Our parents were involved. All four of them were presidents and chairs and they went to Israel and they cared and they raised us to be a part of this. And it was a part of our lives when we were kids. So it was, it was just natural. It really honestly wasn't even a decision. It was, uh, it was something that we did. I bought my first Israel bond with my bar mitzvah money. Wow. Deborah was making Federation gifts with her bar mitzvah money. I mean, it was, it's just, it, it's something that we've done always. And it was because of our parents. That's a and great lesson. Because, great model. because you're involved, you get to meet people like Josh Brody and Ephraim Goldberg, and you get to walk around Washington, D.C. with Ephraim Goldberg, and you get to walk around, uh, you know, Israel with uh, Phil Moskowitz and Rabbi Phil Moskowitz, and you go like, like, what could be better than this? And you get your best friends with the Greenspoons and the Hymans and the Deutsches and, we, you know, with all the best people that, that you could ever meet in your entire life and the Steinbergs and the Pratts and like right. all of our best friends are involved. And, and that was it. It was, it was, it was, it was the best choice. It was the way to get, have the best life is to be involved. It's unbelievable. And you guys are powerhouses and Deborah, anything you touch turns to gold. It's unbelievable what you do for the community. It's really, really special. I want to know how do you have an incredibly successful retina practice you're in the leadership of everything that's going on, and you're a single-digit handicap. How, how do you manage that? <laughs> and what are you most proud of? I don't know about three. the single-digit handicap, but I had time this morning before surgery to go and do some power washing of my daughter's um, patio in time for the our grandson's up sharing on Sunday. So the single that's handicap right. is, I don't know, I'm a, kind of a single handicap, but I, you know, we have time, you have time for what's important, right? 
So let me ask you, Deborah, let me ask you a question because, and I hope I, I didn't clear this with you, so I hope I won't be in trouble for it, but you know, you're dear, dear friends of ours and you're an inspiration to us and your story is amazing that you weren't always part of the Orthodox community and then your children, you know, first Douglas and then Katie and your children started getting involved and inspired and, and transforming their lives to be more observant. And there are parents whose children become observant and they would have preferred their children to intermarry than to become observant. If their children intermarried, it would interfere with their lifestyle less than if they become observant. You went the opposite direction. And you said, oh, our kids became observant. I guess we're moving. We're building a house time, near the Orthodox synagogue because <laughs> we want them to be there. Our grandchildren we want them to feel comfortable. Talk to other parents out there and talk to other young people out there who are becoming observant, learning and growing. And they're worried about alienating their parents, disappointing their parents. Did, did Was that a hard decision for you? Did you have to pause? Did you struggle with it? Or it just came naturally that you were so proud of your kids, you jumped along with them. And now look, you're getting honored by Boca Raton Synagogue for being outstanding leaders of our shul. You guys are just amazing. Where, where did that come from, that reaction? I have nothing to say. <laughs> I plead the fifth. Um, no, I mean, it was for us, it was all along the same lines as the way that we raised our kids, giving them opportunities, encouraging them, whether it was, you know, at the time it started out, we thought it was football, tennis, soccer, you know, summer camps up in Maine and all the, you know, amazing experiences that we gave our kids, Pinecrest School in Fort Lauderdale that we thought certainly had nothing to do with the path to a yeshiva in Harnof. It's not a typical path that, that kids would take. There's not many. It's probably a one-off as far as I'm concerned. But right. the way that we raised our kids, giving them opportunities to grow and to become sort of the best version of themselves, I'm sure that it's a no-brainer that when they start, when Douglas, for example, you know, started to become observant, you know, we you know, stuck our first toe in, you know, little bit by bit and found ourselves in your office, Rabbi Goldberg. I don't think I shed a tear, but I know there were some tears that were shed and we were learning and we were asking for questions and figuring things out and trying to put, you know, sort of two and two together. And now, of course, that's, you know, 12. It's already hard to believe that that's 12, 13, 14 years ago. And so we've had just as much of a lifetime on, right. on this side of the equation as we did on the other side. Um, was it, you, know, you, said, you said something that really, that really struck home, Rabbi Goldberg. I can when, picture when we, it right now. When we came, like it was yesterday. When we came to you like and we said ago. our son is becoming observant and we're a little bit freaking out and we can only go with him to kosher restaurants and, you know, whatever, whatever the changes were. And you said, you know, here's, here's the thing. At eight o'clock this morning, a meeting with the Halperins who are freaking out because their kids are becoming more observant. At 8.30, a meeting with another family whose kids are doing whatever and they're having, you know, concerns. And so this is my question. This was what you said. And again, I remember like it was 10 minutes ago. You said, you raise your kids to think and to be certain kinds of people. And the question is, can you now give them some breathing room to make some decisions for themselves? They're not going off and doing some horrible thing. They're not, you know, living in the woods, uh, you know, uh, and backpacking and, you know, not being responsible adults. They're making a decision. Can you give them some breathing room to see where it takes them? And honestly, that, that's what it was about. I'll and, tell you the truth. You, more, you didn't give them breathing room. You didn't give them breathing room. You gave them wings and you gave them support and you transformed your lives. And, and you're, you're an amazing inspiration to us and you're great leaders in our community. And we're so grateful for all that you do. And we can't wait to honor you. This Sunday night, big mazel tov on the enormously well-deserved honor. We're really, really excited to be able to honor you. This. When we, 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 lived, we lived in a community for 27 years where when a hurricane would occur, you'd walk outside after the hurricane and you'd look at your neighbors, you go like, I didn't know you lived on my street. And we moved into, we moved into Thornhill Estates and in three months, I knew every single person in our neighborhood. I knew who they were, I knew what they did, I knew their kids, I had been over to their house. 
it's a it's a completely different lifestyle. It's amazing. We love it. Wow. That's amazing. What a great endorsement. We love you guys. Big, big Mazel Tov. We can't wait to celebrate with you on Sunday morning at the Upshare and Sunday night. Amen. All right, guys. Have a great night. Thank you. Amazing. Rabbi Barodi, we're about to bring on our next guest. Super excited. I just I just say something very special. I don't know if you, I don't want to say which child of theirs, but I remember when you were you were finishing a meal with them on Shabbos. It's a classic story. And you said, Okay, guys, let's bench. <laughs> this is a great story. No, it's not mine. It's his story. He was outside. I know, I know. Oh, okay. And 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 a parent or one of the kids said, You want to go inside and bench? Oh, and yeah, his yeah. son said, How much do you lift? <laughs> Let's just say he, what he, a cool he, rabbi. He, he played college he's football. He's a big football player, yeah. and he didn't know anything. So when he heard, you want to go bench, he's like, how many pounds? What do you bench? Let's do it. What do you bench? <laughs> so how much do you bench, Rabbi Brody? Not as much as I used to. You're lifting Jewish souls. I don't know how much weight you can exactly. lift, but you lift a lot of Jewish souls, and yeah. it's a really beautiful thing. So a reminder to our global community. Thank you. Hold on. With just uh, before we bring on another amazing guest, I'm so excited. But Deborah from Cleveland Heights, Ohio. Shari's from New Jersey. Rivka from NMB waiting for the Haliga by Kalish. Rabbi Kalish is Haliga, and we can't wait for that conversation. We have other conversations tonight as well, and we are super, super excited for them. Help us close out this campaign. Help us finish to be able to promote and share our Torah. BeerUsOnline.org slash global. Go. Every dollar you give is being matched tonight. Dollar for dollar. Give $1,000 or more and get all of our swag. And we're so excited for that. And we're super excited to be able to welcome Alexandra. Alex Flexure behind the Bima. Long time coming. So excited to have you behind the Bima. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Rabbi Goldberg and Rabbi Boyd, for having me. This is very exciting. We are excited. Alex, I know wow. you're doing a million things from your own podcasts and your own campaigns and your writing and tackling difficult subjects. And really, you know, we had Lori Polanik before and we were talking about powerful Jewish women leaders. She was talking about Rebbe Santino Weinberg, her inspiration who passed away and, and striking that balance between being a, a woman leader and a female role model and maintaining some of the traditional sneas and modesty. And I, I guess men also are bound by modesty and we too are not meant to be uh, arrogant or in the spotlight. We're all supposed to imitate God, who's Kel Mistat there, who's, who's a hidden, private, modest God. But maybe there's more pressure on women not to be um, confused or caught up or people be suspicious of their motive, fair or unfair. How do you navigate that? All that you're doing and all the great things you're accomplishing and, and you're speaking to people, your words and your articles are resonating across a broad spe spectrum. Does that You have to think about that a lot? You're navigating that a lot? Yeah, it's a fabulous question. I think when I started writing, I grappled with it more. And, you know, there's definitely this notion of the, you know, the the from woman not drawing attention to herself, right? Now, is that more of like, you know, I don't know, a visual thing? Or what about drawing attention to yourself due to the ideas that you're sharing with the world? And that's something that I thought a lot about. And, you know, essentially, in terms of my writing, we readers want authenticity, you know, they want real and they and, and, and that that's what resonates. But when you're working and when you're writing in like the from world, there needs to be boundaries for yourself that I'm not just writing clickbait, you know, like there's boundaries that I set aside in terms of how revealing of my personal life I'm going to be or even revealing about um I don't know, even I, I don't need to tell the world everything about me. I do need to strike that balance of being authentic, but also following my own personal modesty guidelines. And I, it is something I, I think about a lot. And I really appreciate that question. You've tackled a bunch of uncomfortable topics, right? You write mm -hmm. from a Shpaka magazine, Faces of Orthodoxy, we'll get to DMC, we're going to get to. But you've tackled a lot of uncomfortable subjects from the, the shortage of teachers today to fuzzy math and the complicated accounting of being a observant Jew. So do you hesitate? You know, I, I know when I write, so mm -hmm. one of the great blessings I have in my life is, is Yocheved and, and, and you and Yocheved know each other. And Yocheved will sometimes say, do you need to be the one who writes about that? Do you have to draw the attention to that? Are you going to need to get all the pushback? Or, so do you worry about that? Here's a complicated, uncomfortable topic. It's going to get a lot of letters, a lot of pushback. This is worth saying anyway, or I don't need to be the face of this. This one's not worth it. Okay, that's that's great. So I think you use the word complicated, and I'd like to distinguish between complicated and controversial. Yes, I'll tend toward complicated, but I am not... I personally don't think I'm a controversial writer. You know, there are plenty of things that I could talk about that I choose not to, going back to the modesty issue, for whatever reasons that I'm not going to go push push the envelope about. But my feeling and my goal is these are just things that are on our minds. 
like, you know, the, the upper middle class financial struggles with Orthodox community. I know it sounds absolutely crazy, but this is a real thing. And it's not, and by the way, this is a conversation that is happening much more now. But when mm -hmm. I wrote about that over two years ago, it was, you know, it, it wasn't discussed as much. And it's not that like, uh, you know, am I going to be the one to say it? I feel like I'm just saying what everyone's thinking. So yeah, I'm put, putting myself out there. You know, that's true. But I really like to try to just be a mouth piece of those Shabbos conversations of the things that are just on all of our minds and I'll communicate it. And I love communication and I love writing. So I'll just put it to put it to paper. And if that resonates, that's great. But it's because we're all thinking about it. That really speaks to me also because a lot of times my writing is that and, and I'm and the, the satisfaction I'm sure that you get too is you know sometimes you're writing because you're trying to challenge someone to think differently and sometimes you're writing because you're trying to give a voice to people That's who right. are reading and listening and there's so much noise around them they're like hi I'm here this is what I think this mm -hmm. is what many of us think and no one's saying it and that's right. sometimes the most gratifying is that you're just giving them a voice and a seat at the table and you're giving that opinion uh space right. in that in that conversation Rabbi Brody you were jumping in yeah I'm just wondering do you do you read all the the pushback or are you the kind of person that says you know what i'm not even listening to the other side yeah. I, I, it, to, and does it does, does it affect you do you feel like yeah uh, that's a that's a good question so you know the pages of mishpacha magazine aren't twitter you know so in terms of pushback in the magazine um i feel like generally the response has been positive the best is when there's this conversation continues for all the mishpacha readers out there where if they get sustained amount of letters they'll actually have this column and then you'll see You'll just see like the diversity of responses to a conversation that you started. And again, it's it's lighting a match, you know, it's it's putting light on an issue and then letting that conversation continue literally. And it's just the most gratifying thing seeing the community discuss something that you are passionate about. So to answer your question, I know it sounds crazy. I, I haven't seen a lot of pushback in the pages of Mishabak magazine for the topics that I'm writing about. As I said, they're not controversial. It's more about voicing, you know, issues and and sort of, you know, spelling them out and laying it out and laying out the case. And I think that resonates. So, you know, the, the agenda of the Jewish people, what we should be talking about next, I, I've argued for a while now. It's not the rabbis from the bima because, you know, we're giving drushes, we're giving sermons, we're stimulating people to think, hopefully, at the Shabbos table. But there's a much bigger audience of people who don't come to shul, many women and others. But it's Mishpacha and Ami and Five Towns Jewish Times and Jewish Link. And I hope I'm not leaving anybody out. But it's the authors there who choose a topic and write and challenge. And you, like you just said, by the intensity of the letters to the editor and the response and the ongoing conversation, you see it's it's setting the agenda. And that's where we can move the needle on whatever issue, whether it's teacher shortage or the economics of being an observant Jew or Shaduchim or women or whatever the topic is, there's a lot of power in that. Talk to us about Faces of Orthodoxy. That was personal sure. for you. Tell us how it started, what you're doing, where it's going, and why it was personal for you. Ah, uh, why it was personal. Okay, so Faces of Orthodoxy is a social media Jewish pride campaign that really puts a human face to Orthodox Jews and shows the world at large and reminds ourselves of the diversity within our communities. So how it started was interesting. Um, during the... I guess when the show on Netflix, My Unorthodox Life, launched a couple of summers ago, um, I, well, actually, Julia Hart was my, my teacher in high school, uh, way back when in Atlanta, Georgia. And I felt that as a community of Orthodox women, we needed to respond, not so much on an outreach level, like I'm thinking that Netflix is going to hear us, but I'm very much into chizuk. Like that's, you know, I have a, you know, I have a master's in Jewish education. I taught for, you know, 15, 20 years in a classroom. And now I've just sort of moved into really strengthening our community um, through various initiatives and through my writing. So I was like, you know, from women, the from community is going to be watching the show. And this can be, um, this can be difficult for us to watch. And this actually may erode some of our belief and strength as, as Orthodox women. And we may question that. So how can we respond? So there was this really amazing viral moment, which is hashtag my Orthodox life. Um, which we're not going to get into in too much depth, but it was pretty cool. It was a moment of Orthodox women standing up for themselves, really in the face of media misrepresentation, where on Netflix, this megaphone, you know, of Netflix was telling the world what we as Orthodox women could and couldn't do. And Orthodox women said, sorry, you can't speak for me. And they spoke for themselves on social media. And there are thousands and thousands of posts for this. But um, if you check it out on Instagram, all social media platforms, but at the time, the OU actually, the Orthodox Union, reached out to me wanting to support 
um, the project, this project, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever we were able to accomplish. And I worked with them on a few articles and things like that. And then after that, the conversation became, how can we tell our stories as Orthodox Jews? So Faces mm -hmm. of Orthodoxy really was this brainchild that we worked on together and created. Um, it's been live for now almost a year. It's powered by the OU. And um, it's just been really an exciting space where we feature all different types of Orthodox Jews, depending on where our photographer is located, but in, in, in America, in the United States, um, ranging all various ages, various hashkafas, various professions, people who have overcome challenges, people in the arts, people in education, just all different types every single week. And it's become such a community of positivity. I have to tell you, my Orthodox life, hashtag more Orthodox life, we got pushback. There was a lot of pushback, and I was really scared coming into Faces of Orthodoxy. How what, what kind of what kind of pushback? This? What kind of pushback did someone so have for the, you taking pride in who was, you are? Correct. So the pushback was, oh, you know, we're sort of showing these poster girls of Orthodox Judaism, like, oh, we're all Orthodox women, and we have no problems, and we love everything, you know, and like we're perfect. And if you you read the posts and you see the nuance here, it wasn't that at all. Many women shared what their struggles were with Orthodox Judaism. Um, as well as what they were proud of, but they were still showing up and they still identified. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was, a, it was a very interesting time, but Faces of Orthodoxy has literally become almost like a from pride type of initiative, but also with the second, it's very important, the, the, sec the, the secondary target audience is absolutely the public because as I said, we're not making Netflix shows, <laughs> we're just not, but people are on their phones and people are on Instagram and people are on Facebook and people are on LinkedIn. And if we can somehow reach the you know the secular and the non-jewish community and they can just read human stories of orthodox jews who share their struggles who share their vulnerabilities um who share their life stories we, it, it's really it's been really inspiring for for religious jews and the secular community alike and that's really our goal what's next for it? what's next yeah what's next what's the next project uh, for faces of orthodoxy or for you oh for me or for me. well phase of orthodoxy we've got big plans i want a coffee table book <laughs> we have gorgeous photography we really hire the best photographers so it's just it's photography it's journal style posts this would make a gorgeous book we want a website we want to expand to in-person panels addressing issues in orthodoxy for me i want to i want to write more also i you know i balance my podcast cmc maybe we'll talk about i i'm so grateful for my audience at mishpacha um, you know, there are 250,000 readers, they, you know, worldwide. And I so value the platform that I have there, but I write irregularly and I'm just really busy. So right. as you know, Rabbi Goldberg, I'm sure I, oh, maybe I, I shouldn't assume I find as a writer, I have to have something that's like burning underneath me for me to write. And that's maybe why my pieces like, you know, at times can make a difference and make an impact because it's something I'm very passionate about. But on an every given day, I have five kids, I have a family, I'm juggling all these other things. Um, that That's my biggest struggle is really just sitting down and blocking everything aside and just focus on my writing. So, so have you incorporated in Faces of Orthodoxy that struggle, not yours personally, but meaning that we're not presenting some carefully curated, perfect life. If you're Orthodox, then you're healthy, your marriage is Correct. great, your parenting is great, life is great. And you're also not going to promote or share, right? Face of Orthodox is not going to be like, here's a picture of a get ceremony. Like here's right. where, but so how do you, how do you strike that balance between celebrating with pride who we are and how we live, but also not pretending or being disingenuous and authentic with, with what we do? Correct. So I really try, I do the interviews. I find the subjects um, and I get to meet the most amazing Jews around the country. But I really, I really tried to ask them, is there a struggle that you feel comfortable sharing? And I would just like to give an example. I don't know if you follow Humans of New York on My social cousin. media. I find really? Humans of Judaism. Humans of Judaism. Oh, the Humans of New York. So this, York, is, I don't know. so this is a sort of similar type of concept. You, you, know, you, prof, you, you profile someone and they tell you your story. So back to our first question about modesty. So we have this value of sinus of modesty that we are not going to spill the beans about everything. Now, yes, if you're going to share that you're having this major shawl and bias issue, yeah, that's going to be clickbait. But like, as this is the difference between these projects, we're working with from Jews have certain guidelines in terms of what they want to expose to the world about their personal lives. So yes, I always ask if you're comfortable, is there any, you know, any struggle that you like to share? Um, we really like to show a little bit of vulnerability. And mm -hmm. that might come out with people just, you know, 
dealing with medical issues or dealing with you know universal challenges we need to show the world we're human too that we have the same challenges as human beings we have universal values as well and that's the, you know that's sort of the goal i don't push it it's some some people that's not their type to to be vulnerable but whenever possible i really i really try to encourage that amazing are there, are, are there things are there topics that you feel are not getting enough attention you've tried to push them and you're just yeah. so frustrated like wh why are people not listening yeah is, is there something so i will say that my podcast i think has been just such a great opportunity to discuss the things that oh, i may not be able to sit down and write a full-blown article about but i could schmooze about it with my co-host or fee silver and i can get a guest as expert and we can talk about it so um but things in the orthodox community that i feel like are not being addressed wow um i yes i think okay maybe you both i'm sure you'll have insights to this i i'm concerned about two things and they're related one is the stabilization of america we like to talk about this i wrote about it in mishpacha where in so many of our communities for you know good reasons and i'm not one to judge a person you know person's personal reason why they want to be davening in a basement minion or a minion in someone's living room not covid just like a break off minion um, I, I am concerned about this where people do not have a rub. These, these minyanim are, you know, are, are they, they don't have someone at the house. Uh, can you just, can you just tell guidance. the audience, can you just do me a favor? Can you just tell the audience we did not set you up for this? We didn't <laughs> ask you to do this. We didn't bring this up. We didn't pay you for this. We didn't prep you for this. Okay. We have, we have no yeah, it just happened to be the question I asked. Yeah. <laughs> so it wouldn't be right, you. Keep going. You're right. Keep going. Keep going. Let's paint this picture. So what happens is you're faced with, I'm not talking about a halakha shayla, you're faced with a major crisis in your family, okay? What do you do? I spoke to a local rub here who says all those families are calling him, okay? He's the rub of a big shul, he's the big tent shul, and everyone knows how wonderful he is, and they have nowhere to turn. So that concerns mm. me on one level. On a second level, this, you know, iPhone generation where everything is customized exactly what we want, Okay, so you go to the shul with all the people that are your type, and everyone's happy because everyone's their type. What is that doing to our sense of community? Mm. I mean, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Rabbi Alan Feldman was my rub. I mean, yeah, I'm not expecting Atlanta, huge big tent, everyone's off dive into the community shul. But there's some sense of a chariot to the community and something very healthy about being in a little bit more diverse community, not just your clever, you know, your clever man. It, it becomes the third point is it becomes a men's club and it becomes a boys club. And I'm concerned about the community for women when they don't have a show, but it's more a place for the guys to go for their kiddish club. Hmm. So that's a big concern of, of mine. Interesting. I have no thoughts on that at all. I have no <laughs> I'm opinion sure you have no thoughts. On that. Talk to us about DMC. Okay, sure. I'm behaving right. I want so, I'd like an award. I would like someone to send me an award for how much I'm behaving right now. Uh, Alex, talk to us about DMC. <laughs> Okay, so DMC is a podcast. Again, these are like the various areas of my life that I am juggling. Can I be vulnerable? It's not easy. Yeah. It's not easy. There's no one here. It's just the three of us. Yeah, yeah, no one's here. My oldest son is is turning 20, and my youngest is three. So it's a party and uh, lots of balance. But, you know, this is, I, I'm so grateful and it's really privileged to be doing this work. And it's, I love it all. So, this was a bucket list project to start a podcast. My friend Rifki Silver, who lives here in Cleveland, literally in the middle of like lockdown, reached out to me and said, I want to start a podcast and I want to do it with you. And I'm like, wow, I would love to do that. It was great because we sort of got on the bandwagon like right in the beginning of COVID when people were getting more into podcasts. So um, it was wonderful. And essentially, DMC is Deep Meaningful Conversations. It's me and my co host. Like, our vibe is sitting down for coffee with friends. Very much similar to my mission with my writing is we're talking about the things that from women are thinking about and we're giving voice to it. So we come up with a new episode every other week. I Kudos to the podcasters who do this weekly. It is not easy. Um, but essentially we, you know, we, we, this, this past episode, we featured Alana Cowens, um, of Asia Torah talking about her new book, The Moderately Anxious Everybody. We will do, you know, sort of like social science types of topics and find the perfect guest expert, resilience, burnout, vulnerability versus oversharing. Again, grit. There are a lot of these pieces that overlapped, as I said, with my writing. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Get to meet great people talking about these things. 
And, you know, our parenting and marriage episodes, there's a huge thirst in terms of, you know, for women. And that, that's what I wanted to say also when we're talking about the, you know, one of the issues in our communities. I think Chizuk, seriously, well, forget, I love Lori Palatnik, Jade Zilby RP. We also have a great need to strengthen the from women in our communities because sometimes we're not feeding our spiritual tanks and oftentimes we're not because of all of our responsibilities and we cannot just assume that everyone's fine because everyone is not fine. So for me, as you know, the more content I can create to give to strengthen from women, that is like my, my main my main mission. So we have a lot, you know, we talked we've talked about Kala classes, ref, Kala class reformation, the legacy of Sarah Schneer, you know, as I said, parenting and marriage, right? Hot topics and a lot of various like self-development topics as well life work balance from finances just where, stuff where can that, people again, find me all and my friends like to schmooze about someone who wants to listen learn from you your writings the podcast is there an easy way to find it all no <laughs> there ah. is not that's your next project you got to make a website to consolidate it all exactly well, i had a website and i i shut it down i don't know are people really going on websites anymore social media you can find me on facebook on instagram alex lecture the podcast you can find on any streaming channel um, deep meaningful conversations and then faces of orthodoxy we're on instagram we're on facebook and then on linkedin it's actually doing quite well under my personal account alexandra fletcher so close us out first of all there's so much more to talk about we're gonna have to continue the conversation another time but close us out with a message to young women who are watching who are want to be torah true and want to stay benos torah yuri shamayim but also want to express individuality creativity leadership vision Give them a message about what the world has to offer them, how they can, what trajectory they can go on, what's a path they can pursue to find their voice in the community while, while also not sort of deviating or abandoning what they want to stay true to about where they come from. Sure. So my message really is that you have a voice and mm -hmm. don't underestimate that and don't let anyone tell you that what you have to say is not valuable and not important. I think for me, where I started was within my own community. And that is really my advice for you is to find a need in your own community, find something where that you're passionate about that lights your fire and that you can fill that need that you feel not, oh, I have so many talents and I can fill this need, but I have something that I can give because the most important thing is your enthusiasm and your passion that you bring to that. Once you can do something small in your community, that's where you have to start. Let's back up and don't forget about your family, of course. But stop, small steps. Be, be the one that fills the need by bringing your unique voice to the table. Amazing. Thank you for joining us. Thank you wow. for all that you're doing for the faces of Orthodoxy and for the Orthodox and for the Jewish world at large. Keep doing it. Have a lot of strength. Keep stimulating these great, great conversations. Some that make us uncomfortable, but that's good. That's how we all grow. And we'll look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It was an honor. Rabbi Broday. Wow. I'm just looking at the clock. We still <laughs> we got two and a half hours to go. What do you mean? We're just getting started. We're I know. I'm just getting warmed up. Hang on. I need to take a. Uh, it's take unbelievable. A yeah. Right. First of all, I want to acknowledge. First of all, we got we got Alex's brother-in-law who's watching. Proud brother-in-law. Then we'll show her for that. Proud brother-in-law. Proud. We got Debbie Rosalimsky from Teaneck. We got Shy from Muncie. I'm not going to say who. It's possible you and I danced in his basement a little while ago. Ah. Shy from Muncie. She's Shai a real role model, Muncie. incredible role model for me. I love Shai. Thank you for all you do, Shai. We got Shadows 9449, Lisa Weber, Chizik Mission. Thanks to Barry Feldman and the Chizik Mission. We love the Chizik Mission. I haven't had the chance to meet them and speak to them when they were down here in Florida. So keep questions. We have, it's unbelievable who we've had already. And we still have Rabbi Beshevkin. We still have Rabbi Kalish. We still have Rabbi Leibowitz. We got other surprise guests maybe who are joining. So write your questions. What do you want to hear from them? What do you want to hear us talk to them about? What do you want to know about us? And how can you help us continue to get word out there? Um, what can we do? So contribute, brsonline.org slash global. Every penny you give is going to be matched. Rabbi Brody, thoughts so far this where we're incredible. at? Incredible. I'm just telling you, each one of these interviews could have been an hour. There is so at much to, to unpack. And just shows you, where else do you get this kind of, uh, these kind of uh, caliber guests and, and, and all in one show tonight? Amazing. Sure. Really, really special. And that is a challenging show for us because... We normally, you know, again, they're carefully curated podcast. We're not podcasters. 
we have other full-time jobs and we do this and we enjoy it and we're proud of it and we're hopefully contributing with it, but there's no team who's lining up the gas and te- checking out the technology and watching the clock and editing the whatever. <laughs> if you saw what's going on right now, it's me, it's me and my mouse try to like put someone on, take them off, get overlay. I just <laughs> forgot I did download a video, whatever. That's how we're doing it. So normally when we do an interview, there's no clock. We just, right. I get some feedback. One of our greatest inspirations slash critics might be my father and he'll say don't go over an hour it's too long right Right. but we we go on as long as we think there's what to talk about but tonight's a challenging night because we have incredible guests and alex for example could have spoken to for hours and hours hours on this so many things to talk about we'll have to continue those conversations but we're trying to be disciplined tonight right we're trying to keep our audience wanting more and And this is actually if you know anything about rabbi goldberg i mean he goes all in and he wants it to be big and it's going to be great this four-hour marathon is actually a shortened version of what it could. Or how do you get up to four? Yeah, no, it started as an eight-hour marathon. We were going to go. <laughs> it started actually. The, it's it's going to be a full remember, day. Twelve. Remember hours? the staff meeting when I said we're going from twelve to twelve? Yeah, 12 we're going to 12. noon to midnight straight. Man. Yeah, marathon behind the bima, and then people were like, Next "How you going to have marathon? How you going to eat? How you going to eat? How you going to drink?" We were going to take turns, but we're, we're just and whatever you do, eat, and you do drink. So <laughs> those challenges that uh, that do come, but it is it is always exciting. Any impressions, any thoughts so far, Rabbi Brody, before That's we welcome our great. next incredible guest? I, first of all, I, see, I don't know even know who the next guest is, and some of the guests so far have been a real surprise to me, so I'm so excited to see who's next. That shows you Rabbi Brody's involvement in this, by the way, because we do have a WhatsApp group. <laughs> we've been playing this. We've been lining up the, what do they call it? What was the name? The, not the playlist. The the schedule? What's the fancy term for it? Yeah, the, 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 the list of guests. I don't guests. remember, but you're so checked out that you right. just showed up. I'm not checked out. Can I just say I'm watching from a, from, from a distance? I love oh, it. And first of all, I can't even get over it. You have a guy like Benyamin, you're just talking the about run. We're What's honoring. the run? The no, run of play? Play no, run? Be, be, oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> What's it called? No, but Benyamin, like Benyamin's, he's got another job. And this guy, every, every moment, he's on he's on top of this. and he's The run of show. That's working. it. Run of show. You should oh, know yeah. that. You're in the Federation. Run of show? The run of show. Okay, I've never like, heard that's of That's a loose with the plastic pages where you ran oh, yeah? through the that's program with the staff of 25 people. That's the way they really do it, not just me and you and my mouth <laughs> and my keyboard and my prayers that the internet doesn't go down. That's basically yeah. how we do it over here. But anyway, to continue our incredible conversation. I wonder who's next. Who yeah, he's going to unmute himself. Right oh. now. You're welcome. You got to unmute go. yourself, cousin. There you, Israel. He's back in the house. He's unmuted. <laughs> unmuted. He is back. Rabbi Dr. David David Beshevkin. Welcome back in. behind the beam. It's so good to have you back again, cousin. It's good to be together. I don't see any books positioned in the background this time. A little disappointing. <laughs> there, there, I assure you, there are some books in the background. Can but we I pick up where that. we left off last time? That's what I want to know. <laughs> so let me just say about this. First of all, Rabbi Bashev, can I take my jacket off? Is that okay? Yeah. We're, we're an hour. You're, we're an you're, hour you're, you're in it. Like. How, how many here? wardrobe changes are we going to do tonight? We're an hour forty-one. Try just for your covered of covered of cousin Rib Ephraim, cousin Rib Josh. No, not cousin, but Rib Josh. I put on a tie. I was not wearing a tie until nine forty at night tonight. We're, we're an you? hour. We're an hour forty-one in, and we welcome back uh, the king of Twitter, my dear cousin. Now, cousin, I want to tell you that when we had you behind the bima, the most grief I took, the most grief I took from anyone on any episode about anything was my family that I wasn't respectful to you. I was too strong. I pushed back. I tried to explain to them that because everyone else is not a stranger, but they're not family. But the people you feel family. closest I to and you're most comfortable you with. I, I felt it was a compliment that we were able to go so hard with one another because it showed this. It was real mishpachti. It was mishpacha talking to mishpacha. And I, I told you many times that original conversation we had, and for those listening, you can go back and listen to that episode. <laughs> it's something I think about to this day. It was so profound and so real, uh, and I enjoyed it so much. And I'm so makes me think too. One. one of my yeah. daughters just texted even before I said it. No fighting. Two exclamation points. <laughs> that was that was. That's so we never fight. Know. Jews, we don't fight. We love and we push and we grow. It is yes. great to have you back. And I want to thank you because our Mavakshim trip, our fly into New York. At our Yeshiva University stop, we met with the great Rabbi Dr. David Beshevkin, and you right. spoke to us for an hour. Um, you spoke, and there was interaction, questions, and answers. And I don't know that I ever heard such an impassioned argument for Avas Yisrael, for loving a fellow Jew. And you right. challenged all of us to take the same attitude of lumdus and to take the same creativity and the same will, the same effort to be 
non uncompromising in our love of another Jew as we do in other areas of of halacha and the feedback. You know, our group got together. We had a little reunion. We came back to Boca, of course, with a barbecue, maybe a cigar or two, and some some wine. And we were processing the trip. We went around. Everyone shared. Everyone talked. And a lot of people referenced your talk to us. Not only the words you said, but the passion with which you said it. So, where does that come from? Is it part of your upbringing? Is it a result of relationships that you've had? Is it rooting for an underdog in the Jewish life? Where did that come from? This passion for we've got to do better and work harder for Avas Israel. For one thing, it means a great deal that it resonated. There is no audience that I feel more of my inadequacies surface to the fore than speaking on the Mavakshim trip. You know, you're speaking to Rosh Yeshiva in prestigious places, and then you come to speak to a, a guy from Twitter. Um, all of my inadequacies, the way I view myself, like came to the fore. Uh, and I wanted to share something that was real and heartfelt. Um, and, and it was real and heartfelt of, of what I shared. I, I, I wasn't sure that it landed. I, I felt like you were you were almost doing me a favor of giving me the opportunity to speak to people in your shul and the people who you run this amazing trip with. Um, it comes from my family. I, I say this over and over again. I was raised in a home, and you know the home I was raised in, where um, number one, the my identity as being Jewish and my identity as being Orthodox was not taken for granted. Most Bishefkins in the world, and you know this probably from your extended family as well, because there's so much overlap, are not a part of observant, engaged Yiddishkeit. They're, they're not. There are more probably engaged Jews with the last name Bishefkin who are buried in North Adams, Massachusetts, than there are alive in the world right now outside of my immediate family. It is something that can be gained and cultivated, but I knew growing up it's something that it can be lost. And growing up, I always felt a sense of responsibility from the youngest age of having relatives and having a very religiously diverse family. And I think that's where it began. And I think what added some of the urgency and maybe the emotional um, intensity to what I shared um, was was the fact that I feel like I am sometimes subject to people's uh, gripes, to people's frustrations, and my own, what I try to share, which is not always right. What I do is not always correct. I, I make mistakes like everybody else, but I'm on the, the high wire of, of public content. I'm not sharing in a classroom. I'm not sharing in a synagogue. I'm sharing on podcasts. I'm sharing on Twitter. And when I see people interpret my words so ungraciously mm. and react to what I say so ungraciously, it has an effect on me. And my only commitment I've made to myself is the same thing that Conan O'Brien said in his last episode of The Tonight Show before he handed it back to Jay Leno, who basically stole his job. He looked at the audience and he said, I'm asking you for one thing and one thing only. Don't become cynical. Don't become negative and a bastion of negativity. And the only response that I know of that makes sense to be able to respond to so much criticism and tugging on either side, sometimes small and sometimes existential and big. There are people who think, I, I, I don't deserve the platform that I am so gratefully have. There are people who think that I am being Macalkel things, and I, and I probably am at times. I don't always say the right thing. But my only tefillah that I have for myself is don't become cynical. Mm. Don't, don't become cynical to feedback. Don't become cynical to criticism. Don't become cynical to pushback. And the only way to do that is to grab hold with all of your sense of self to Avas Yisroel and finding love in words that sometimes aren't always said with love or intentional love or explicit love. You shared with us an insight. I, I don't know if you're comfortable repeating it here, but I guess we're about to find out evidence of our live episode right now. But you shared with us, and, and you should know that not cynically, it's been repeated many times since, even when I was talking to someone on the trip, talking about a particular situation, they said, why don't you say to that person, you hurt my feelings? Right. Talk to us about adults turning to one another and saying, you hurt my feelings. I, I It is a phrase that I, that I have become more uh, accustomed to saying, because I think there is something about adulthood and maturity and development that we associate with ideological conviction. So when people wrong us or criticize us or say something negative, 
what we think, what we're conditioned to react as adults is to react ideologically. I'm right, you're wrong, you're wrong, I'm right. And very often what goes unaddressed is the interiority, that inner space of our lives um, where our emotions are hurt. And the visceral reaction of using the term, you hurt my feelings, uh, to most adults, for a reasons that I understand, feels very childish. It feels very shallow and just not sophisticated. You hurt my feelings, like what are you? You're in first grade? We're so big, we don't have to pay attention to our feelings. And I feel like that if we were more accustomed to saying you hurt my feelings, we would be able to engage in difference and in conversation and process hurt in a more honest and authentic way. We spend so much time defending our respective ideologies. If we paid more attention to our visceral hurt, I think it would be able to be able to move conversations forward. The, 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 the text that I brought to marshal this is something that I once heard from Rev Zweig secondhand. I heard it from Rabbi Goldberg from Minneapolis when I was learning there on the seed program in Nary Yisroel. Uh, is the Gemara in, in, in Gittin, which talks about the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, where when, when this person goes to this party and he's uninvited, and, and this is the seminal story that describes the destruction of the base Hamigdash, his reaction is, Mechdi, let's see, Bar Gavra, Bar Devava Dahahu Gavra. This person is the enemy of this person. Like he talks about the whole thing in third person. It's ideological. Like, look, my feelings aren't hurt. I'm not invested in this. I'm I'm a stone. I'm a lave even. I'm a heart of stone. But like ideologically, this doesn't make sense. It's the principle of the matter. It's the ideo it's the ideology that's at stake. And I think as human beings, if we became more accustomed to leaning into the honesty of our vulnerabilities, our conversations would be much more productive and effective. You hurt my feelings, and, and I, I've become more accustomed to sharing and telling people uh, that, that that hurt my feelings. It, it's not a point of weakness. I think it's the strongest thing you can say to another adult. What's the reaction been like? Does someone say, well, I don't really care about your feelings. You're wrong, or <laughs> I think you made a mistake, and your feelings aren't part of this. Or in every time have they – it probably startles people because adults are not used to hearing that. It, 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 it does startle people sometimes. I think there are two reactions. Um Number one, again, yeah, of course, some people dismiss it, like grow up. I'm, I'm not here to service your feelings. I'm not here to pay attention to your feelings. And, and that's okay. I think sometimes it resonates with people. They, they're reminded of the humanity of what you go through. You know, what David Foster Wallace spoke about in his uh, commencement address at Kenyon State College, when, when you're online at the grocery store and you're so focused on getting out and you become so impatient with the person in front of you that you dehumanize them. You're like, new, no, like you, you, you have 11 items and you're in the 10 items or less column. And, and you don't realize what else is going on in a person's life that you diminish the totality of that other person. It doesn't mean that you have to let go of your ideology. It doesn't mean that you need to agree with that person, but you're not arguing with honesty of what's really animating your frustration. And the second thing is it's a reminder for me. Um, when somebody criticizes you, your visceral reaction as an adult is to seize hold of your sophisticated ideology. I like to look in the mirror because I'm a grown up and I'm educated and I'm smart and I know big words that I'm so smart and I've let go of all of the feelings that animate my conversations and my positions. And when I tell somebody you hurt my feelings, I'm not just talking to them. I'm talking to me. I'm reminding myself what is at stake, what has been hurt. And that allows me to respond with more honesty that I don't need to escalate. Interesting. How, how is, what part of the public profile of David Beshevkin are you most proud of the impact? And in what way is David Beshevkin most misunderstood? What do you wish your many followers online that you're misunderstood, that they would appreciate about you, that they would give you a better benefit of the doubt, that would get to know you better about, that they wouldn't make assumptions. How are you best understood? Do, are the people most getting you? And in what way are you the most misunderstood? I, I really love that question. And I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to respond to it, even though I don't think I have an adequate amount of time to really unpack it. It's something I ask myself a lot. I think what I am most proud of 
is sharing sincerity online and giving people the space to both be very silly and very sincere. You don't always have to pour your feelings out online, but you're allowed to pour your feelings out and you're allowed to be sincere, but you could also be very silly and that's not a contradiction. Uh, I'm extraordinarily proud of the Torah that I share online. I'm extraordinarily proud of the systems that I've set up. I read this over Shabbos, turning Shabbos into a moment of reading for all of the late sonas and the jokes that it evokes. I'm very proud of my Arab Shabbos messages that I always share on Twitter. Good Shabbos to anyone who, and I try to weave it into the Parsha. I'm very proud of the memes and the silliness and the laughter that I've done. And more than anything else, I'm, I'm very proud, I've mentioned this to you before, of the of the doorways that I've opened to Dafyomi and to the study of Gemara with Tablet Magazine and the essays that I write and share online about about how the, the every every tractate in the Talmud is relevant to everyone, and there's a way to find relevance in there. I think the part where I feel most misunderstood when people diminish me into averages and playing ideological games, when people respond and look at me like I'm trying to, you know, average out the sides I take. I'll, I'll I have ten issues. Five of them I'll side with the with the right wing, and five of them I'll side with the left wing. Uh, whether it's an issue like um, LGBT issues or issues that relate to, um, to to sensitivities to others, or Talmud Torah, progressive, conservative, liberal, I hate being diminished into culture wars and ideologies. I find it insulting on a personal level. It hurts my feelings. I think there's only. You know, there are a lot of people who have unfollowed me on Twitter. There is only one person who has ever unfollowed me on Twitter that I still think about uh, often. And it's somebody who accused me of this. And it hurt my feelings tremendously. They, they said, you, you, you're just playing games. You're, you're, you're trying to, to make everyone happy and not take a stand and, and, and offend people. As if you're trying to average out, you know. I stood with the liberals on this issue and now I have to be with the Republicans on this issue and the conservatives and this one, I can be progressive and I'm trying to average it out. And I find that so diminishing as a human being. I find that it is such a cynical box to be placed in when the only thing that I really want to share ultimately is a tefillah, is a sense of connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to other Jews, to Abchi Yisrael, and also all of humanity. A lot of my followers are not Jewish, and I try to share sincerely. And when I'm accused of playing political games with the stands that I do and don't take, and kind of like averaging out and seeing what people want to say and just telling people what they already want to hear, um, that it feels incredibly diminishing, and it's very, very painful to me. How do you distinguish between the trolls who don't deserve your attention, which social media and the internet's full of, and sincere people who you should engage and are worth having a conversation with. Maybe minds can change, or maybe just people can understand each other better. Um, it's not always easy, but it usually is kind of easy. Usually people who are sincerely interested in reaching out to me, number one, they reach out to me privately first. They don't react publicly. My DMs are open. Uh, they'll email me. Um, we recently did an episode on 1840 that garnered a, a great deal, not a great deal, but, but some deal of controversy. And I don't want to get into that right now. That's not the appropriate place for this. Um, and people reach out to me uh, via email. And I was so heartened by the very real and incisive criticism that I received for it. Uh, but with honesty and with graciousness, it wasn't always easy for me to read. They accused me or they interpreted what I did with, a, with with high stakes. But the fact that they reached out to me directly as a person, um, and even if they thought that I, what I did was very wrong, I always, I always appreciate that. Trolls is a performative exercise. When you are responding, when when you are responding in a very reactive way publicly, I have a hard time to believe that you're motivated by truth and not by the performative exercise. Uh, of calling somebody out or feeling motivated by the ego of I'm right and you're wrong and not the conversation to get towards the truth that usually lies between both of us. I shared with you the experience I had as someone who wrote me an open letter online about something. And because I knew who it was, I had his email address. I emailed him and I said, hey, people shared with me, you wrote this open letter. 
here's my phone number. Would love to talk to you about it. I'd love you to hear my perspective. I'd love to hear yours. I think we can both be better for it. And the person actually wrote me back and said, well, because what you believe or what you did or what you said affects people in the public, I can only have a conversation with you in the public with an audience. They mm -hmm. need to be able to see and weigh in and almost like hold a scorecard and judge in the rant. And I said, that's not a relationship. If you're looking for a debate, I'm not interested. If you're looking for a discussion, I'm eager to have it, right? I, I, I proactively sent an email, sent my phone number. So I think it's a great litmus test of someone's sincerity is, are you reaching out directly? Are you interested in, in, in challenging or growing or resolving? Or performative is, is a great word. Thank you for your time today. we got a couple minutes left. I want to ask you about, about 1840, the podcast. Yes. Time, time just flew by and I'm so well behaved, cousin. I haven't fought with you at all. <laughs> so- um, You're very kind to me. Right, you, you, you live in two opposite arenas sim arena simultaneously. Twitter is short form, right? Twitter is a place and a platform for sound bites quick deposits, limited letters that you could write. And then a podcast is this incredible long form place where you could really develop and explore. It's almost two opposite arenas that you live in and that you and that you demonstrate. In 1840, you've been focused a lot, it seems, on intergenerational divergence, and that's expressed itself in many ways. Why? What draws you to that theme expressed in, in different ways? But what is it about that theme? Again, is it is this part of the underdog or the, the one who's not spoken or neglected or misunderstood? Is this a, a common theme of yours? Is there something else that's informing why you're focused on that? I, I, I love that question. The intergenerational divergence and the emphasis on it is because I think when we came to the United States of America uh, in that second wave of immigrants in the, in the, in the mid-early uh, 1900s, uh, we realized that the only way that we were going to survive was by building institutions. And we've built institutions of unparalleled magnitude, of unparalleled success and importance. Uh, starting from the 1940s with her Shraga Fievel Mendelovich, she started earlier, my grandfather's a student of his, and Torah Masora and Beis Yaakov's and modern Orthodox high schools and Flatbush Yeshiva. And, and schools ballooned. Um, and I believe that we're in 2023. We're almost 100 years later. And we've never been in a stronger place institutionally, dare I say, in all of Jewish history since the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. I don't know that we had such strong institutions in Vilna in the 1800s. I don't know that we had such strong institutions uh, in, in, you know, in... in in Pumpadisa, even in Bismarck HaGemara, our yeshivas were this strong and this powerful and addressing so many Jews. But what I am concerned about is that navigating the ultimate building block of Klal Yisrael, which is the family unit, the first institution of the Jewish people is the family. And very often institutions don't have family's best interests and they're unable to have the dexterity and get into the nooks and crevices that families need to negotiate with because institutions, by definition, need to hold a policy line that, that encompasses much more than one family unit. So I'm kind of trying to tilt the scales a little bit to remind the Jewish people we can't forget the most important unit and building block of Klal Yisrael and the Jewish people, and that's the family unit, and that's why we highlight these stories. For all of the success and continued success of our institutions, it cannot be, and I'm worried that it was becoming th th this reality, it cannot be at the expense of, of the family unit. I wish we had more time now to explore this. Maybe we'll, we'll continue this conversation elsewhere. But there, there definitely is, and, and that speaks to me, it resonates to me, resonates for me, the notion of harmony and peace and the ability to coexist and to live together despite differences or disagreements in lifestyle or ideology. But we also have a tradition, right, of, of, an, of an Avram getting rid of a, or throwing out a Yishmael and, and Asa of being an outsider. And we also have, we have a history where a child who married out People sat Shiva for them, which Poskim almost universally today say is the wrong perspective and attitude. I'm not, God forbid, I'm not endorsing that or suggesting that we we maintain that. But it isn't also, right, we don't have this notion that um, we do whatever it takes and whatever expense and whatever cost to make sure that the family can stay together. Right? We do also have some boundaries we're trying to set and we want to not endorse certain behaviors or we want to not mainstream or we want to not 
um, project some confusion or distortion or dilution of who we are and what we believe. So uh, we can't unpack it now. I'm just leaving you with this question and maybe we could talk more about it somewhere else because uh, what you said spoke to me and I believe in it and I love it. And I think when you see the families that are like it, right, it's always it's always that post on some social media where the Hasidish father attended the swearing in in the army or the whatever attended whatever. It yeah. warms our hearts and we see it and we found a way to cross divisions to stay a family. But is there another side to it? And should we be thinking about that? Because is there an unintended consequence? Is there a danger or damage by overly weighting the importance of maintaining the family? Number one, there are always consequences to whatever position you take and whatever you center and and, de and consequently decenter. There's always consequences. Uh, and I'm not oblivious to that. Uh, I think that the notion... Of, of that unconditional connection to Klal Yisrael uh, emanating from the family unit, which Rashi deliberately couches, uh, which Rav Moshe Feinstein writes in a tshuva is just a, a melitza. It's not, it's not the actual halachic source. It's like the, the tagline is from Afal Pishachatu Yisrael who, even though a Jew sins, they're still a Jew. They're still connected to the Jewish people. Um, the examples you brought are all from before uh, Matan Torah, before the entry into Eretz Yisroel. To understand the distinction and the answer, in my opinion, has to relies on the fact of understanding the context of when Afal Pisha Chatu Yisroel who was actually said. Uh, I believe it's yeah, the but second. the Avelis case, right? Sitting uh, sitting shiva when we'll, we'll a child get to that in one second. Yeah. We'll get, we'll get to we're gonna, we, we have this is too important a topic. Oh. We're gonna have to, we're gonna have to have you back and unpack it another time. You're cutting but me I'll, off right now. I'm cutting, yeah, I'm cutting you off, but I'm gonna give you this challenge. I'm gonna give this challenge, D Bash. I, I want all you, the Goldbergs, all my fellow cousins, send them text messages. He's cutting you off again. I'm yeah. cutting you off. No, no, I'm, I tell you, I'm cutting you off out of respect for you because this is too yes. important. Yes, to yes, me yes. looking at the clock and worrying. This is very real, and the Hassan Sofer and the Hassan Sofer. Have chuvas about about uh, sitting shiva, which was based on the chuvas Rabbi Nugershim and Moed Katan. This is definitely all discussed. Yeah, yeah. Key, Would you have the key on? to all of this is the story of Achan and when it happened and why it happened. So, would you have on? Have you had on? Would you have on in the intergenerational divergence? Would you have on someone who represents a family who says, "My child, my spouse, my loved one, whatever behavior, whatever identity, whatever, whatever was so." egregious, dangerous, threatening that we chose actually to protect the family. We did not keep the harmony. Is that a voice that's worth having? Again, I'm not advocating. I'm not saying that's what I agree with. I'm not telling you that's my belief. But is that a voice that's worth having in the conversation? Yes, for the right reasons. There are times where families, unfortunately, and I don't think it's the end, it's the final resolution to that family, but there are families who they need time apart together. They need to create space for each other, whether it's the, the person who's who's still committed to the traditional community or somebody who may have left or dealing with other issues. I absolutely would. Um, if anybody has suggestions, I'd be happy to do okay. it. There is a specific family that I wanted to have on, but obviously if they're unable to speak together, they're very rarely willing to come onto a podcast together. Fair enough. Uh, so, so, but if you have suggestions and you've given me suggestions for this very series, stay tuned. Um, I, uh, I, I usually have families that have found the way forward, even if they weren't always together. Amazing. Because I think that's a fascinating angle on it. Not that I personally am advocating for that or support that, but I think it's part of at least the broad conversation. I am getting text messages from my children. Hashtag team D bash. Stop <laughs> cutting them off. So you got your, you got your message out loud and clear D bash. Rabbi Bishevkin, thank you so much for joining us and sharing. I, I wasn't cutting you off at a disrespect. This is no, too important a topic. Yes, no, it's yes. too important a topic. And I'd love to continue it in another context and at another time. But thank you so much for being with us and for all that you do. And everybody should follow you and listen. 1840, amazing conversations. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, Cuz, Rib Ephraim, and Rib Josh. Always great to be together. And hope we get to see each other again soon. Amen. 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 Okay, Rabbi, can, brother, we got we got a lineup. Can, we got great. People I know, coming. I know. You got to. I'm just saying, you could feel that tension. It's a tension no of tension. love. No, 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 no. I'm saying you could feel the passion. I think in both of your voices for the things. There's that no, you oh, you know, on this one, there's no passion in the sense that I feel strongly about it. It's that I'm. I'm just curious. Is is that part of the conversation? Should it be right? It's not a. It's just a, a curiosity. We are bringing on our next surprise guest for a moment in a moment. But first, let's update everybody on where we're at. First of all, we got people still telling us where they're listening from. Thank you. We got somebody who writes, I stopped using Twitter and not seeing Rabdavid's post. The worst part about it. Someone <laughs> writes, don't worry. 
you're still on YouTube. <laughs> so we got a great conversation. If you're listening, let us know from where. If you have questions for our guests, share them with you. Thank you to the global community. We've got an update. It's unbelievable. We are at $119,085. Wow. 902 supporters. Help us get there. Whatever dollar you give tonight is being matched. Help us end this campaign. We could go back to our life of learning and teaching Torah and not have to talk about global in the campaign. Help us be able to make a difference and share what we're doing. BeerUsOnline.org slash global. Every dollar you give is being matched. And uh, we appreciate all of that, all of that support. And we welcome our next honoree uh, at the Shul Dinner. The most think- beloved Beth and Shimmy Kamenetsky. Great segue from David Beshevkin talking about Torah and Masora. Yes, we, uh, we noticed that connection. You like that segue there. We I mean, do. Beth, we do. How excited is Beth to be on Behind the Beamer right now? That's what I want to know. I've been waiting. <laughs> She's been to waiting. Be asked. <laughs> She's been waiting. A long time coming. Beth and Shimmy are here, and uh, we're so grateful that you are. Mazel Tov on the Journal Mazel Dinner Tov. Sunday night, being an honoree. Well, well deserved. Most among beloved, most beloved people I ever met on the planet, the two of you. And thank you for all that you do. There's nothing across this community that you two are not involved in, big or small. Where did that come from? Who did you learn from? What inspired you to get involved? So, um, you know, I grew up in a home where uh, on our kitchen fridge, there were six different school calendars because my father, all of us, my mom and all four kids in our home at a certain point were all involved in six different institutions. Wow. And uh, we had a whole bunch of different winter vacations at the time. And um, it was just it was like in our blood. You know, from a very young age, we were taught the importance of being involved in the Jewish community, right. Beth's family as well. All of our siblings are involved in one way or the other. And um, I mean, my grandfather was sort of just mentioned by the previous speaker, or at least his organization. And it was just really, it was in our blood. And um, when I graduated YU, I was actually going to be an accountant, and I couldn't find a job. Uh, and I ended up working for the Jewish community. And uh Hashem, Perfect. Hashem Perfect. closed that door in your face. So that he slammed that door so fast. He slammed that door for all of us. Thank God he did. <laughs> Thank God. Beth, Amazing. Elizabeth, New Jersey. Like Rabbi Brody, you go back to Elizabeth. Yeah. Correct. One Mrs. Rabbi. Mrs. Waldman, my, my teacher. Beth, what are your memories of Rabbi Tights and the Elizabeth community? What did you see there about what it means to be part of a cohesive, united community? I didn't realize it was anything different until I we got married and we went to Teaneck and there were like four shuls, four different rabbis. I, I thought that was the way every community was. One rabbi. Four shuls and one rabbi. Right. Yeah. right. That, Amazing. Um, it's, there's something special about that. Elmora pizza or Chinese? Which one? I still like pizza, you know, the pizza, the salads at the pizza store. But, yeah. you know, Rabbi Brody always says the Chinese store, you can get the lunch special all day. So yeah, all day. Great the, about new, that. the new kosher, kosher special. Josh, just not, oh, sure, not sure they're taking credit cards yet. But don't forget Dunkin' Donuts. We were the first. First of uh, the first good old kosher days. Dunkin Donuts. We were Do you know that first. my mother was sitting Shiva in Elizabeth when that kosher Dunkin' Donuts opened up? And we were in Elizabeth, obviously, throughout the Shiva for, yeah. uh, for the loss of my grandmother. And every person who drove from Teaneck to pay Shiva call to her afterwards would come over to the corner and be like, Ephraim, I'm so sorry about your grandmother. How do you, you know get to the Dunkin' Donuts from here? <laughs> right? there, was no, there was no Waze. There was no Waze, no Google Maps, no MapQuest. So every uh, single person would be like, I'm so sorry. It's so hard. Just how, how do you get to the Dunkin' Donuts from here? First, no Dunkin one could Donuts. figure out how Elizabeth got it. And yeah, what, long I, before Tina and Robbie Tice did it. Elizabeth was doing really well. And yeah. then. Everyone else had an Arab in their town, and I think that's Elizabeth finally got the Arab. <laughs> Amazing, Shimmy, you are our man. The elevator, I describe you. Take us to the top floor during the Ela at the end of Yom Kippur, oh. the year that Shimmy was sitting Shiva. Rav Shechter paskin for our community. He couldn't lead the Amud in any of the davening the whole year or Yom Naraim. But since we determined there was no one else who could do the Ela like him, Shechter paskin he, he led the Ela even that year. Even that year, because that was how singular you are in that role. We thank you for that and everything else that you do as well for our community. We're really, really so grateful for it. We can look forward to celebrating and honoring you on Sunday night. Big, big mazel tov. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're Any other forward. thoughts you have for the global BRS community? Anything you want to share? Anything you want to well, share? Uh, you would not have done that in the ELA if it wasn't for Rabbi Goldberg suggesting 
that you do that. It's and true. I actually thought it was a crazy idea when you first suggested it. Because we had but, our uh, own minion and everything. We had a great minion going In the on. shul. In the shul. Tell Alex Fletcher. It was in the shul. You had your own right. minion. We were all, but it was a, a, a Sheket minion. And we combined minyanim and we came together for Ni'ila. And it was, uh, it was great. And I think and, your speech just, you know. Sets the stage. Nah, it's the Ni'ila. Nobody remembers the speech by the end of Ni'ila. It's the Ni'ila, except you, because of how long I went and how much time I took away from you. But it's definitely, it is definitely the Ni'ila. And we're, we're grateful for that. And all that you do. And, and Moshe, uh, what he does for our shul and in our community, Moshe mm -hmm. Kamenetsky would have brought him on tonight, but there was zero chance he would have come, right? Moshe likes to be behind the scenes doing his thing. He is Very much behind amazing. the scenes. And all your kids yeah. and their great work. So yeah. thank you for it. And a big mazel tov. Thank Looking you, forward thank to celebrating. You. Whoop, I didn't mean to cut no, him off. Oh, no. I'm in oh. such trouble. Now I'm going to get more texts from my kid. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Shimmy. I love you. I love you. I know. Oh. That's like when you, know, when you hang up the phone and you hear someone, like right then, they're like, oh, I yes, just one more thing. Happen? Oh, that's right. the worst. Like, anyways, there, are, there are great people at getting off the phone. Right. My brother-in-law, Joey Hellerstein, Joseph Hellerstein, is the guttle of getting off the what, phone. What's the secret? How does you're not talking to him and you're like, sorry, Joe, I got to go. He goes, bye, and hangs up. <laughs> and then there are other people. I'm not going to say who. Some people struggle with this let's say in marriage right. you're like you know honey has been great talking i gotta go I'm, someone's waiting for me for a meeting or yeah. i gotta go and they're like oh yeah no I totally i understand just seven more things <laughs> you know just 10 more things and like you're eight more things into it yeah. okay yeah no no i understand but i gotta go yeah yeah i got it just yeah. what time who when where what yeah. so yeah, you're 100 right that happens sometimes you get uh. off the phone and then they're like but oh they're it's like up. you hear it and it's like oh what do i do i can call them back you know, I didn't hear it. Maybe I didn't hear it. Yeah, it's hard. Do I? Do you call back, Sorry, or do you right. kind of just leave it at that? Right. <laughs> you leave it right there. Do you leave it right there? Depends. It's always it a good is, question. Right. Always a good question. So we're not winding down. We're just getting started. Let us know in the comments where you're listening from, where you're watching from. Questions you have for our amazing guests, and we're so grateful to them. And uh, the great Rabbi Leibowitz, the great Rabbi Kalish. Oh, we have such unbelievable oh. people on tonight. These conversations. These are. My teachers and Rabban people I learned from, and I'm so excited. And here's one of them right now, the great oh, Rabbi Arya Leibowitz Shlita. Look at you. <laughs> Rabbi Leibowitz, thank you for coming behind the bima. Long time coming, and we're so excited I'm you're so here. Excited. And we'll have to do a full multi-episode. You know, like this, uh, this is the big time. No, no, this is this is the small time, but you are the best. Thanks that you're all – what you're doing for Kalei Yisrael, what you do for me – I text you Shaila's questions, help me. You're a resource. You have the answers at your fingertips. Turn them into 10 minute halacha podcast. Uh, Shiram, really, really amazing. Rabbi Leibowitz, you have a bigger following in Boca Raton Synagogue than I do. <laughs> you have people like, I'm telling you. you have a bigger following in my school than I do. So I guess that's. No, true. I'm sure that's not true. How, how do you do it all? How are you? you when you came here, I mean, there were people in my school that did not believe that I was friends with you. They're like, no way. You're not. You're not actually going to be able to get Rabbi Goldberg to, to come to Old Windmere. Like he doesn't he doesn't know your name, right? Like he doesn't know who you are. <laughs> yeah. Like, you don't believe me. Yeah, on top of my speed dial, that's how much I, I know. I know who you are. So I believe what everyone wants to know. Everyone wants to know. H how are you doing? What you're doing? You're running Smicha Yeshiva University. You've got a growing, beautiful shul. You're pumping out Svarim. You've got record number of shiurim online that are being listened to all over the world. They might be hosted on YU Torah. But according to the tech team at YU Torah, the IP address is listening to Rabbi Arye Leibowitz, Dafyomi, Tenmin Halacha, and a billion right. other shiurim are in Lakewood, Muncie, Brooklyn, England, France, Spain, Israel, all over the world. How? Give us your secrets to time management. How are you getting it all done? Oh, um, that's a, I, I, I don't have any 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 secrets. I mean, I, I always thought like, I, you know, I teach in yeshiva and I have uh, I'm Rabbi Vishul, and I always thought that if I had one of those jobs, I'd probably be really good at it. Um, so you know, I uh, subpar at uh, at two at the same time, but uh, you know, I, I, I do feel that if I had more time to dedicate to each one, I'd probably be a lot better at it. The shiram also, as you know, you know, when you have a lot of time to prepare a shir, your shabbos gadol, shabbos shuvah things like that. You know, those are home runs usually, and when you don't have as much time, you know, which everything you, do you love the most. Home. Which one do you love doing the most? Is it the shiram? Is it the shul? Is it the smicha? Is it the um, I, I feel like uh, teaching Torah is uh, where I'm most comfortable and where I feel the most fulfilled. Um, okay. So I'm very lucky to be able to teach Torah in a lot of different contexts. Uh, with the Smicha guys, it's great. Uh, when I was teaching in high school, it was great. When I was, right. uh, you know, teaching Torah is where I feel most comfortable. 
People don't know Rabbi Leibowitz well, who only know him from his Torah, should just know he's one of those humble and modest people I know. He is a significant contributor to the VR's global campaign, a rub of a shul, running a shul, doing and responsible, I'm sure, for fundraising, who's just so humble and modest. We can't thank you enough for your example and your modesty and your availability and your support of Biras and all that we're doing. Rabbi Brody, I want to ask you a question because you don't know the answer. How many Shiram do you think that Rabbi Leibowitz has on YU Torah right now? Right now, I'm, I'm gonna go. tell you the right. First of all, I bet while we're interviewing him, there's somehow Shiram being posted and more going on. But at least right now, the last number again, that I have, I'm not typing anything, I'm not Googling it. I'm going with 1,423. 1,423. Yeah, that's my that's my final answer. That's like a week. Oh, that's a week. <laughs> Rabbi Arya Leibowitz has 11,012 Shiram on wow. Wayne Torah right now. You understand? Multiply 11, that times the minute of each one and the listeners of each one. The million minutes of Torah that are being learned. So, Rabbi Leibowitz, does that does that humble you? Does that overwhelm you? Does that make you feel mm-hmm. responsible for everything you're saying? What are the feelings when I when I say those words? Eleven thousand twelve shiurim times probably whatever average of minutes per shiur times however many listeners. It's millions of minutes of Torah that that you've taught. What what does that make you feel? Um, sometimes I use it to comfort myself. Um, you know, when I feel like I'm not living up to what I should be doing, uh, like I feel like, okay, but you know, somewhere somebody's probably learning Torah with me right now. So that's pretty uh, amazing. You get, you get feedback for the year. You get a lot of emails or text messages. Oh yeah. I mean, that's the best. You know, I always feel, and you, you get this a lot, I'm sure, um, that, you know, people need a relationship with the person that's teach that they're learning Torah with. Um, it's, you know, as much as Torah online is nice and it's good and it's accessible, people crave a relationship. So, the, you know, and I know in my own life, there are people that I've, that I've listened to their shiurim over time and I just need to reach out to them. That's why my relationship with, you know, with, with a number of Rabbein, uh, that, as you know, are just people that, that I've reached out to just because I need a relationship with someone that I'm learning Torah from. That's how Torah was meant to be given through a relationship. So you get you get that all the time. People just reaching out. I feel like I know you. Okay, so let's actually know each other. Do you get criticism, pushback? Do you get somebody who says, "I looked up that source. It's not what it says," or you, you know, weighed towards one side too much? You didn't give a fair picture of the halacha or the the, the machlokas on this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, some some more valid than others. You know, <laughs> that's the way criticism works sometimes. But uh, there's one guy that like listens to every single sheer I give. And 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 sends an email at least two or three times a week with like significant criticism. It's like if you really don't like it, you can right. stop listening, you know. But uh, you know, but but he he comes with some valuable things also, just not always in the nicest tone. Some you, people love to hate. Do you teach what you what you enjoy teaching, or what you think people need to learn? And is is the halacha because you just enjoy the halacha? Do you, you everything from Mishnah to Gemara? Mishnah, you know, you could consider basic. Right. More, more intense. So it depends on the, you know, with the Mishnah Yomi, it's, I was already doing the daf and all daf called me and asked if I would do Mishnah Yomi. Uh, so it made sense, you know, to do Mishnah Yomi. It wasn't that I was necessarily passionate about teaching Mishnah. Um, but, so, you know, the, the, the halacha was always like where I felt uh, most comfortable. Even like as, you know, my first year in yeshiva, I was like learning Masachas Ksubis and the way I was learning it was Gemara Rashi tells us Rosh Ran Tor Beis Yosef Shulchan Aruch. You know, I wanted to learn everything La Halacha. You, you, um, you ran a Super Bowl Seder this year, a little pushback against American culture. What was the feedback on that? Was anyone who was like, you're a party pooper, Super Bowl, now you make us feel guilty for watching it? What, what, what kind of response did you get to that? It's so interesting because I, I, it wasn't my idea. Um, I, our friend Rabbi Isaac Rice is the one that came up with the idea, and I thought it was a great idea. Meaning, if there would be interest, and you know, there's only one way, one way to tell. And um, there was pushback. There were schools that refused to host it. That it, it would be insulting if we hosted this program. You know, it was great speakers. You know, Rabbi Feiner, Rabbi Zakatinsky, Rabbi Rice. I also spoke. It was it was really um, it was a great program. A bunch of people came, but I, I was confused by the pushback. Meaning. We weren't telling anybody that they're doing anything wrong. We weren't, uh, even though, I mean, La Misa, like if you're spending five hours watching football on Sunday, probably not the best use of your time, you know? So, but we weren't saying that, you know? We were just saying we're having an opportunity to learn Torah for a while. I feel like we gave in too easily, you know? All the, the and just tell anyone who does halftime Torah shows and things like that. But 
it, it, it almost was like, oh, so Rabbanim say that the best way to spend your time is to watch football and have a 20-minute halftime Torah show. That, that's not really what we believe, meaning it was a concession. Did, did you get any pushback that, you know, that's for the right wingers. They reject things like football in the Super Bowl, but like, Rabbi, you're at YU. We're at YU. You're, you're, you're modern Orthodox. Like, what are you doing? You can learn before and after the Super Bowl, but, you know, there's nothing wrong with enjoying the Super Bowl. So I think one of the things about modern orthodoxy and the modern orthodox community, as we develop as a community, um, you know, I think the next big step is to make sure that Talmud Torah gets raised to the level that that all of our Abayim believe it should be. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the battles of whatever it was 40 years ago, 50 years ago, of making sure to prevent intermarriage or the battles of 20 years ago just to get kids to, uh, you know, to yeshivas as opposed to just going to secular colleges or whatever else. The battle of tomorrow, I think, is we should have a very knowledgeable base of, uh, of Balabat and people who learn night center every night. I was in Lakewood once. I walked into a random shul to catch Marev. Place was packed with Balabat and learning night center. Uh, how many, I mean, BRS is its own, you know, Malchus, but how many places have something going on in terms of Torah learning every single night of the week in, in our community? I think that's the next thing. Wow. So what, what would you say to somebody who doesn't connect to that, right? We just took our Mavaksham trip to New York and you joined us for a little bit. And in past years, we met with you. You were one of our presenters. What would you say to someone who's like, you know, Rabbi, sitting night seder, base medrash, gemara. I want to be packing and delivering Tom Shabbos. I want to be practicing his boidadus by myself on the beach. I want to be some other expression of my relationship with Hashem or my Yiddishkeit, do you think that is Talmud Torah for everyone? A form of it? Should it be for everyone? Is it a, a foundation, a cornerstone? Should we be communicating that? It's one of my most uh, foundational core beliefs. That, uh, I, And it's not mine. I, I got that uh, pounded into my head from Rabbi Yisrael Kamenetsky uh, with my decades-long relationship with him. He was my 10th grade Rebbe. He was my boss for 18 years. Uh, he's brother I just saw Shimmy and Beth. It's great to follow them. Um, and, and he was a past behind the beam of guests, if I recall. Uh, Kamenetsky said every single Jew is supposed to have a relationship with Talmud Torah. And I think the halacha tells us that. And I, I think a lot of people um, give up too early on, on Talmud Torah. I think one of the speakers in your, in your Mavakshim trip said, you know, like how many people say, uh, I, I didn't do well in business this year. I guess making money is not for me. You know, like you don't give up on it that easy that easily. Figure it out. Yeah. You figure it out. And does it have to be Tor Shabbat? Does it have to be Gemara? Say someone says, I want to learn Rab Nachman all day. I want to learn Chumash or Navi all day. Gemara doesn't do it for me. Should there be some dose of, of Gemara? I think eventually there will be. Uh, I don't think that has to be what it starts with. Meaning, I think once once you get really into something, I don't know, you, you probably find this also. I find that people who learn, learn. Meaning when you get someone started on learning, all of a the sudden they're picking up other siddharim. Like when, when we started Smichas Chaver in the shul, it, it was like a lot of the Dafyomi guys that picked up Smichas Chaver. And then we started um, the Kenyan Masechta thing. It's the guys who are doing Dafyomi and, <laughs> and Smichas Chaver that are also doing Kenyan Masechta. Meaning, when, when, and those are the same people that are like learning Tanya on the side and that are learning. Meaning when people get into learning, they want to see the, the breadth of Torah. Right. Wow. It's amazing. What, can I just is give a plug right now for, right. For, for, for something really special? You just mentioned it as an aside, but there is a, an app and it's a website called All Mishnah. And I'm really excited because I just finished, you know, for the Shloshim, I did Pesachim. And I, when I saw Rabbi Leibowitz when we were in New York, I said, you know, I'm looking on this thing, uh, you know, All Mishnah, but I don't see Pesachim. He's like, no, we're doing it with the cycle. And I said, what? I don't even know what cycle we're in. So he said, well, it's coming up soon. So I just finished Pesachim, but now I just started it again. And I signed up for, for uh, the Pinkus Shloshim doing Pesachim again, but now I'm doing with Rabbi Leibowitz. So I don't know. I just finished my mission of Dalid. So if you want to test me, I'm I'm all in on this. <laughs> Is that going to be your Masechta? Like no matter who's Shloshim, you're just going to sign up for Pesachim gonna... each time? <laughs> well, I think that's actually, first of all, I don't want to give away my secret right now, but I, it does help to just follow whatever is the next thing in in, in, in all, all Mishnah. You you're know, not the only and, one who figured and, that out. Oh, you really? But you have to be the first one to click it. You, you, should, you have a masechta that's your masechta, but it should be one that other people aren't going to take. So masechta may not be the best way. Yeah. Take like priestess or something. Yes, Rabbi Leibowitz is on all daf, all mishnah. Our, our 11,012 shirim was just on Yu Torah. That wow. stat goes up significantly. Well, 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 when we're 
is a waiter, meaning it's the daf shirim are waiter also. It's not like it's in addition to. They're, they're I right. understand, but the multiples of people listening and multiplying out the minutes of Talmud Torah that you're teaching. Any new svarim you picked up recently that you're really excited about that you'd recommend for others? Ooh, that's that's a great question. Actually, I just got um, someone dropped at my doorstep yesterday. Art school put out Kisve Haramban. That looks very exciting. Mm. You know, the same guy, Rabbi Kilson, who did the uh, the Drush Saran. Have you seen it? The art school Drush Saran yeah. volumes. It's fantastic. Drush Saran is so esoteric. It's so philosophical. It's very. I, I always had difficulty with it, and he just like lays it out so nicely. Uh, Rav Yonason Sachs, one of my rabbis, one of our rabbis, I assume. Well, well, I don't know if you ever. Yeah. So yeah, yeah he, he goes to book all the time. Sure. sure. So R- Rav Sachs uh, once told my. Talmud, and he comes to Camp Kaley in the summer to talk to uh, to give a share to my guys. And he said, uh, he said, you know, you shouldn't use art school so much if you know when you're developing your learning. After you learn a sugya, make sure that you got it all by going through the art school. Except there are certain things that you, you can't do without art school. Drushel Saran, you can't do Drushel Saran without art school. Wow. Uh, the same guy who did the Drushel Saran just did the Rambam, so I'm very excited about that. One. Is there an area of Talmud Torah that you haven't explored yet and you want to? Is it Hasidus? Is there Machshava? Are there areas of Halacha you haven't gotten into yet? Well, there's a lot. I mean, Torah is very, very... Rav Shafter, our Rebbe, always uh, says, ah, oh, Kala Torah Kula is not so big. It fits on one bookshelf. You know, it's not so not so hard. But it, it, I don't know. Maybe, maybe for him. Uh, there's, there is a lot. Uh, there are many parts of Shulchan Aruch that... Uh, you know, that's one, one of my dreams is to just be able to... You know, go through Kiseder, Shulchan Aruch, you know, in order. Maybe once I'm done with all Mishnah, we'll do all Shulchan Aruch or something and just go Sif Akhar Sif, for, you know, for Chalakim Shulchan Aruch. I would love to do that. Uh, yeah, we all, you know, thank God because of our relationship, probably mostly because of our relationship with Rav Weinberger, um, you know, we all have picked up a lot more in the realm of Hasidus and, and even, yeah, let's call it Hasidus. Um, you know, than than we ever imagined we would. Uh, I, I say we because I think I'm not the only one. I think there there are a number of people who were you know uh, shaped in a certain mold and we're still in that mold, uh, but have been broadened a little bit. You, you um, we had a we had an interesting conversation when you were in Boca. You've been here many times as a scholar in residence, as a visiting. A visiting Rebbe, a visiting Rav, and uh, the Friday night you were most recently here. You and I had a conversation, which was a lot of fun. I felt like that with an audience. Yes, you might as well be my cousin because I, I. It's a good thing my kids couldn't text me in the middle to tell me about how I was treating you. It's out of love. It's the people I feel closest to, most comfortable with, and also like if you're in learning. I saw David that week, and I said David F was right. <laughs> you're yeah. about that. I there you go. Baruch Hashem. No, the, in the world of learning, you have a chavrusa, like in a bit, that's the Melcham Shel Torah. That's part of the argument, right? Rav Shechter loves to quote the, the diary of somebody who was on the, the train to Shanghai and the big book where they wrote, when the, when the huge books are open, they're yelling at each other, calling each other all kinds of names. When they close the book, they're best friends. So when you're seeking truth, we still have to be menschlich, but you know, you, you, you're, you're in pursuit of truth. So that Friday night we spoke about um, diff- a little bit nuanced difference. I think we mostly agree, but um, seeing the width and breadth of Torah and drawing the best from it, or, or feeling like you're a member of the greater Kla Yisrael, the, the Shar HaKolel, that I don't have to have necessarily the strongest home address. I can be somebody who wanders and tours and takes the best of Torah versus, no, this is my home address. This is who I fundamentally am. And I'm also happy to listen to and explore elsewhere. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think this is a difference of opinion um, that we have. Um, you you have often very passionately articulated the idea that you're not, and, and once in writing in a very prominent way, that you're not modern Orthodox, you're not yeshivish, you're not Hasidish, you're not, meaning you're everything all at the same time. I, I am more of the mind that you can't really be everything all at the same time. You have to know who you are and then try to appreciate and gain from everybody. Um, it's a nuance of difference, but I think it, I think it matters. Meaning, uh, uh, to me, um, being a Talmud of Rav Shaft and Rav Willig, and and knowing that when you cut me open, that's what comes out. Meaning, that's what I uh, am at my core, my essence. That's my life's mission is to be able to, as as, as you do much better than I do, to spread Rav Shaft's Torah in a way that people can absorb it, um, you know, more easily 
uh, and uh, and to be able to to know that that's what I am, but at the same time to appreciate everybody else, to appreciate all the rest of Klal Yisrael, and especially the good things that uh, that that so many different communities are doing. So, but Rav, to to cut you open and bleed, Rav Shechter, is that who you are? That that's your Rebbe, and that's the Torah. But is that is that a hashkafa? Would would you describe yourself as modern Orthodox? Would you describe yourself in the limited sense that you're only YU? When you say you have that home base in the core of who you are, you could you could have Rebbeim who happen to be part of a certain institution, but that's not necessarily limiting in who you are. Those are the people that shaped me. So my hashkafa and my right. my, my identity is uh, you know as as my Masora. I'm a very big believer in Masora. Um, in 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 all areas, in the, you know, particularly in Pesach Halacha, it's one of the reasons. I mean, why you now is that the Shachter thought before I make any decision. Obviously, I go to Merabeim to talk them talk it over, and he thought that to transmit the our Masorim Pesach is a very important thing, um, and that's what we're trying to do. Talk to us about Smicha. You're you're running Smicha. You're inspiring the next generation. You're teaching them. You're positioning them. What do you think is different today from when you and I were in Smicha? What a rabbi needs to know, and what you're teaching, or or what their challenges or strengths are in this different generation. So one one thing that's um, that's becoming clear to me is not nearly as much is different as as you think it is. Meaning, hmm. a lot of people are, and Rav Rosenzweig Shlita talks about this all the time. That people tell them no one has an attention span anymore. People can't be challenged anymore. Kids are lazy. And Rav Rosenzweig is looking at like eighty guys in his year who are listening to him go overtime by a half hour. You know, when Rav Rosenzweig says let's wrap it up, that means we have thirty five minutes left, right? Right. Just one more point. It means four more points, each one with a few bits of nuance in it, you know, and I mean, so, so, and he said, I don't, I don't see it. I don't, the Talmudim are better than they ever were. Wow. Rosh Hashanah said, Rosh Hashanah said to me, that you saw our base manager. Rosh Hashanah said he never remembers the YU base manager being as powerful as it is now, wow. as strong as it is now, the Kol Torah being what it, what it is now. So in terms of the quality of the Talmudim, their dedication to Talmud Torah, their ability even to focus, um, which is surprising, because I don't know how they did it. If I, I was yeah. brought I, I already lost all my focus. Like I still can't do it, you know, because I have, you know, because I have this. So, right. Um, so that that's that certainly I think is overblown. The uh, the Eurydice Hadoros element I think is uh, is overblown. I think we're 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 advancing, um, but but obviously Rabbanim has to be sensitive to a whole new array of topics. Uh, Rabbi Larry Rothwax, who runs the professional rabbinics. Um, says, you know, he often says that whatever was cutting edge three years ago is like over a bottle already. Now we have to be teaching entirely new sensitivities and, and expertise. And uh, he has the hard job because I, I teach the halacha. The halacha doesn't really change. You mentioned Larry Rothwax, Rabbi, Rabbi Rothwax, our dear friend, announced that he's moving to Israel. Do you, do you struggle with that? Uh, every day. How do you not struggle with it? You, you have so many brachas and shmon asrei about it. If you're even like halfway paying attention to what you're saying, like... You, Got to struggle. Have you spoken to him about that? About that move? Larry? He's doing it. He's 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 going. We're Take all here. Leap. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. It's a struggle. It's a constant yeah. struggle. You know, on on the one hand, Rabbi Goldberg has has expressed in the past uh, that uh, you know what would happen if we all just picked up and left. What would be what would be left of the American community? And like I I, I often think about, I'm I'm in the position that I'm in. Only because all the really talented people left. Meaning, like, okay, like, I'm running Why Smicha. That's insane. It's because Rabbi <laughs> Rosner made Aliyah. It's because Rabbi Ben Narsh made Aliyah. It's because Rabbi Eisenstein made Aliyah. Mm-hmm. All, all of the there's so much talent that that left. So you know, we're we're already on the bench. You know, like we're we're, we're deep into the bench over here. So that's on the on the one hand. On the other hand, I always have Rabbi Shafter, you know, in, ringing in my ears. Rabbi Shafter always says. That uh, that the cemetery is full of uh, indispensable people, meaning uh, people. The world can't go on without these people. It's like the high school seniors that think the whole school is going to change when they graduate because you know the <laughs> high school many years. Like this school can't survive without us. Yeah, they'll probably be okay, you know. So uh, yes, yeah, so I think about that. But for right now, you feel that you're what you're doing is making a difference. It's where you belong, and I guess that's why. Yeah, I never hear Rabbi Saul Reisman talk about Eretz Israel. It's I yeah. find it so interesting that like um, 
it's damn interesting the the uh Das Rashi Yeshiva. You know, Rav Belsky was probably the biggest Torah Mada personality of his of his time in English. Right. Rabbi Reisman is probably the biggest Oe Veritz Yisrael I know. Like he he, hmm. he talks like poetically about Eretz Yisrael. It's like he he signs his letters when he goes to Israel. He goes to Israel whenever he can. Like there's like a week between yeshiva and camp, and he runs to Eretz Yisrael, and and he writes letters to his kahila, um, and he signs them in love. You know, like it's just it just describe wow. mountains and what the Nevi'im did. Wow. And what, it's and and, uh, and and you know when when asked so knew you know he said my kids are all here my grandkids are all here right it's tough it's complicated it's complicated rabbi libot we have so much more to speak to you about we're so grateful we're gonna we're gonna do this again for sure but thank you for going behind the bima thank you for eleven thousand plus shiurim online that people all over the world are listening to thank you for being a resource for me and uh, i have no problem admitting that when i'm stuck and and i'm looking for a source or i need a psak and I'm, i don't have the time to research it that, you know, I know that I can call you and it's at your fingertips, or if it's not, you know exactly how to get it and give it back quickly. And I'm, I'm so grateful for you. I have access to all those postcodes, which is a really amazing thing. That, uh, yeah. And, 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 you, and, you, and you don't need them. You're becoming one of them. And for that, we are so, so grateful. Wow. So thank you so much for being with us and Atzalach with everything that you're doing. We're really grateful. Thank you. You guys are an inspiration. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. So the wow. great so so can i just tell everyone right now again after you make your donation the next thing you do just sign up for all mishnah all mishnah you will your pesach this year will be a different seder if you go through the mishnayas within the next you know four weeks three weeks and you'll see the entire uh Sachem, and it's, it's incredible. Great. He's such a great teacher. And Alex is sharing. She featured Rabbi Leibowitz on Faces of Orthodoxy. Must read. So everybody check it out. Rabbi Leibowitz is amazing. Our campaign is doing phenomenal. Thank you for everybody who's supporting BRS and the messages and the vision and the values and what we get out, the content. Please, please, please help us close out this campaign, brsonline.org slash global. And we have a very big surprise, Rabbi Brody. You don't know about this, but we got a surprise guest right now, and I'm so really? excited about it. We have the great Rabbi YY. Wow. Thank you so much, Rabbi YY, for joining us for a few minutes, coming on our, our global conversation. It's amazing, wow. amazing to have you. How are you? Wonderful. Thank you. It's my awesome. honor and privilege. Thank you for the invite and the opportunity and a lot of hatzloch in this campaign. Thank you. It's it's really special to be together. And the last time we were together was just a few weeks ago in Erev Purim, exactly. when I'm a vaccine fly in, in Muncie. And and I, I, I want to just turns home. It was an astounding and amazing, beautiful oh. dinner. Shai is phenomenal, phenomenal. An amazing host. vibe. What what a, what a generous person. Besides the, the food, dancing. besides the food, the vibe, the energy. Amazing. I thought we were fun. just going to grab some pizza at his house. <laughs> it was it was, it was nah, you don't know Shai. You don't, you don't come <laughs> it was pizza. something else. You don't come in for pizza. The Gemara says in Ksuvah about Kalba Savua, right? Rabbi Akiva's father-in-law. Right. Whoever came into the house, even a hungry Kelev went out satiated. So. Yeah. <laughs> Shai, Shai doesn't leave anybody going home hungry. It was amazing. But Rabbi Wai, at that, at that gathering, you spoke about Purim, and you, and you spoke about living with uncertainty and doubt and, and the, the Aror Haman and Baruch Mordechai in us. It was what we needed to hear, our community, me personally. When you walk in and sit down for a drasha like that, is it all carefully curated, thought out, organized in your mind now? I just need to give it over? Or do you have like, these are some ideas. Let me see how it's going to come out. I'm going to start talking and let's see how it goes. So uh, it's a wonderful question. Generally, the way I do it is I have an idea. and uh, But ultimately, I have to study the crowd and feel the energy of the crowd and based on that, the idea develops before I begin, and sometimes in middle, I feel, I feel very much the energy of the people I'm speaking to. And I also uh, feel where they're at. So sometimes in the middle of a speech, I'll tell myself, you know what, this next idea <laughs> is not for this crowd. <laughs> wow. Let's scratch it. We're going with another one, or they have lost. They have lost the train of thought. It's time for a little break, you know, and move it away to another topic. So I usually have a nucleus of an idea with uh, connections, but the details is always tailor made based on the experience of the moment. 
And do you get do you get nervous right now, fellow speaker? And I'm obviously much more obviously to everybody, much more limited and uh, a beginner of a beginner of a beginner. But you sit down for a drush like that. There's no notes. There's no safer. There's no outline. Do you ever walk in and say, "What if I what if I forget where I was going to go next? What if I forgot the punchline? What if I forgot the development of the idea? Or is it something so in your kishkas by now that you've been so thinking about it, it's been cooking and baking like a cholent that you're not going to forget to serve the cholent? It's all it's all in there." <laughs> there was uh, <laughs> you remind me of a beautiful Hasidic story, really a beautiful story. The Maggid of Mizrich, who was the successor of the Baal Shem Tov had amazing students, incredible people. You had the Balatanya, of Levitzik of Barditchev, Rebbe Limelech of Lezhensk, whose yard set was this week, the Seer of Lublin. I mean, you're talking about a group of 120 giants of giants. One of his students is a man, we don't know his name, but they called him the Volpa. And he, it was a tragic ending. He was a genius and a spiritual giant, but he ended up uh, in alcoholism. He became an alcoholic and he lost his, his house and his money and his family and he became a beggar. And he would go from door to door, different shtetls in Eastern Europe and Ukraine, asking for meals and money. In any case, one time he came to the rabbi of a city of Babroysk in Ukraine. His name was Rebaruch Mordechai Ettinger, was a Talmud of the Vilna Gaon and later a Talmud of the Balatanya. And he was the Rav of Babroysk, which was a big community. And this, this Volpa came to, to beg for a meal. He was a very, very poor man. You know, people have a sense of smell. So this rabbi, when he hosted him, he felt that there's something different about him. So what did he do? He went to his bag, which was in the foyer, and he opened it to look. Maybe there's a manuscript of his writings of what he wrote from the Maggot of Mizrich, which then would have been a priceless treasure because this is straight from the source. In the middle of the meal, this poor man turns around and he sees Rebaruch Mardechai of Babrois looking through his bag. He says, what am I, a ganav? I'm a thief. I came to ask for a meal. Why are you looking through my bag without permission? So he had to spill the beans. He said, I'll tell you the truth. I'm suspecting that you're the vulpa. I just have a hunch. And I'm wondering, and maybe you have a manuscript of something you heard from the Maggot. And the man looked at him and he said, you think... We are like you guys. By you guys, there's three things. There's the Rebbe, there's the Hasidus, and there's the people who are learning it. By us, it was all one. You don't have to write down where you are. Mm. You don't have to write down the teachings you heard from your Rebbe. But since mm. you accused me and you did a not nice thing, you don't deserve to have me, and he left the house. Wow. But like I said, he knew that he was the Volpa. It's the real deal. So, so the point is that I try to what I try what I share are usually things that I have you know tried to engrave within myself to one degree or another. So uh, <laughs> usually I don't forget the punchline. <laughs> Understood. Okay, I got one more question. Revoi, thank you for joining us. That really means the world to me. It means the world to us. I got one more question, and it's not it, it maybe just a short answer. If it now is not the time, and we're grateful for your time, and it's late to develop it further another time. Um, so my 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 chabad chaver here in BRS and Boca, we've been having a back and forth about the notion of does Hashem have needs? Hashem needs us to do X, Y, and Z. Hashem needs. And I always say, Kiviachol, meaning it's an anthropomorphism, just like Hashem gets angry, and just like Hashem has an outstretched arm, and just like Hashem, he can't be a melech without our being mamlechim, otherwise he's a moshel. So Kiviachol, he also needs us to be his shlichim, he needs us to, and they say, no, 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 you, you, you don't begin to understand. No, we're... Where the nimshal is the ma, whatever they, they start to explain to me, I don't know anything, and I should ask you. So, again, I'm sure this could be developed for hours and hours and hours on end. But how can an omnipotent, infinite, perfect being, how do we use the word need? I understand the word want, Hashem wants us to X, Y, and Z, but the word need suggests or implies there's something missing or lacking, we're not there, and He right. needs, but He's the omnipotent, perfect, infinite one. So, right, does Hashem have needs? An excellent question. So two of the greatest Kabbalists in Jewish history, literally two of the greatest, was the Shalah, Rabbeinu Yeshaya Horowitz, who lived in the 16th century, 
and in the 17th century in Frankfurt, Prague, Jerusalem, he's buried near the Rambam. Rabbeinu Yeshaya Har was the Shnei Luchas Abris. And an earlier one was Rabbeinu Meir Ben Gabai, who wrote one of the most seminal Kabbalistic works called Avedas HaKodesh. He was from the 15th century, from Spain. And in both of their works, they have a whole big section with the following question, and I quote verbatim, Avoida tzorech govoya, oiloi tzorech govoya. Which means, when we serve Hashem, is there any need that we're filling, kivayachal, in the divine reality? Or no, it's simply for our benefit. Hmm. These are two of the greatest Kabbalists. A lot before Chabad, uh, let's put it this way, BCE, before Chabad existed. <laughs> so that's my acronym. For my Chabad friends, some things are BCE. So... <laughs> <laughs> so, so the point is that this is a very, very deep, deep question. I'll just point out one point, one point. And that is, so they make a reconciliation. I don't know if this is the place. They speak about pre and post means pre means God beyond any definition, beyond any structure, beyond any personality, beyond any attributes. Over there, there can't be any needs. And once God decides to, so to speak, identify within his infinite life, light, a persona which is called Adam HaElyon, there are so-called characteristics which ultimately will evolve into human characteristic. Over there you could talk about an energetic, emotional, vulnerable, even romantic relationship. And in many ways, the difference between Jewish philosophy and Jewish mysticism. The Rambam was very, very upset if somebody would even say that God loves and, and God feels and, and even God wants, like they even want, what type of emotion is this? What do you think? He's human. And the Kabbalist, the Zohar, it's all about love and, and, and connection and intimacy and zivugim. So this is the struggle that the Kabbalists and the philosophers have. But there's one last vignette here. And this, I would say, was primary, was a very fundamental teaching in the world of the Baal Shem Tov and his students in the Balatanya. And that is, put it in simple English, it's as follows. Do I love you because I need you, or do I need you because I love you? In other words, if I love you because I need you, the love is powerful. We need each other. <laughs> we need our spouses, we need our children, we need our brothers, we need our parents, we need our friends, and therefore we love each other. It's not, man can't be alone. Lo tove yosodem levada. That love is very, very potent, but it's always limited to the depth of the need. There's another type of need. I don't love you because I need you. I need you because I love you. That need becomes an infinite need because it's not based on need of imperfection. It's based on the love, which is completely free. Because I love you freely, so it's a need that's born out of that type of love. Hmm. But is it fair to say, I choose to need you? Right. Yes, I need you, but I choose to need you. Right. Because once you read the word, I choose to need you, I understand it. The omnipotent, right. infinite, perfect Hashem right. chooses to need us. He right. chooses to love us, and that love expresses right. itself. And that us. makes the need much deeper. Because if I need you, because, you know, I, we all, like the Rambam writes, nobody can do everything alone. So we need each other based on our imperfections. But if I would have things on my own, I wouldn't need somebody else. Automatically, the relationship would diminish. When the love is coming from a choice and a choice of infinity, so how deep is that love and need? Mm. Infinite. Mm -hmm. So in a way, because it's a choice, it becomes much, much deeper because it's in my very core. Ooh. Rabbi, we have to have you back and wow. continue to explore this. <laughs> I want you to know, our episode with you on Behind the Bima, which went on for a very long time, we barely scratched the surface. There was hours more to talk about. Every interaction, we're inspired and we're touched. Thank you for taking the time. I know you have a lot going on, but it means the world that you joined us for you. a few Thank you. And this idea. Honored to be part of this program and the reputation of the community that you built with your colleagues is extremely, extremely powerful. Um, somebody told me the other day, he visited Boca a few Shabbos ago, and he says, you know, till this visit, I always said, you know, New York, to live in New York is to live where Jews live. Florida, it's out of town. He says, I came to Boca and I'm like, Brooklyn, 
it's out of town. <laughs> <laughs> We love, it. we love it. You know, our Boca Raton Synagogue, our acronym is BRS. So someone came to me and they said, you know what BRS stands for? The Brooklyn Recovery Society. That's what it stands for. So Baruch Hashem, yes. we're very grateful. Yes. We're very honored. I tell my friends, you go to Pennsylvania to see the Amish in their natural habitat. Go to Florida and Boca to see Jews in their natural habitat. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Great. Hashem. Ravar, thank you for all that you do. Thanks for joining us tonight. Aslacha muflag. Have a beautiful evening. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. wow. Big surprise having surprise. Right. Did not see that well, coming. That's our amazing. surprises aren't done. You think we're done with surprises for tonight? No way. We've got a we're long night ahead. Tonight. The night is young. We're not done with surprises. We've got a few more guests coming up, but I want to I want to now bring on someone very special. First of all, keep the comments coming. Tell us where you're watching. Tell us where you're listening. And give. Help us meet our, our campaign. We're bringing these conversations. We're bringing these panel discussions. We're writing and sharing these articles. We're sending out the Global Weekly every week with the partial perspective right up with articles. If you're enjoying, if you're benefiting, so just take a moment, give a little something, not just to us, give to Safaria and give to Wikipedia and give to YU Torah, anywhere you benefit from, right. show some Akar Satov, beersonline.org slash global. I got to tell you that I have enormous Akar Satov for Rabbi Kalish, or Daniel Kalish, who is a powerhouse in Waterbury Yeshiva. My son-in-law, one of my sons-in-law, learned in Waterbury. He's very close to Rabbi Kalish, was Masada Kedushin. Rabbi Kalish is so filled with love, and he's such a special person, and he's such an incredible person. And he is so devoted to his Talmudim, his students. He's such a difficult person to track down. So I've been chasing him. Got to have this conversation. I want God to have you. And he is the only part of tonight that's not live. Tonight's entire episode is live. Everything is live. The conversations you've seen, the people have been coming on. They've been surprising. Everything about tonight, the comments, we're all live. The one part tonight that's not live, I was able to track down Rabbi Kalish two nights ago at a wedding and right after the chuppah he was Masada Kedushin I basically pulled him into <laughs> I pulled him into a bridal I suite <laughs> I kidnapped him and pulled him into a bridal suite and I brought my daughter Tamar who was the videographer mm -hmm. she gets all the credit and I, I literally in the middle of my talking to him the makeup artist came in the Kala's sure. mother came in I thought the yeah. Kala was going to come in there's stuff all over the floor and I was like this room's not available I'm sorry We've got to bring Klai Yisrael, Rabbi Kalish. I'm just joking. We were a little bit nicer than that. But we had a short conversation. Rabbi Kalish is a gem. He's gold. He's unbelievable. And he inspired me to really think about a lot of things about my life and the way I do things. And I'm really, really excited to be able to Amazing. share that conversation with everybody. So we get a break but, right now, right? No, get, no, no, you can't go to the bathroom. You can't no, move. My, Simone we're, just we're went to Israel. My kids are still up. <laughs> no, no, no. There's no break because we got more to come. More guests to come. Hey, Rabbi Daniel Kalish. Okay, we just supposed to hop a few minutes with Rabbi Kalish. We are at a wedding by Hashem, one of the hardest people on the planet to be able to uh, to find to connect with, which is just a testament to the Rav's loyalty and commitment to his Talmidim. That's why outsiders aren't able to break in, and even so here, the level of focus and concentration with each. So, just a couple minutes. The Rav is legendary with being able to show love and affection and reach people who don't feel that from other sources. And I've seen it firsthand and, and I'm blown away by it and inspired by it. What, what's the secret to it? What do all parents, what do all educators, what do all rabbis need to know about how to make somebody feel special, loved, connected? The people who others have failed, how are you successful in connecting with them? First, of all, thank you for your kind <laughs> words. Thank you. I want to I wanna say that there's something to tap in. It's not just like we're asking them to tap into us with our youth today. I think that we can tap into them. And and what I think our youth are teaching us, we all come from amazing places, and our parents, our grandparents, our heroes, and strong people who handed us Yiddishkeit, real heroes. Today's generation is feeling in ways, my own children, guys in yeshiva have taught me and the way people are feeling and experiencing life is changing my life. Mm. So I think a lot of, of us, instead of, I heard somebody giving a speech and he said like, I have spoken to 10,000 kids and I, I, wanted to, I want to shoot, report back. So this man spoke to 10,000 kids. I think it's more important that 10,000 kids speak to mm. us. So I think there's a lot to tap into. I think today's generation is feeling and experiencing. I'm slowly learning to feel my own story, watching guys feel their story, and seeing guys getting in touch with their story is something that's really something that a friend of mine asked me a question that 
we would ask, he said, do, your kid, do, do we ever speak to our parents the way our kids speak to us? Do you ever, you, you're, <laughs> you're kind and nice, and all our children are amazing. His friend said, our kids speak to us in ways that we ever speak to our parents. And I asked my friend, were we ever very open with our parents? I, our parents, my parents are my heroes, my rabbin. Did we ever share our worries, our insecurities? Not, it wasn't them, they were right. heroes right. and changed our lives. So it was, both, it was both ways, both sides of the coin. Yeah. I, think, I think to tap in, if we listen and hear what kids are, what people are saying today, they'll change and we'll change. So where do we create the boundaries then? Because if we want to be such good listeners and non-judgmental and accepting and warm and that friendship component of parenting, how do we also have the, not authority in the negative sense, but authority in the sense that Chazal already understood that if people respect their parents, they respect Hashem. If they don't respect their parents, they won't see Hashem. So to a degree, we represent not only ourselves, but the entire history that led up to that child. So if we're too compromising on it, then they'll struggle to see any authority or respect anybody. So, you know, when do we create the boundaries and when do we say, look, there's a friendship, I want to be open, you can tell me anything, there's no judgment, I love you and I'm listening and hearing you is helping me grow. But on the other hand, I'm also a older, a little bit of an authority in the boundaries too. How do we find that balance? I don't find, I feel like we're afraid that it sounds like new age. Like we say, be a friend, and listen, like, oh my goodness, listen, like the fact. I don't think the points contradict. Rashi and Chomish translates av as a chaver. Yasef was av leparei chaver. Rashi says chaver upitarei. Rudvarim mm. says re'acha ha'av k'nafshecha. Says Rashi ze'avicha. So I don't think it's like new age that a father is supposed to have a close relationship and be in sync and understand. I don't think that contradicts authority. When, when in our own view of Hashem, Hashem understands me fully. Now, I don't think there's any contradiction to authority. It's interesting, from time to time, kids, parents will say, I know, whatever, you don't hold it being tough in the yeshiva. Right. And the irony is I'm very into tough, very. I'm into relationship. From that place, we strip the, there's authority. Authority is very real. The Ramam says on a Rebbe, that Rebbe has to be mechabed as Talmidim. You sound very liberal and like Rebbe Mechad Talmud have to honor their bay and and honor is deep. Honor doesn't mean you're a nice kid. Honor means that you hold deeply of them. And the Ramam says a Rebbe has to honor Talmudim. Of course, Talmudim have to honor a bay. Of course, that's the Iker covered. But where do they get this covered from? Because they're Mechubad. And that that the, the Rebbe honoring the Talmudim parents holding to their kids, hearing, I don't think contradicts authority. I think actually a better authority like that because a kid sees in the authority figure somebody who understands me, who really gets me. I like saying understand and demand, but understand, but understand, but understand, but understand. But understand. Yeah. When we listen well, I think all eight billion people in the world have an incredible story. Every single human being, I only think it's divided who knows their story, who doesn't. I really believe you have a, a podcast that reaches a lot of people. You can ask any one of eight billion people on earth, tell me your story. And I believe everybody will be dazzling. Everybody. Mm. Doesn't need crazy drama. It's, I, mean, I learned this from today's generation that people, we all have a story nuance and all different aspects of our journey with best parents, best rebellion, best mechanichim, but how it hit us, how we were going through our own our own things that were happening inside of us. That's what we're that's what I'm seeing today's generation. Another rabbi likes to speak about the rough speaks about codependency. My son in law is one of the uh, very full of the Talmud and, and uh, repeats the Rav's insights often on another codependency so, so how do Rebbeim, or Machanchem, or even parents for that matter, when they're listening so closely and so attentive and so involved, not end up crossing the boundary of the line of being the hero or swooping in or being overly available, overly accessible, and diluting their own identity, their own sense of self, and their own responsibility for their own learning, their own growth, their own... This is a fear I have with a lot of young Machanchem and certain environments and atmospheres where it's so easy to feel so needed and feel so heroic and the adrenaline release, release that comes from that, how do we ensure that 
that we're, what we're doing is, is healthy not only for the other person, but healthy for ourselves. Where I come from, where I come from that question, we get like a standing ovation. Yeah. <laughs> because that question is instructive and that question has to be asked. Has to. Where I come from, like so, you know, a speaker, there are people that listen to so we, we watch. I've watched Met games, Mike Piazza, it's all run, you go crazy. Right, right. So a question like that, you get like a standing up. <laughs> I think, I think, I think that, that question, the best thing we could do for our kids, parents, rebellion, parents, well, I want to help my kids, the best thing is address our own stories, address our own relationship, our own connection to Hashem, any Rebbe and parent, the answer to codependency is your own healthiness. Any parent, parents want, we want to give the all of us love our kids and want, want to give the world to our kids. The best thing we can give to our kids is working out our own relationships, our own traumas, our own story, being a resolved person. The whole subject of codependency is instead of resolving my story, I'll help uh -huh. you and that feeling will fill something. The best thing any Rebbe has to make sure he's a good husband, and make sure he's a good marriage, make sure he's a good son to his parents, like plug into relationships, figure out and resolve. I think learning our own story and, and not just, if, if we're only living vicariously his story, so all the things you're describing are mm -hmm. true. Anybody listening to kids and hearing what's happening who's not moved to say, I might have a story myself, mm -hmm. is not listening really. Is like, it listen. complicated to, I mean, you've listened to too many stories, maybe person is just, it's not really their story, maybe they're sort of projecting someone else's story onto themselves. Sure. How does, how does it, are there some of the, and we'll close with this because we are in the middle of a wedding, it's so appreciative of your time. Thanks. But are there any suggestions or tools for how a person can examine what their own story is and what it means to reveal a story or create their own narrative? I'd say, I'd say on that, it, it, the question is broad. I would say very important is don't say a kid's story. Don't tell somebody their story is huge. It's interesting, Megillah says to his words that always bothered me. Mordechai says, that's the mi oideam that is kazaisi gat lomalchus. Mi oideam? Every first grade of oideam, we all love it. That's why she was there. He says, mi oideam, maybe a teenager would say, you think? That somebody might translate it, that it's sarcastic. Or mi oideam, he means. But of course, I don't like sarcasm, so I tend not to think that's the trap or the pshat. So what do you say, mi oideam? So for a long time I had the kasha. Do I put them as Hester, it's me, Pesas, I need idea, put them as me idea, maybe. But a singer, a Hasidic singer said a pshat that I love, and the pshat he said is, I have no right to tell you your story. He says, I know in my story, I can tell you, I can't tell you your story. Wow. So to you, me idea. Now he does tell her to go in, that's the he, but I can't tell you why you're here. Wow. That's what a Hasidic singer said pshat. But not saying somebody else's story, I think is very important. I think it actually empowers us to learn our own story. I have no right to tell them this story. And we get in a lot of trouble if we tell kids. There are times we know the kid's parents, we know his older brother, so we like, and you're tempted. Don't, if you tell him the story, he'll never feel his, and the nuance of the story, you'll never learn. Can you define story? What does it mean, someone's story? Well, our, our, children, story. Well, our children are feeling things as they're going through life. They're feeling things from us. They're feeling things first, second, third grade. There's, there's an inner world besides what we're seeing externally. We're in a chasna tonight. To one person, it's an overwhelming. I have so many friends here. I feel so insecure. We're, we're, we're not at the same event. We're all at a different event. The way you're a rub, an accomplished rub. How this simcha hits you, I'm from out of town. We all have like, the story is what's happening in me. The event happens outside of me. My story happens in me. I think if we're attuned to the things inside of us, we get tremendous places. I say don't tell a kid his story. When you describe, when the rub describes people like mixing up, what's my, a lot of that happens when we're aggressive with somebody else. We tell him his, he tells us. Nobody could tell me my stories. I experience my stories. So self-awareness, a person has to know who they are, where they're at, what they're feeling. You can't be genuine or regulate who you're meant to be if you don't know who you are. And that's the journey. Do you know when a kid says to a parent, I was the one who did this, and I said, that's not what I did. Uh, that's a funny conversation. It's, it's, the kid's not saying what you did, he's saying what he experienced. Right. So a kid will say to us, when I was little, you always, always, that was once. 
He's saying what I experienced. Of course, my eight-year-old, the guys are all seven-footers. If they don't know that they're seven-footers, he watches them play ball with all seven-foot right. dunkers. Right. See, they don't know that that's his perspective. That's how eight years. So our story is really how we were experiencing life. I believe Hashem put us a lot of inner things that the generation which said we were, we were trained just do and a beautiful training. And many successful people just did. There's a generation we tell them, just do it. What, what are you? No, no, no. They, that, there's an MS that I think that's the chutz. And is this philosophy? And I said we're ending. But this philosophy that works so successfully, our family are such beneficiaries. Is this philosophy for the for the outliers? Or do you think this is a philosophy that the entire system needs to adopt? And it's absent. And if it is, why is it absent? Why is it there there's mainstream missing this fundamental I think thing. people are reaching this a lot. People are running after this Nikud a lot in all circles. I don't think this for a certain type. I think it's for everybody. I think it's for everybody. I think there's a tire. I didn't learn a certain care of the tire my whole life. And I always liked the shape. I liked the sign. I liked the muscle, the mother, and I, you know, that was my, that was whole smart. And I didn't learn. They didn't talk to me. And today I'm like drawn. I'm drawn. I learned this fast sevens. I don't understand. I'm starting right. I'm a rookie from the beginning. I look this. Stand two pieces out of ten, maybe. To, and the way I understand the two is limited. But but the reason these swarm are opening up, and a lot of people are interested in these swarm, is they're talking to the human experience. We like label Hasidic swarm, it's, it's a bad label. Mm -hmm. It's just the essence of people. And the, what exists in the swarm, the Torah is talking to the human condition, to all the nuances of our experience. So I, I think people are running for this. I think people are examining this. I think it's what's happening. So I don't think it's meant for a certain kid, a certain type. I think the struggling youth are the ones forcing it because they have no choice but to examine that. Mm -hmm. And the one who's like, life's floating doesn't have to examine it. I can tell you, when I started, kids would come to me, I would cheer kids up. The kid would come and he'd cry, he says to me, I didn't know, like, Kishmak, you cheer up, okay, let's learn. Right. And then you cheer them up and you learn together. Right. He said something, he said something, and he, he's leaving out a part of him, not like addressing. That doesn't mean to get stuck there, it means to study there, to figure out and resolve, to, to talk to all our parts. So I think it's for everybody. I, I, I could just say, if I can't, I can't tell you yours, I can just tell you my story. Right. Amazing. <laughs> Shab Nachas from the Talmud, the more Simchas we should meet at more and more weddings. Thanks. Thank you for my family, for Kala Yisrael, for the difference and the, the standard that you're. you're Putting us the challenging all of us to think in this way and make this difference. So we greatly really appreciate it. I think I think what you're doing is all the same. The the whole world of a Rebbe Rav and people belonging and connecting. That same model of speaking, what you have and what you're doing and you represent to me, because this is not a certain age. Our parents, our, the kids in the school, the parents, our parents, our student bodies need this also. And people, older people are looking for this. They're connecting to Rabbanim in a different way. And again, this is not any map. The older days, we're only here. Right. Anything we're doing, we're nothing without the early right, days. Right. They were malachim. And what they world, did. But this is, it's going to a place. Always, we're standing on their shoulders. Yeah. So that place, older, what you're representing, people have a Rebbe, a Rav, who's a Rebbe figure. And then people are talking and communicating. Right. I think it's like all the same revolution. That's right. It's just different places. Right. That. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Together. Thank you, Thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Rabbi Brode. Wow. The great wow. Brother. I would love to meet him and talk to him. Gotta get him down. A for legend. Shot. I yeah. knew that you would love him. It's all. Just, it's He's love. So good. Yeah. It's stories. It's honoring who they are. It's all. It's all just absolutely amazing. It's all oh, just absolutely amazing. So refreshing to hear that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's the best. We got one more guest tonight. Are you ready? Yeah. We saved, we saved the best for last. Brody has no idea. I have no idea who's coming. We had Rabbi David Beshevkin. We had Alex Fletcher. We had Rabbi Kalish. We had Rabbi Lee We had Laurie Palatnik. We had Rabbi Roy Jacobson. We had dinner honorees. We had an incredible, incredible who night. Could you, saved, who who saved, could it be? Is it my we mom? Saved, we saved the best. <laughs> we saved the best for last. The best for last. I hope she can hear us because here we go. The very best for be last. And there she is. There she oh. is. <laughs> Hello, Rabbitson. 
I can't hear anything. You still can't hear? Why is your volume down? Hold on a second. Volume. Can you hear us? Or everybody talk to me in the meantime. Okay. Yeah. So first of all, I can't hear anything. Set. Hold on. We're gonna we're gonna remove. We're, we're gonna, gonna try one more time. I'm gonna have my kids work on that in the meantime. Exactly. Go, mommy. <laughs> yeah. Go with uh, Tara. Tara, you gotta yeah. change that last name, by the way. Oh, <laughs> my kids noticed that you mentioned Simone's in Israel. They did that. They picked up on that. Interesting. No, she's what, there for. What is she there uh, for? Oh, she is there for a wedding. Eliza Barchayim's daughter's wedding. That's right. Right. That's what she is there for. And that's why I'm here. By the way, that glitch is evidence that we're live. Totally <laughs> live. <laughs> and I totally. went upstairs and my, my kids are sleeping. So I told them, Mommy's On their not own? here. You got yep, you guys gotta go to bed. How'd you and do that? Did. I don't know. It's How'd weird. It? I can't I I I, I I think that they, they they maybe other people experience the same thing. They they feel like they could take advantage of their mom, but okay, she's back. Can you hear us? All right. Dad means business. Here's, here's the thing that I just don't know technology, so I don't know what I was doing just now. Sorry about that. That's okay. By the way, she's not faking it for like shidduchim for our kids. She actually does not know technology. <laughs> I, I don't know how to work my laptop. It's a bit, I mean it's a big problem. <laughs> well, the, the second one second one second. How does Kalev Minsky feel that she's a Tara Goldberg on here? Yeah. Did you see that? I, I saw that. Tara Minsky. It depends on how it's displayed on your... You see it? Tara oh, Goldberg. It I got Goldberg. Goldberg. Yeah. Oh, it does say Tara Goldberg. That's funny. Go mommy. Heart always shape. the Goldberg. Once the Goldberg, always the Goldberg. Wishing yeah. a Tara for Wish Lamar. Rabbi Brody, a Tara broke her foot. She did. How did At that, that happen? that wedding that Rabbi Kalish had his interview. <laughs> yeah, the wedding. Uh -huh. While we were, did you see what was going on in that interview room? You see makeup people going in. Tamara's left talking to the people... Whatever I kidnapped, I basically kidnapped the head of Waterbury Yeshiva. I kidnapped him. <laughs> I don't think it, was, it was well worth kidnapping him because he's such a ball of love, energy, smiles. You know, he's so focused on 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 his mission. I saw that he spent the whole night just talking to Talmidim, talking to couples, and anyone he was talking to, it didn't matter who was hovering near him, waiting for him. He was fully engrossed, immersed, focused, only and entirely whoever he was talking to at that moment. It was really special to see. I really enjoyed that. All right, Yecheva, we got the rabbits in now. We're finished. We saved the best, the best for last. We are That's three crazy. hours, 14, three hours, 15 minutes in. Three right. hours, 15 minutes in. Let's bring it home so it. my Goldberg can go to sleep. No, it's almost time to caffeinate with Kavana in the morning. We're going to go. We got <laughs> we got the Sunrise Minion at the beach. That's sunrise Minion? That's right. Maybe we should just go straight to Sunrise Minion <sighs> at the beach. Okay, hold that phone steady. Where's Tamara? We got to get her to come hold that phone for you. Okay. It, it, no, it just doesn't. By the way, you guys don't you don't sleep. You just keep it going. I just got I just I just got busted. Why? Because I happened? just started. We have every Thursday now. We have this shear with Rabbi Grossman. So I just started it for everyone, but and I turned my camera off. But I didn't turn the, apparently I didn't turn the volume down. So we just <laughs> came back on right now. <laughs> so <laughs> classic. So everyone's like they're all calling. And I'm like oh, I can't pick it up right now. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't have the volume. <laughs> Classic. Rebitson, so we recently had the occasion to be with our parents. And uh, I'm not allowed to say it. We were celebrating someone's birthday. I can't say who's. And I think it was my father who asked you and asked your parents. They said they had no clue I was going to be a rabbi. They didn't believe I was going to be a rabbi. They never would have predicted I'm a rabbi. I still think they think I'm the biggest imposter on the planet. They're proud of me, but they're still pretty sure they think I'm an imposter. But they asked your parents when you knew you were going to be a Rebitson. Mm. When did you know? Um, I mean... You don't always know because a lot of it depends on who you marry. Um, but I, I was dating guys primarily who were interested in in going into some form of Rabbanas, Chinuch, some work with the Klal. Um, it was either that or or someone who would work in Israel. Like I either want to live in Israel and feel like I was making a difference mm. there or, um, you know, marry someone in Clay Kodesh in America. That was kind of what I was looking into. And then, you know, and then I found you. They settled on the, me. Entered the slide together. But I didn't know it was going to be a rabbit necessarily. I mean, that's, you know. I all the, I heard you told the Shad Khan, I'm looking for a prematurely gray, balding. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's what I was looking for. And, and, and you found him. It worked By out. By the way, we should, we should put up the picture of you, what you would look like if you, you weren't a rabbi. 
Me? You, know, you wouldn't be balding. You wouldn't George Clooney. That's what I'd look like. <laughs> you wouldn't anyway. be great. Well, I think, you know what? I think that's like, you know, you look at this marathon over three hours, the fact that you're waking up early tomorrow morning for a Sunrise Minion and you have your Friday morning Kolel and you have your Arab Chavez. No. You know, it's it's nonstop. So, you know, this is the feel is that pressure thing, right Joe. now. This is, you? you know, I get tired just thinking about, I mean, you know, it's the greatest I love privilege. It, but it's, it's a lot. It's a lot it's for a lot. one person, you know. It's, gr- uh, it's the greatest privilege, the greatest pleasure. It's what gives me life. But we're not talking about me. We're talking about you. So, Rebitson, you've gotten – you've. I'm very firm. I call you Rebitson. You've gotten uh, involved <laughs> of late in Shaduchim more than I remember. Now, the truth mm-hmm. is you've made five successful Shaduchim. I like to say we because I want to ride your coattails up to the Shamaya. But really, I think most of them were you. Um, and each of them are remarkable in their own right. But then there was a little hiatus in our lives. We went through many decades not being as involved. And then you got back involved. Right. What motivated you to get back involved? What's your experience? You got some takeaways about Shaduchim? Anything you want to share about your observations of the world of Shaduchim today? So it's funny. I was just I was just at Al-Chaim, a very, very beautiful, special Al-Chaim. And I was just talking to the mother of the Kala and saying to her, because this couple was set up by friends of theirs. Mm. Um, by a young couple who had just gotten married and it was a friend of his and they thought of a friend of hers and they set it up. And I was telling that mother of the Kala how when we were young couples, me and you, Rabbi Goldberg, since you're calling me Rebidson, we were very in a very good position. We we're well positioned to set up our friends because we really knew them. And that's when right. we made our Shaduchim. Over 20, I don't know, 24, 25 years ago, we made five Shaduchim, you know. Um, since then, it's been over 20 years since we've made our last shidduch, which is insane because I've tried to set up so many couples. I've been setting up couples for, for decades already, and I have not made one successful shidduch hmm. since I'm a young couple, since those five shidduchim from our early 20s. Right. So I think there's a reason for that. I think that what's happening now is that in the shidduch world, they're really relegating all the shit off making to adults. You know, I don't know if it's pasnished or kids just don't want to do it or they don't feel like they are authority enough to set up shidduchim, but you don't see it happen as much that young couples or singles are setting up their friends. And to me, it's, I mean, they're the ones who are really best positioned to think of their friends for each other. They know their friends the best. I mean, how well do I really know these young singles? I know some right. of my kids friends, they're great, you know, and I, I get to know them a little bit, but I don't know them so well that I don't know which guy is perfect. So we try, you know, and a lot of Shadchanim and a lot of adults today just like try to throw people together. And a lot of them do put thought into it and try to meet them. But how much do you really get to know a single in a in a right. 10 minute meeting? So it's, it's, it's really like as if we've made it more difficult for ourselves, because if we just kind of get the young couples and singles involved, more involved, and give them more of the independence and responsibility and say, you run with this, you know, you brainstorm, you go out with a guy and he's not for you, set him up with your friend and vice versa. I think girls do that more than guys, I would imagine. But, um, you know, if if that girl that this boy went out with wasn't for him after he did all his reference checks and after he met, you know, went through all of the uh, required uh, research to see if she was in the ballpark. And chances are, if she was in the ballpark that he decides to go out with her, then she could be very good for his roommate, for his chavrusa, for his best friend, for his cousin, you know? So I think that that has to become more of the trend, Um, you know? And I think meeting each other, of course, is just the easiest, that no one has to be involved and they could just naturally, organically find each other, see what's attractive to them, what they're interested in in person, Um, you know? But I don't go as far as to say that that's what has to be done, but at least let's try to get involved, get people involved who really are um, in the best position to to make shidduchim. So 100%. I think that's why we haven't been as successful because we just don't know. What we, as we get older, we don't know the younger people as well as we did. Young, people, there, young people need to set up their peers. First of all, I want to say you're so much better of a Rebbitson and Shadchan than you are a camera holder. Honey, why don't you just take the phone and lean it against something? I, I don't Because I'm about to have a seizure. I'm <laughs> watching you shake all over the place. Over there. there we go. There we go. It looks great. It looks great. So... Let's talk about you. You have some feelings on what age, maybe we can we can settle some of the gap between the yeah. boys and the girls, the men and the women, if we would do what. So, point number one you have is let's get peers to set up their peers. Empower you went out with them. someone they weren't for you, but they were in the ballpark enough that you went out. So you have a friend. Think of who they're for, and let's get couples setting up their friends. Let's get peers setting up peers. Yeah, like know another, each other. right. Another example of this is like they have this new idea now, which is a great idea. It's called wedding reading, where they have shadchanim come to a wedding. 
And between that lull time of the chuppah to the first dance, when the chasm and kala are taking their time and pictures and yichudrim and all that, they then have these singles who could come and meet with the shachanim. So I feel like that would be a great time for singles to, to meet each other, maybe. I'm saying, like, why does there have to be that go like that that go between who doesn't really get to know them so well in those few minutes that they meet them, you know, not to meet the shachan, but, right. but see who's there and maybe then tell that adult who's, you know, is circulating in the room, you know, how about that person or this person, and they could get the information and then be able to go home with some names of people they saw at that wedding. Again, a wedding is a good place because it could be that the friends of the chasm and kala are in the same ballpark because their friends married each other. So it, that is also a very good place, but it has to be the right you know, we have to use those opportunities and use them in the right way. You know, talking about ages. What ages should the girls start dating? I I, I don't have a strong opinion about that. Um, you know, I, I don't see anything wrong with girls starting young. I don't have a problem with that. I think that the problem is that there is a discrepancy between ages of boys and girls. Um, I know there's a big movement, you know, in certain circles to it's called like just ask, where they're trying to get the boys to start dating younger. Um, a lot of guys choose not to date younger because they don't feel necessarily ready to start dating. So I don't think we want anyone choosing to start dating early who are not ready, ready. to get married. Um, no one really needs that. That would not be good for anyone. Um, you know, so another option is that the girls could, you know, take a year off after seminary and just relax and do their thing. College, working, uh, you know, hanging with their friends, traveling, being with their family, whatever it is, and not have to be running from simcha to simcha of their friends. They could have that year to kind of just settle in. But I, I'm not a popular opinion here. And until it catches on that, everyone across the board says that that's what needs to be done to narrow down the ages so that the 19 year olds aren't dating yet, but the 22 year olds are dating the 23 year olds who start dating. You know what I'm saying? Like so you're, happy- you're popular with me, but talk, talk about when you spoke to that group, right? What would your message be to the group of girls who come home from Israel and they're not, maybe they don't want to date right away, or maybe the dating's not flowing right away. What was your message when you met with them on Zoom? What kind of reaction or response did you get to that? Right, so I actually, um, I, I did a Zoom last year of girls who were post-seminary, who were kind of that year or two after seminary, um, which could be a very tough time when they see their friends starting to get married. And I don't think, you know, I'm not so sure if girls and guys at that age are like chalishing to get married, but I think that once their friends start, you know, there's a little bit of a pressure there. They don't want to be the only ones or the left behinds, you know, and I think that's right. a little bit of the motivation at times for some of these singles. Um, and I think it is a hard time because you're kind of like defined by where you're at in the shit process. Instead of being able to really explore your future, you know, enjoy that time, you're going to be married for many, many years. It's not so bad to have a, you know, a couple of single years where you could just chill and, like I said, travel and find hobbies and interests and and school and work and volunteer. You know, there's so many opportunities at that stage in life. But instead, it could be a very depressing, difficult time when your phone's not ringing and you're not, right. you know, going on dates or, or finding that person. So uh, it's very important you, to find meaning during that time, to find you, purpose, to, to see yourself as a person, as an individual who could, you know, give to the world, who's not just defined by a misses ahead of their name. You know, do you think parents are, are creating more of a problem for their kids by getting too involved in this shidduch process? Um, too picky, I, too choosy, like, like you know, it's got to be this type, and it could have been a man, many others. It could have been well, Donny Oppenheimer that. says, just say yes to the free dinner, the rest will just happen. I agree with Donny Oppenheimer, by the way. 100%. Oh, is that like a free dinner date you're saying? Yeah, I mean, just take, just take the op. What's the worst that can happen is you have a good dinner. That's yeah, it. And you know, it doesn't you work. You know that you know that a lot of them are not going to dinner on the oh, they're not? Couple Where are they days. going? <laughs> they're going to like a lounge. Okay, know, so you so you night. have a nice so, conversation, a cup right. of coffee. No, hundred percent. But I do think that for um, you know, for this population, it's not easy. You know, every date is a lot of emotions. It's a lot of preparations. Again, it it's a lot of research and time That's beforehand. What I'm saying. But but even the date, you know, the preparing for it and the getting excited about it. And then each time if it doesn't work out or, you know, it's, you don't want to go on dates unnecessarily. So I understand why singles would be choosier or somewhat like, you know, trying to make that decision. I'm not just going to go out to anyone who comes my way. I want to like really think it through and know if it's the right you know, the right ballpark, the right type. I, I understand that. They don't want to waste their time and they don't want to also get burnt out. You know, the more dates you go on, the less excited you get about each date. And, and it's hard, you know? I mean, you look at those girls and guys who have like some men and women, I don't like calling them girls and guys because it makes them like as if they're kids. Um, those single men and women, you know, you look at them and, you know, they they feel it's, it's a hard time. It's just a lot of, you know, 
going on these dates, the same first dates. I, you know, a lot of people like sympathize with with the uh, young women, but the truth is, for the young men, it's not so easy either. Where they have to keep coming up with first dates and be the one who drives and be the one who coordinates and organizes, even though they might have a long list to go out with. Every date is, you know, is a lot of pressure. Would you say, so, would you say this is a monster of our own making? A hundred percent. It was yeah. much more simple. I mean, really, there was no crisis, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. It just wasn't, there was no word. I mean, I still don't like to call it a crisis. It's so gloom and doom. And everyone who's like 17 is already getting nervous about the crisis they're about to enter. I think it's terrible. And it makes it very scary. <laughs> and like, no one looks forward to that time. Right. It's, just a pain. Right. it's um, like you're about to go get go on your first dates and, and you're ready. It's it's like you got... Uh, well, it's just, it, it is important to clarify. As Daf Yomi says there are plenty of older singers looking to get married. So when we talk about young people and peers and setting them up and we don't know anyone because we're older, of course we care about and we think about and we look out for older singles too. We're not only talking about the young population. A hundred percent. And I think, you know, the older's we need to look at it. And a lot of these shot have to focus on the older population and getting to know them and finding the right fits for right. them. And they should be going to singles events and putting themselves out there. Um, you know, a very important part of this is really getting yourself out there, meeting people who know people, going to different communities, Shabbos, mingle. Like, it's hard for someone who's not an outgoing personality, a people person. This whole stage of having to put yourself out there is very, very difficult. Um, you know, there are other that are hard. And the only reason why I feel like maybe it is our making is just we make the steps and we make it very difficult to get, you know, to the points that we need to. Like, you know, if like, again, if friends would set each other up, if, you know, I, I listen, that's how we met. I, I, you know, was going, I, I was going through a little bit of a dry spell. Please, I wasn't sure please, who my next please, date please, was. Please. And, um, and I, I spoke to a friend of mine who was dating very similar types of guys as I was. And, oh, and I and I and I said to her, I said, and I, I recommend this to all singles because, like I said before, you're going to end up very likely will end up with someone in the similar circles to who your friends are marrying, you know, who your siblings or your cousins. Like, network with the people around you who are similar to you, who are looking for, you know, who are married to similar types or looking for similar types. There's nothing wrong with a single saying to another single. Have you gone on any good dates? Anyone who might be good for me, anyone you could think of for me, you know, that's also part of networking, networking with the other singles around you. So you I think. I'm just wondering, do you find that that there's so much pressure to go on that date, whatever the first date is, that sometimes the the, the guy and the girl they they don't give this enough chance to develop for a second date. They just they're, they're so anxious, and it could have probably developed in the second, maybe even the third date. But because everyone's so nervous and so anxious, it just never gets to that second date. But people are very inclined to go on second dates, I find. Yeah. I think like the seminary teachers like drill that in them, like always oh, good. Give date, okay. give another chance. First dates are difficult to really get to know each other. Like that's, you know, take take time and get to know again. And, you know, if you don't go on a second date, it means that the first date was really not at all shy. Like, no, you know. But um, hmm. I think it is important to give things a try. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that are different nowadays. Like I've been setting up a lot of dates recently where I'm the one who has to set up the date. Like they don't text each other or call each other before to say, you know, I'm going to come pick you up at 4 30 PM. I'll be, you know, like you have the shotgun has been like setting up dates, which has been making it much harder for so Why is that? I'm saying why, why, why can't, why can't they okay, call each other? Our kids, our, kids, our kids want us to move on from Shaduchim. Okay. okay. So I have another question for you. The two of you, have, you guys can meet and talk about gonna, this. <laughs> I'm happy to not talk about Shaduchim. So, it's, no, like, kids, so it's getting a little bit like it's, it's, you know, that I do everything because none me. of us could really solve it. And, and, Move the needle. We can solve it. So it's not so complicated. We have some ideas. We have some ideas. We're going to work on it. But Rebitson, in what way do you think rabbinic couples are misunderstood? What What do you wish the public? What do you wish the global community, the public online? What do you wish the local public in terms of the members of a shul of a community? Not ours, of course. I'm talking in general, theoretically. What do you wish they better understood about the rabbinic family, the rabbi and Rebitson, their children, their family? Um. I mean, I think it's obvious. I think that we are pulled in a lot of directions. We have a personal life in addition to this public life and this very busy professional, you know, communal life. Um, the community is our family and we love the community and we're thrilled to be such an important part of the community and we love our role. But, you know, it's also important. I I'll say, I mean, I, I really do try to take care of everything at home and the family and that's how I position myself and that's my role. But um, I think they have to understand the rabbi's time and his time limits and make sure that, you know, 
it's hard. Everyone wants everyone wants time and everyone wants to feel like they're getting their attention. And but when it's a very large, especially a global community, um, everyone has to understand the the time restraints that there can't be, you know, the second they need to hear back or they need a meeting that day, or you know, it's not always gonna happen. And people have to be very patient and understanding that we're really, really, really trying our best. This is our, um, we, we love this life and we never would have chosen a different life. And I think our kids love it. And, you know, it, it's it's beautiful. We just had Purim, you know, I mean, Purim in our home, I, I, you know, our kids were like on FaceTime the whole day. They're like the ones who are out of the house. They miss it. You know, this is like the, the activity and the action and the people in and out and so much going on. And it's so special and we, we cherish it. It's, it's a beautiful life. And I can't imagine a difference. I and mean, we all can't imagine. We just, it's, it's a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful life but it's a very, very busy life. And there's a lot of strain on, on the time that, you know, yeah. we get to have as a family, the time we get to have, you know, our husband, father at home with us. And, you know, like there are times when the two of us will steal away, like for a quick, quick, quick lunch or a dinner or whatever. And there are often times when we can't go outside of the community because we don't have time to drive anywhere. So we'll go somewhere like in the community and be the two of us sitting there having a conversation. And again, maybe we were wrong for going out locally, but inevitably there's going to be someone who will come. Rabbi, I'm so glad I saw you. I need to ask you a question. You know, no, they usually they usually introduce it. They usually walk over and they say, "I don't want to so bother you, to, but but I'm so happy the two of you are alone. It's terrible. People come over, they interrupt. You deserve yeah. it. I'm so happy." And then they spend 20 minutes telling us how happy they are that yeah. we're alone and how no one should interrupt. <laughs> right, right, right. And then oftentimes they'll say, but I do need to know A, B, and C, or what are the times of Minyanim, or what do I do about this, or can you tell me, you know, That's and great. I feel like, it. I know, that, and everyone means well, you know, and maybe they thought they were the only one who came over to the table, you know, but like, I think the signs are there that like, it's the two of us alone, <laughs> you know, we try to find like a secluded table, right and, in the back. Um, you know, just like people should, you know, be understanding of that, but you know, because you never have you, uh, you know, you just never have that ability to to have that time together. I and mean, we like to go out once in a while, you know. So, but, but but again, like that's what we chose. We chose a public life. We love people. We're very social. We, you know, we that that's that's our life. But it's just, you know, and it's also like in this in this job, you, you can't have an off day, you know. Because <clears throat> every time you're at a simcha and you're just like not in the mood to socialize, that's just that's not that's that's not possible you Another can't option. you can't be an introvert you know you decided that day I, i'm like i can't be around people no you're, you're at a wedding you can't choose to not talk to anyone you're not in the mood for you know so this this is again this is the life we chose and we love it and we, we we're thrilled i mean it's it's beautiful it's just that you never really i guess people should just be more understanding once in a while we might be in a bad mood or we might have had a you know and, and never <laughs> Never, but I do want to say this. I do want to say this. First of all, we saved the best for last. This is the greatest guest, and I'm so happy yeah. you agreed to stay up. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy you agreed to, to come on. First of all, with the matching funds, I want to report that with the matching funds, we are at over $145,000. We're $5,000 away from our... So if you haven't given yet, you want to give $5,000, and then you can go That's to sleep. It. Whatever you give still will be matched. So this is it before the end of this episode, and we're getting close, and it's going to be really special, really amazing. Uh, we still have a, a huge crowd watching, and if you have any questions for the Revitan, what do you want to know about about her, about me, about our kids, I about our life? I want to get back to something, John. Please post it in the comments. Whatever you I want to know, this is something. your chance. Josh, you asked before about parents. Are parents too involved? And I yeah. don't think it should just be about Shaduchim because I we don't have to go back to that conversation. Um, I, I think in general, I think that I think that there's a lot that's being taken away from parents these days. Um, as far as I think that you know, it used to be. I don't know if you experienced this also, but like when we were in high school, we had like no relationship with our teachers. We, you know, we went to school. And we came home and the relationship with, you know, a mentor or a spiritual, you know, person in our life was really from more like, you know, a, a youth organization or, um, you know, maybe camp to have a counselor. But like in school, it was more, you know, nowadays, I think there's a big difference in, in you know, high school, post high school, um, you know, when it comes to like any, you know, a, a Rebbe Talmud or, you know, the girls with their teachers or the college teachers or the dating coaches or, you know, um, later on with the Rub Rebbitson, there's a lot more of that like um, reliance on their advice, on their, you know, ASA, um, you know, and you hear that a lot more. And then I spoke to my Rub and he told me, and there were certain things that um, my battery's dying. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Special okay, guest is about, about to lose our special <laughs> guest. <laughs> okay. wow, this this is hilarious. When my battery dies, we have to end this That's program. it. 
Yeah. And we have to get someone. Send the twenty five hundred okay. bucks in right now. Right. <laughs> send them, please. Right. So my battery could die. Please <laughs> donate to the global okay. campaign, and the Goldbergs need a charger. <laughs> just to answer i think i do think that parents know their kids best i really do they're the ones who raise them they're the right. ones who who uh you know they have their genetic material i mean parents really do know kids and you know i think parents have that wisdom and you know and i think parents have to parent and there's sometimes there are parents these days who don't know how to parent and maybe the kid is better off asking other other adults in their life for things but um, you know, I think in general, if your parent is a, is a capable, a loving, a smart, you know, I think that they should be your number one. I think parents do care the most about their kids. They have the more, most time for their kids. They're not answering, you know, they, they, they love them and know the best for them. So I think parents should be part of, of everything for their children. Yeah. And, Robert, you, know, you, you started a column this year in the BRS Weekly, the global members. Do we put it in the global edition? Maybe we should. No. Maybe we should start putting your contribution in the global edition of the weekly as well. If you give to the global campaign, you are automatically subscribed. You will get an email every week, the newsletter, partial perspective, write up articles, incredible resources. You can print it out. Divrei Torah, Shabbos reading. Not a newsletter, a magazine. All delivered to your inbox. So Rebetzin, you have a new column. Yechevet, people are going to think we have a weird relationship. I keep yeah. calling you Rebetzin. Yechevet, you have a column. You want to talk about that column and, and how'd you come to that? What is that about? I thought it'd be nice to get to know the members of our community, but also to get recipes from the members of our community. So I have what's called the Rebison's Recipe Corner. And each week I feature another member of BRS. We've had a couple of men, it's not just for women, mostly women. And uh, there's a short bio about them where, um, you know, they write up something about themselves. I always edit everything, but really uh, they do a good job, which is helpful to me. And uh, to really get to know them. I moved to Boca in 2012. I have, you know, the kids and what school and, you know, what they do for a living and just different things about them, their involvement in the community, what they love about the community. They, they write it themselves and steer it the way they want it. But I, you know, will sometimes add or take out or whatever. And then, um, and then they're, signature dish, whatever their dish mm. that they cook the best or that people love the most, whatever they could think of that represents them that they love, that's the recipe they put in. Often before Yantif, I'll have them do like a Purim, you know, like we did Hamantashen and we did, we'll do some Pesach recipes coming up. And, you know, I try to do it around the, the Yantif. And, um, and it's just a really nice way for people to be in the weekly and so people get to know each other and to get good recipes. And I'm hoping that at some point at uh, maybe after two years, whatever it is, we're up to like over 50 recipes already. And we're going to hopefully put together some kind of a cookbook and maybe we'll uh, let it be a fundraiser for the global campaign. We'll see. The BRS uh, cookbook. Right. But it's really, it, it's really so far so good. I think it's a nice new edition. Ooh, I just thought of a good name for it. A Taste of BRS. Great. <laughs> <laughs> a taste. Coming to a bookshop near you. Good. Done. Just but that's... You have any questions for Rabbi Brody? What do we want to know about the uh, the Brodies? We were talking about Simone's trip to Israel, the mystery okay. trip. Oh, there's a there's a Bar Chaim the wedding. wedding, the Bar Chaim. Right? Right. This, the Bar Chaim. Okay, so this month, former assistant we rabbi had at BRS, seven BRS weddings this month. Right. I know everyone's trying to get their weddings in before Pesach, before Sfira, but it happens to be that it's actually like really beautiful. Like how many you know great families, great kids who have gotten married. And are about to get married this month, and it's been a real month full of simcha, and that's been Baruch very Hashem, Baruch Hashem, yeah. it's beautiful. Yeah. Our weekly's never had so many mazel tovs. Bli ayin hara, we should just continue to have True. them. Everyone should experience them. Everybody very, should very be blessed simple. with them. It has been it has been incredibly special. Rabbi Brody, are you still a vegan? That's a good question. That's a very yeah, good question. We're not getting a recipe Robert. from you we're not, for my. Section. I know that's the last thing you want, right? <laughs> yeah, now. We don't need to yeah. The answer is yes, but there, you know, let's just say if there's a special occasion. You know, like uh, the Mavaksham Chai Gala dinner. I've had a nibble on something. Really? <laughs> it's I, don't know, I might have also had like yeah. six shots of whiskey. So I don't even remember. I'm on a plane home and a guy says to me, I saw Brody eat meat tonight. I said, no, no, you're okay. no, it was no. probably like a mushroom or yeah. it was. You're, it looked you're, like you're, a piece of meat. He's like, I'm telling you, I saw, and Rabbi Wawa spoke yeah. about the Suda that Shai Storm put out for us. Yeah, it wasn't normal. And I said, he said, I, I saw Rabbi Brody eating the meat, <laughs> charcuterie, ro whatever it was. Whatever like, it was, right. Nah, you're confused. That'd be like nah. saying I saw him eating non-kosher. Right. You're clearly confused. So I saw Brody, I'm like, did you have meat? <laughs> might have had a little bit. <laughs> might, have, might have had a nibble. 
<laughs> no, welcome one back. Bite, one bite. Welcome one back. Bite. Welcome back. It's good to have you. I'm not back. I just, just yeah, you know, I'll be honest. One of the things that I find very, very difficult about traveling, because I've been traveling a lot lately, is that most of these communities, they don't have like a lot of restaurants. So it's, I'm very limited in what I can eat. So I'm not saying that. I'm not, I'm not saying meat, but it's just sometimes, you know, you go to 7 Eleven, you buy, uh, they have these little packs of eggs. Uh, right. Have an OU on it with a, with a pickle. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It's in a bag. That's my post. That's my post funeral or unveiling gas station stop on the way home. And you're like, I realize I haven't eaten the entire day. I'm starving. Right, literally, I'm starving. I'm gonna buy right. pieces of mango with a hard boiled egg. Look at that. Look at this. Pickle, Look at this. And wash it down with a nice tea. <laughs> that is the balanced diet of a rabbi. Dried mango. The balanced rabbinic diet is the hard boiled egg, uh, with right? The pickle in a plastic bag, yeah, with, with the some juice, mango, with like a hummus and pretzels, yeah, uh, all while driving home. Right. Well, isn't your major association with Wawa is coming back from a funeral. Like anytime you see a Wawa gas station, yeah. you automatically. I love Wawa. Think yeah, I love Wawa. <laughs> Wawa's, got, Wawa's the best gas station coffee. They really? Because I'm mango. a 7-Eleven guy. I, I love agree with Josh. 7-Eleven. You get coffee. first of all, you can get the Slurpee. <laughs> no, don't knock, don't knock Wawa. Wawa's good. Wawa <laughs> is good. All right, this is a wonderful, scintillating conversation, and I hate to leave it. What? But I think I'm gonna. Uh, the night's just starting. I'm gonna there call we... it a night. <laughs> the battery, your battery hasn't died yet. Where are you going? Getting there. <laughs> The BRS campaign is up to 138,874, 924 supporters. We've got to have an enormous shout out to, to uh, the Sakas, who are just incredible, amazing, wow. extraordinary, thank generous, you. good, giving people. And thank you for that generosity. We love you, Sakas. And we're going to get out in the golf course together and uh, right. and celebrate your generosity. And please, God, soon. Is that the remember patriarch? Our trip with the Sakas? Is that what? Remember our trip with the Sakas? Yeah, it was great. We had a good time. That Is that the patriarch every that we hear about every night? Yes, that's the no, that's the the patriarch passed right. away. This is right. the new patriarch. The Saka family sponsors sitter snippets too. Miami right. Beach, they are an amazing Miami Beach family. You hear about them every night. Super tremendous, generous, and couldn't be more grateful to them for all that they do for us. And uh, in the comment sections, like, by the way, I love this. Do you, do you notice there's a whole conversation going? Whole conversation forth. going on over here. <laughs> Aaron, Nick, and Gordon, are you related to Joey? Joey's my son. Amazing! What a performer, <laughs> Donny Oppenheimer. It's for the meals, it was worth it. Total uh, whole pass from Avaksham dinners. I hear that, by the way. There are no vegans at a Avaksham dinner. That's very, very difficult. Classic, right. classic, uh, classic commentary. It's amazing, really amazing stuff. Yechavit, thank you for bringing us home. Thank, thank you for making my home. Thank you for being my home. <laughs> and uh, it's very thank sweet. you for bringing us home. This how was, about this was come, really home. come home? Come home. <laughs> Let's just let's just take one moment to recap. Okay, how many shots did you have tonight? Let's just recap for one moment uh, our amazing program tonight, which is right now three hours and forty five minutes long. It's pretty good. It's supposed to be, it was supposed to be eight to ten, wasn't that the original plan? Whatever, however long it was. Supposed to be went. eight a.m. to ten p.m. We started out. We opened up with uh, Rabbi Brody. You and I opened up talking a little bit about life. We were joined very special. We yeah. had a great opening. Good bookends tonight. Rabbi Moskowitz was back and, right. you know, I know you and I were both emotional. We were even texting him offline during, but what it meant that he came back on and, you know, he's able to put on a smile and he talked about a lot of things, but everyone should know how hard that is and how much he's pushing himself because um, for the community and and for himself and, and, and we can't wait and we long to have him back at his pace and with his strength when he's ready. But what a way to open up tonight. It was great to have Rabbi Moskowitz. We then had the Michelles. Yechavit, did you know your sister was on? Shani and Binyam were on, honorees at our dinner. We're great to hear from them. Lori Palatnik, right. hearing about Rebbits and Weinberg. That was powerful, powerful stuff. We had the Halperins and their support for their kids and their religious journey. Wow, what a, what a story. Like that was so long ago. <laughs> Feels like it. Yeah, we're, like well, two in, weeks a ago. Minutes, in a couple minutes, it will be yesterday. Right. Um, we had Alex Fletcher. Um, I don't know if you got to hear it, Yechavit. I know you were at the L'chaim. Alex was fantastic talking about what she's doing. The work that she's doing was great. We had Rabbi David, Rabbi Dr. David Beshevkin, my cousin, was back, and I was pretty nice to him. We had a good conversation. Right. Shimmy and Beth were on. Right. We, um, Rabbi Aryeh Leibowitz, oh, that was, was really phenomenal. We had Rabbi Daniel Kalish, was fantastic. Rav Yy, surprise guest, and you, and each of them, just what conversation, so much to think about. 
Now I'm curious, the people who are with us the whole night tonight, three hours, 45 minutes, they cooked Shabbos, they cooked Pesach, they cooked for Sukkot, they're all ready to go. But somebody who's going to like tomorrow, like what's going to happen tomorrow when someone's like, oh, let me check out the podcast. Yeah. I'll tell you what, we're I'm cooking tomorrow and I'm gonna be listening. Two, 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 two times time speed. One shot? Yeah, you, no one's going on a four hour drive somewhere. No. Yeah, so they're gonna do sound bites, you're gonna you break it up. Segments tonight. You have different segments, so you can listen yeah. to pieces. Hey, do the morning commute when on the bill. Well, we want to thank the people who made it happen. Talia Bornstein, our amazing director of member oh. engagement, yeah. really helped organize tonight. Talia, huge thank you all you did for the global campaign, all you do regularly. Of course, Jeffrey, everything that happens happens with Jeffrey. We appreciate it. Matthew Miller who is behind the scenes helping enormously. Matthew's going to add chapters to the YouTube. So if somebody goes on and they want to hear a particular speaker or pick up where they left off, they'll be able to use the chapter. <laughs> triple Matthew, speed. So if you listen on triple speed, you can cut this whole thing down to much less time. So thank you, Matthew, for adding the chapters. Fact, and, fact checker. And the show notes, Ben Yemen, our, our fact checker, and recording the intro to tonight. Everybody who makes it happen. Our sponsor, the Ganowers, again. Thank you, the Ganowers, for your generous sponsorship. We really, really appreciate it, and we wish you well. And thank you for supporting our our broader Boca community. Thank you for all that you do. Rabbi Brody, I want to thank you. The last year, you've been a constant and uh, in a world that's been challenging, a time that's been challenging. And we've had fun together, and we've learned together, and it's been great. I sound like we're like Brothers. shutting down the show. I sound like we're maybe we are. Maybe this is our swan song. Maybe we're done. Maybe that's it. Just this could be it. it. Next week, don't you have a guest for next week? Yeah, sure. I did mention who <laughs> we actually, next week. actually have a great one. We got next Before week and the week. End. <laughs> we got next week and the week after and the week after that. We got a lot more. Yeah. Um, anyone want to vote? I've been trying to get my kids to come on. Trying to get the kids to come on behind the bima. I look like one right there. Your rabbi child. Uh, yeah, I think, like I think the rabbit's rabbit sitter is signaling one of them to come over. I just saw that. Come on, but maybe if the crowd pushes, maybe in the comments, we can encourage them that some episode we should do a behind the beam of rabbi's children. Now, we could do it behind the beam of rabbi's children, like have Shai Schechter back and have the Willig boys and have, we could do like rabbi girls, daughters. We could have rabbi's children, but like, Sound I mean, like BRS rabbi's children. So if you want to hear that, let us know, and maybe maybe we can vote to get them on, and we can hear. I, from I think it would actually be great to hear the son-in-laws, their impressions yeah. of the rabbi's family. Let's have Jake. Let's have Jake Manis on. Let's have J yeah. Maybe maybe some point some others. Let's have him on and uh, maybe sons-in-law for sure. It'll be Mikey, amazing. Let's hear what I'm sure these guys, these guys have a lot to say. We got a lot going on. It's super exciting. Mikey's. Here's here's we should let them host the show one one night. We'll just take the night off. Remember pre Purim, we had our boy, our, our sons. That was very cute. Remember that? They did the opening yeah. behind the beam. Yeah. You remember that? That was, a classic. that was a classic. We got great. All right, stuff. guys. I forgot. It's been, anyway, it's been great. Robertson, thank you for joining us. And uh, we're at three hours and 50 minutes. I want to yeah. make it to four hours. We 10 let's, more minutes. Let's bring or? it home and come home. Let the rabbis come home. <laughs> bring That's it. That's the new okay. slogan. Kol Asher Tamar Lacha Rebetzin Tishma Bekola. So whatever Yechavit says, we do. You know, why don't Thank I, you. Let's end it. <laughs> Thank you to everybody who uh, stayed with us throughout, and we want to wish you until next time. Stay happy, stay healthy, and stay holy. Shkaya.